Impertinent Strangers, written by P.O. Dixon, narrated by Pearl Hewitt. Chapter 1. Her Declaration Getting lost in a good book affords the surest means of improving one's mind, as well as fueling one's imagination with a sense of adventure. All the better if said book should happen to be of a romantic bent. Touched by the conclusion of the story she had been reading for days, Elizabeth contentedly closed her book. How close she was to her journey's end she could not say, for she had never travelled that way before. She stole a glance out of the carriage window and commenced admiring the evidence of spring's awakening flashing by. What a lovely day for travelling this has turned out to be, she silently considered. The bright sun on her face was pure bliss. Elizabeth smiled. Time away from Longbourn was always met with an ardent spirit on Elizabeth's part. Most of her time spent away from her father's home was passed in town with her dearest uncle and aunt, Mr. and Mrs. Gardner. This occasion would find her in Kent. The visit could not have been better timed as far as she was concerned. Nothing of any genuine excitement was underway at home, what with the militia off to Brighton. Indeed, the militia's recent removal from Meryton, and along with it the departure of the handsome Mr. George Wickham, had been factored into Elizabeth's decision to visit her intimate friend Charlotte Collins, nay Lucas. Even though the reasons that Elizabeth should not have been disheartened by Mr. Wickham's leave-taking were plentiful, she was decidedly affected all the same. For one, she had been gently advised by her aunt, Mrs. Gardner, for whom she held a particular regard, not to fall in love with that young man. Elizabeth assured her aunt that she had not and that she would not. So convinced was she that she had been and would always be the ruler of her own heart, even though Mr. Wickham was beyond comparison the most agreeable man she had ever met. Secondly, in courting Miss Mary King, whose grandfather's death had made her the mistress of a fortune of ten thousand pounds, Mr. Wickham had effectively abandoned his affections for Elizabeth with scarcely a second thought. She concluded, however, that the speed with which she recovered from his defection was the surest test to the fact that her heart had remained untouched. That did not stop her from consoling her vanity as needed every now and again in the ensuing weeks and months. Oh, I suppose if I had been the recipient of a fortune of ten thousand pounds, I might have been his only choice. Elizabeth always liked to tell herself. Nonetheless, the memories of him were the closest symptom of love she had ever suffered, and she cherished them as keenly as would any young woman who had ever been in the throes of her first infatuation. And when remembering all the times she had spent in Mr. Wickham's amiable company, and recounting in her mind all the honeyed words that flowed from his lips in unabashed adoration of her, she did so with a fond heart and a warm smile. If I could but meet a gentleman who possesses half of Wickham's charms and amiability on this trip, then I should have no cause to repine. The first day passed much the same as the second day of her arrival. On the third day, the Collinses received a much-anticipated invitation to dine at Rosings. Taking advantage of the pleasant weather, they walked the half-mile or so across the park in companionable silence. That was until the manor house appeared on the horizon, at which point her party members' enthusiasm was scarcely contained. With each step that Elizabeth took as she ascended the stairs of the palatial home, she thanked heavens that she was her friend Charlotte's guest and not the other way around. Best described as a sensible woman at the age of seven and twenty, Charlotte had recently married Elizabeth's cousin, Mr. William Collins. He was the complete opposite of Lieutenant Wickham. Indeed, a pompous man, he was not only a strain on one's eyes, but his voice also set Elizabeth's nerves on edge. More than once since the start of her visit, she had congratulated herself on escaping the sentence her friend ardently embraced by rejecting his hand in marriage. The thought of finding herself married to the toady man who towered over them 
was enough to turn her stomach. Her mother had protested fiercely against the injustice of having such a child, one who spurned the hand of the man who would one day inherit every material possession the Bennets of Longbourn now called their own. Oh, he may throw us all into the hedgerows as soon as he pleases once my dear Mr. Bennet passes away, was her mother's most ardent complaint. The second of five daughters, Elizabeth knew she had an obligation to marry. The more favourable the match, the better for all her family. But she did not mean to be a martyr. Her strongly held conviction did not lessen the guilt that would make its presence known from time to time, and thus she made an unspoken pact with herself, that the next time she would think long and hard before spurning an offer of marriage should one be presented to her again. Charlotte had mentioned that there was to be more than one single gentleman in attendance at that evening's gathering. May at least one of them be amiable, Elizabeth silently prayed. Echoing footsteps were the only sounds to be heard as Elizabeth and her party passed through the ostensibly adorned halls on their way to the parlour. Every step gave Elizabeth an uneasy impression of whatever else she might expect once they arrived at their destination. Having heard such high praise of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, the grand lady of the richness that now stretched before her, from her sycophant cousin over the past few days since her arrival at the parsonage, she did not know whether to be awe-stricken or amused, reverent or repulsed. Elizabeth hoped she would be pleasantly surprised. Otherwise, it is going to be a long evening. When at last they were ushered into the room where the grand lady of the house and two others were sitting, the servant quickly escaped when the former rose to receive them. Charlotte graciously presented her friend Elizabeth to Lady Catherine, who in turn introduced Elizabeth to her daughter, Miss Anne de Bourgh, and Miss de Bourgh's companion, Mrs. Jenkinson. Talk gradually progressed from the weather, what it had been and what it was to be, to the topic of Lady Catherine's concerns with the local villagers. The welcomed reprieve gave Elizabeth a chance to study the room as well as its inhabitants at leisure and silently compare what she now saw to the glorious exultations by her cousin since first making his acquaintance when he visited the Bennets in Hertfordshire. Her attention was immediately arrested when two gentlemen came into the room. There you are, nephews, cried Lady Catherine. Her countenance evinced fondness that was absent in her tone. Where have you been? I was afraid that dinner might be delayed owing to your tardiness. The two of you know very well that I do not like to be kept waiting. Neither of the gentlemen acknowledged their aunt's impolitic rebuke. Their eyes were fixed on Elizabeth. Feeling very conscious of their gaze, Elizabeth felt her heartbeat stir a little with the sudden awareness of the promising turn in the evening's events. Lady Catherine threw a look in Elizabeth's direction. These are my nephews, Colonel Fitzwilliam. She had barely uttered his name when the apparently older of the two men boldly strode forward and bowed. At your service, miss, he began, his eyes expressing his piqued interest. Yes, of course, her ladyship interrupted. This is Miss Elizabeth Bennet of Hertfordshire. She is a guest at the parsonage, her ladyship stated rather condescendingly. Quickly resuming her imperious air, she proudly declared, And this is my other nephew, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy of Pemberley in Derbyshire. Her ladyship's manner gave Elizabeth to consider that this nephew must be looked upon as someone of great consequence. He shook his head a little, as though the mention of his name recalled him to the fact that he had been staring at Elizabeth from the moment of his arrival. Unlike the colonel, who seemed just that sort of gentleman who fell easily into conversation wherever he went, Mr. Darcy said nothing. The newest members of the party took their places in the room, and there they all sat, a captive audience, as Lady Catherine returned to her instructive discourse on the goings-on in the local village, and how Mr. Collins, her vicar, should fashion next Sunday's sermon for the betterment of the parishioners. The one advantage Elizabeth derived from her ladyship's loquaciousness was that Mr. Darcy seemed genuinely interested in all his aunt had to say, and he had stopped pouring his eyes all over her, 
which suited Elizabeth perfectly well, for now it was her turn to study him. Elizabeth did not like to stare, but how could she do anything except stare when in the company of such a man as her ladyship's nephew, Mr. Darcy? She saw in his manner a man of sense and education, and in his appearance all the best parts of beauty. Until that moment she had considered the colourful Mr. Wickham to be the most handsome man of her acquaintance. Wickham's beauty was nothing in comparison to Mr. Darcy's. She smiled a little inside of herself over the notion that in Mr. Darcy were present all of Mr. Wickham's elegance and beauty, and in the Colonel all of the gentleman's charms and affability. The prospect of Mr. Wickham now being the standard by which she compared every gentleman of her acquaintance was not without its disadvantages. Whether nostalgia or idleness was the cause of the empty place inside of her, she could not rightly say. Again she smiled. If her heart had been wounded by Wickham's easy defection, it would surely be mended in the company of the Colonel and Mr. Darcy. When the Rosings' party went into the dining parlour, Elizabeth was seated next to Mr. Darcy at the lavishly adorned table. Of the two of her new gentleman acquaintances, she had much rather she was sitting opposite the younger man, and the Colonel was sitting next to her. Under such convenient circumstances, she might enjoy pleasant dinner conversation as well as steal the occasional glance at the handsome Mr. Darcy, whose brooding air merely added to his good looks. Despite his exceptionally good looks, she did not think she had ever met anyone who was so taciturn in her life. Determined to draw him out, she said, Mr. Darcy, I am in the fortunate position of claiming an acquaintance with another gentleman who hails from Derbyshire. Perhaps you know him as well. His name is Mr. George Wickham. The disturbance in Mr. Darcy's theretofore unreadable expression was palpable. Apparently, he did not appreciate the topic, but Elizabeth could not find it in herself to regret causing him discomfort. Any reaction on his part was better than nothing. He sat up straighter, taller. His voice seemingly restrained, he finally uttered, Wickham! Indeed, I had the honour of making his acquaintance in Hertfordshire. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners that he is sure to make friends wherever he goes. Whether he is capable of retaining them is rather unlikely. Surprised that the decidedly reserved gentleman would speak so harshly of another to a perfect stranger, Elizabeth arched her brow. Oh my! Has the gentleman been so unfortunate as to lose your friendship? He most certainly has, Darcy declared. Lady Catherine said, What are the two of you discussing, Darcy? He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Nothing of consequence, I assure you, Lady Catherine. Nonsense. Did I hear you mention that wild George Wickham's name? Tell me at once, for I insist upon having my share in the conversation. Darcy pretended not to hear his aunt, which only encouraged Elizabeth. Mr. Darcy and I were discussing my having made Mr. Wickham's acquaintance in Hertfordshire. He is most agreeable. Would you not say so as well, Charlotte? Charlotte, a plain-spoken woman, stiffened a little, as though being drawn into such a contentious debate was the last thing she wanted. But as Elizabeth was her guest, she could not reasonably hold her tongue. She dabbed her crisp linen napkin at her lips before speaking. Her voice measured, she said, Mr. Wickham made quite an unforgettable impression upon all of us when we made his acquaintance last autumn. Lady Catherine said, I find it entirely insupportable that such a man should be received by any decent family, regardless of their standing in society. She looked at Elizabeth pointedly. You are aware, young lady, that his father was the late Mr. Darcy's steward, are you not? Elizabeth shrugged. Having just made Mr. Darcy's acquaintance, I can rightly say I did not know that before now, but I do not know what any of that signifies. What can his father's occupation have to do with Mr. Wickham's reception into the homes of decent people, your ladyship? He is, after all, an officer, which must surely open doors that might otherwise be closed to him. Here Elizabeth looked at the colonel. 
Along the course of the evening she had discerned that he was the son of the Earl of Matlock, Lady Catherine's brother, the second son. I will only say that such a man is not to be trusted, Lady Catherine affirmed. I know not the particulars, but that ungrateful young man used my nephew Darcy very ill. Is that not true, nephew? I will say, despite our being raised together at Pemberley as though we were of the same blood, what with his being my own father's godson, that gentleman and I suffered an irreconcilable parting of the ways. Elizabeth saw him toss a furtive glance at his cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, who was now rather silent. Darcy continued, And that is all I will say on the matter. Her ladyship seemed content with her nephew's strong stance, and thus chose to further instruct Elizabeth on how she ought to act. You must write to your father and tell him that George Wickham is never to be received in his home ever again, for his daughter's sake as well as his own. Do I correctly recall that you are the second eldest of five siblings, all daughters? Indeed, Elizabeth answered, lowering her eyes, feigning greater interest in her dish than was called for. The same must be said of all your family. They are not to receive George Wickham. You have two uncles, I believe I heard Mr. Collins say. Indeed, your ladyship. I have one uncle who lives in Meryton, and another who resides in town. An uncle who resides in town? Yes, I suppose he keeps a house in town as most gentlemen are wont to do. Actually, my uncle lives in Cheapside near his warehouses. Lady Catherine's countenance tightened with dismay. Cheapside? Do you mean to say you have relations who earn their living by trade? Pretending to take no notice of the disturbance her declaration had incited in the air, Elizabeth nodded. Yes, your ladyship. Jerking her head in the vicar's direction, the proud lady declared, Mr. Collins, when you spoke of having made the Bennets' acquaintance in Hertfordshire, you said nothing of this to me. Collins tugged at his collar. I beg your pardon, your ladyship, said he, his complexion turning a deep shade of red. Lady Catherine went silent for a moment, no doubt to digest this troubling tidbit. She tasted her food and seemed pleased to find it to her liking. After another moment or two, she declared, I do not suppose everyone can claim the privilege of leisure. Unfortunately for you, Miss Bennet. How so? Elizabeth exclaimed with energy. Remembering herself, she continued, If I may ask. Why, being burdened by such relations must necessarily diminish the chances of you and your sisters attracting men of consequence as husbands. Keenly feeling the sting of such an impertinent remark, Elizabeth formed her lips to respond in kind. Heeding a pleading look from her friend Charlotte, Elizabeth held her tongue. Oh, if such is to be the nature of the conversation, it will surely be a long evening after all. After dinner, the women gave up the room, leaving the gentlemen to their port. Finally, Darcy felt an overpowering need to exhale. Whoever this Miss Elizabeth Bennet was, and wherever she had come from, she had nearly taken his breath away when he walked into his aunt's parlour earlier that evening. The intelligence that she had relations in trade now made sense. There was no longer any wonder her clothing was simple, and expensive jewellery did not overly adorn her body, as commonly exemplified by all the young ladies of his acquaintance. This bewitching creature with her amazing dark eyes and her light pleasing figure had rendered him utterly speechless. That was until she began boasting of an acquaintance with that scoundrel, George Wickham. What impertinence! Darcy began to consider, in recollection of her earlier retorts to his aunt as well as to himself. Does that young lady not comprehend what an honour it is for someone of her standing to dine here at Rosings? How impolitic of her to utter a single word in defence of George Wickham when it was made perfectly clear to her how thoroughly that man is abhorred. 
Darcy's mind was so full of the impertinent stranger in their midst that he hardly attended a word his cousin and that ridiculous Mr. Collins had to say. In no time at all, it seemed, it was necessary to reunite with the ladies. The possibility that Darcy would come back to the parlour alongside his aunt's vicar was unsupportable. As a consequence, he and his cousin languished behind until the parson was no longer in view. The colonel questioned his cousin's hesitance. Why would I wish to afford such a courtesy to such an inconsequential man? Darcy folded one arm over the other. It is insulting enough that we should be forced to be in company with our aunt's sycophantic vicar, <laughs> but having to endure his impertinent relations is beyond the pale. Oh, Darcy, old fellow, I would not be as fastidious as you for a kingdom. What objections can you have to the man's relations? His wife is very pleasant. That she may well be, but one cannot help questioning her thinking for marrying such a foolish man. Oh, no doubt the lady was guided by prudence. Since when is a woman's soundness of mind to be questioned for her decision to marry for security? Darcy shrugged. Fortunately, I have never had reason to think of such matters. Indeed, but you will acknowledge that not everyone is so fortunate as you, present company included. But other than her friend being Mr. Collins's cousin, how might you possibly object to the charming Miss Elizabeth Bennet? Is she not lovely? She is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me or to excuse her impertinence. Completely unbeknown to the gentleman, their conversation had been overheard. Elizabeth, in her desire to eschew the company of Lady Catherine, at least until the gentleman had rejoined the party, had made an excuse of wanting to refresh herself. Not wishing to be accused of deliberately putting herself in the gentleman's paths, she had quietly slipped inside an empty room when she heard them approaching. Retreating farther into the room, Elizabeth braced herself against the wall. She placed one hand on her chest, and the other she pressed to her lips. And these are the words of a gentleman. The words of someone whom I admired merely hours earlier, she considered. Admired in spite of his dour nature and even his ill regard for the amiable Mr. Wickham. Why, I had even begun to fancy the gentleman more handsome than Mr. Wickham. I am now given to consider that Mr. Darcy is not so handsome after all. Smiling a little inside at this new resolve, Elizabeth rallied her spirits. Not only is he not handsome enough to tempt me, I further declare that he is the one who is impertinent. What is more, he is not even tolerable. Chapter 2 Household Harmony Elizabeth nearly choked on her breakfast tea. She could scarcely believe what she'd heard. Mr. Darcy is engaged, she exclaimed. To his cousin? Mr. and Mrs. Collins nodded in unison. You may think it odd that the gentleman did not attend Mr. Berg in that manner young lovers are wont to do, but I assure you of their attachment, said the former. Elizabeth remained silent, despite the fluttering of her busily engaged mind. Did not attend Mr. Berg, indeed. He could not have paid less attention to the young woman had he tried. He paid far more attention to me both before and after his disparaging remarks to his cousin, that I am not handsome enough to tempt him. Her pride still extremely mortified by his harsh affront, Elizabeth could not help but wonder what exactly it was about his cousin that had succeeded in tempting the gentleman. Mr. Berg was pale and sickly. Her features, though not plain, were rather insignificant, and she spoke very little. When she did deign to speak, she always did so in a barely audible voice, one that compelled anyone who would listen to lean ever so close to hear what she had to say. At length, Elizabeth began to appreciate the irony that such a man as the proud Mr. Darcy should be engaged to that frail creature, and she thereby decided that he deserved his fate. Mr. Collins heralded the union between the two cousins as though it were preordained by God, 
and he did so in a manner that marked him for Elizabeth's derision. He was far from being a sensible man, but rather someone whom fate had smiled upon in rendering him the recipient of the living in Huntsford, a good home and a sufficient income. Sealing his good fortune was the fact that he was the heir apparent to the Longbourn estate, the only home Elizabeth had ever known. He rambled on and on, extolling all of Miss Anne de Berg's estimable qualities. His proclamation that Mr. Berg would have a very large fortune, and his belief that she and her cousin would unite the two great estates of Rosings Park and Pemberley, was all that Elizabeth needed to hear to understand the nature of Mr. Darcy's motives. Men of his ilk were nothing if not always seeking ways to expand their fortunes. Soon enough, Elizabeth began to pay her cousin no mind. She sat at the breakfast table thinking of all that had taken place the evening before. Heavy on her mind was the burden of deciding whether to accept Lady Catherine's open invitation to practice on the pianoforte. You would be in nobody's way in that part of the house, the proud aristocrat had insisted, referring to the East Library. The instrument was deemed in need of tuning, but any practice would be better than none, her ladyship went on to say, after Elizabeth concluded a command exhibition the evening before, one the grand lady had found wanting both in execution and taste, especially in comparison to her daughter's. Despite Anne's never having actually learned how to play the pianoforte, or any other instrument for that matter, owing to her health. Charlotte said, Have you any plans for today, my dear Eliza? If not, I should be delighted to have you accompany me to the village while I carry out my morning errands. The aggrieved vicar set his coffee cup down with an abrupt thump. Mrs. Collins, he interrupted. Have you failed to recall that Cousin Elizabeth is expected at Rosings this morning? In point of fact, sir, I am not quite certain I wish to accept your noble patroness's invitation, Elizabeth interjected. Completely taken aback, Mr. Collins declared, It is a great honour that her ladyship has extended to you, and one you would be wise to heed. Lady Catherine likes you, and she has afforded such an unparalleled kindness to you and likewise to this very house. His voice taking on a measure of authority laced with condescension, Collins continued, I know you like to fancy yourself immune to the advantages of such a compliment, but in this case I shall not abide your impertinence. Elizabeth was somewhat taken aback by his severe tone. It seemed the gentleman had not quite accustomed himself to being spurned when he offered his hand in marriage to her. Surely by now he could have no cause to regret his eventual choice in a bride. Charlotte was an excellent wife, perfectly unassuming and, as best Elizabeth could surmise, ever cognizant of the advantages of keeping herself in Lady Catherine de Bourgh's good graces. Although Elizabeth did not wish to gratify her cousin or Lady Catherine's demand in this, Faced with the prospect of listening to that ridiculous man go on and on preaching on the subject, it was far easier simply to go along with the scheme. If nothing else, she would do so for her friend Charlotte. As the Collins's house guest, she was obliged to accept Lady Catherine's invitation, if for no other reason than the preservation of household harmony. With that purpose in mind, she set out for her walk across the park. A few minutes with the early morning sun beaming down on her face was all it took to sweep away the discomfort she had endured in Mr. Collins's company. Having surmised her ladyship lived to be of service to others, Elizabeth could not repress the wry smile that crept across her face. She felt a modicum of gratitude that Lady Catherine had offered her such a convenient means of escape from her toady cousin, one that would keep her beyond the reach of his absurdity for hours if she could arrange it. Having recalled from the evening before that her ladyship had made plans to call on several friends and acquaintances in a neighbouring village, Elizabeth's spirits rose a little higher. Perhaps I shall escape the benevolent aristocrat as well, if I am quick about it. After an energetic early morning horseback ride with his cousin, 
Darcy walked into his apartment with a little less spring in his step than when he had left. That morning's excursion had been particularly strenuous. The hot bath that awaited his return was precisely what was called for to soothe his aching muscles, as well as quiet his busy mind of the troubling thoughts that simply would not go away, thoughts of the beguiling country miss who had robbed him of his equanimity for the past twelve hours or so. Listening to his valet uncharacteristically ramble on also turned out to be a welcome distraction. When the bath waters began to cool, Darcy climbed out of the tub, dried himself off, put on his rich velvet robe, and drifted over to the window to admire the view. What he saw proved worthy of his admiration. There she was, walking up the path to the manor house, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. His body's telling response in seeing her further bolstered a nagging suspicion that if he were not careful, he would be in grave danger from that young woman. So much for my hastily spoken words that Miss Elizabeth Bennet is not handsome enough to tempt me. He had cited her impertinence as further proof of this, but he had to admit to finding that particular flaw in her character to be rather intriguing. With what brashness did she respond to his aunt's barrage of questions, suggestions and innuendos the evening before, and in such a manner that even Lady Catherine herself could not take complete umbrage? In truth, this Elizabeth Bennet was unlike any other young woman of his acquaintance. I recall her saying that she is not yet one and twenty, Darcy silently pondered as he remained frozen in place, unable to tear his eyes away from Elizabeth as she neared the house. What is more, she is the second eldest of five daughters, all of them single. He remembered Miss Bennet's telling reaction to Lady Catherine's frank assessment of the Bennet daughter's dismal marital prospects. However harshly expressed, the dire prognosis was unfortunately very true. Darcy did not envy that family's plight one bit. Of course, he had his own future marital situation with which to contend. At eight and twenty, he had been most fastidious in regulating himself around members of the opposite sex. One never knew if the hordes of young women who showered him with deference and officious attention with such ardent alacrity did so out of sincerity, or if their motives were merely mercenary. He laughed a little. <laughs> One thing is certain, I shall garner no such civility from Miss Bennet. I beg your pardon, Mr. Darcy? Darcy spun around and observed his valet brushing one of his favourite jackets. Waving off the question, he moved away from the window. Let us make haste, Waters. I suspect this is going to be a long day. A half hour or so later, Darcy found himself standing just outside the door of the East Library, undecided whether to enter the room. Old habits, it seemed. Every year, Darcy visited his aunt and cousin at Rosings during the spring, more so out of family loyalty than any particular inclination to be there. Lady Catherine expected the courtesy, and it was the least he could do for his late mother's only sister and her closest friend, were he to believe his aunt's accounts. His aunt had misspoken when she offered Miss Bennet the use of that particular room, citing that she would be in nobody's way. For years, he had considered the East Library his private sanctuary, when he wanted time away from Lady Catherine and his cousins, Anne and Colonel Fitzwilliam. In fairness to his aunt, however, she could have no way of knowing he habitually stole away to that part of the house for long stretches of time, for he had practically sworn the servants to secrecy. Taking note of the sounds emanating from the poorly tuned pianoforte and echoing throughout the hall, Darcy released an exasperated breath. <sighs> if Lady Catherine is going to insist upon having Miss Bennet practice, the least she might do is have the instrument tuned. He made a mental note to instruct the butler to take care of that task as soon as could be. Darcy instantly thought to question himself on what he was about. He shrugged. It is the proper thing to do. As for the other question of why he was lingering outside the door of his favourite part of Rosings, his long-time source of solace during those times when he needed it most, 
his answer was rather more difficult to ascertain. Dare I allow the presence of the beguiling young woman from Hertfordshire to rob me of this, too? Chapter 3 Fond of Walking Bright and early the next day, Elizabeth eagerly set off to Rosings to practice for an hour or two. She had been fortunate to have come and gone the day before without attracting anyone's notice. If she were lucky, such would also be the case again. The Hunsford party was invited to dine at Rosings again that evening, much to Mr. Collins's delight. No doubt Lady Catherine would call upon her to exhibit after dinner. She looked forward to silencing her condescending critic. The certainty that she would once again be in Mr. Darcy's company was not something she looked forward to. However, the Colonel's amiability would surely outweigh the haughty younger man's unpleasantness. Elizabeth had not practised very long before the library door swung open and in walked a servant bearing a tea tray. Moments later, while the servant was setting out the tea things, Mr. Darcy strolled into the room. It had not dawned on Elizabeth until that instance, but now she was utterly convinced that she had espied the gentleman lurking in the hallway outside the library the day before. At the time she had thought it was too odd to be true, and had persuaded herself that she had merely imagined seeing him. What on earth is that gentleman about? Elizabeth wondered, as she leafed through the music sheets before her for another piece to perform. She pretended to take no notice when Mr. Darcy thanked and subsequently dismissed the servant. Now it was just the two of them, alone. Elizabeth immediately commenced playing, attempting to dispel the awkwardness of their situation. Mr. Darcy cleared his throat. Still, Elizabeth did not look up from her task. <clears throat> Will you take tea with me, Miss Bennet? She could no longer pretend he was not in the room. Smiling, she said, Thank you for your kind offer, sir. I am afraid I must decline. Do you not drink tea? I believe you know very well that I do drink tea, sir. I suppose I ought to have said, I'm not thirsty. Darcy strode over to where Elizabeth sat and assumed an advantageous position by the instrument, one that afforded him a full view of her countenance. She summoned her courage amid the daunting weight of his silent inspection. Do you mean to frighten me, sir? No. However, I would have a word with you. Elizabeth folded her hands in her lap and gazed at him expectantly. She said nothing, which he considered sufficient encouragement to continue with his speech. I could not help but notice you walked here alone yesterday, and likewise you returned to the parsonage on foot. You arrived in the same manner this morning by foot. Here he paused, as if awaiting her response. She spoke not a word. I will gladly make my carriage available to you, he hastily offered. Elizabeth arched her brow. Are you trying to hurry me along my way, Mr. Darcy? He shook his head. No, I believe I am thinking only of your comfort. It is quite a distance from here to the parsonage. I'm very fond of walking, sir, Elizabeth said, positioning her fingers on the keys. She took up playing where she had left off before he interrupted her. With that, Darcy walked away. He retrieved a large leather-bound book from one of the library shelves and took a seat on a nearby couch. Seeing all this, Elizabeth gave her fingers a rest. Sir, pray my practicing will not impede your pleasure in your book. No, he replied, opening the book somewhere close to the middle. However, if you insist on walking, I suppose I ought to escort you to the parsonage when you have finished practicing. Do you mean to suggest that hordes of bandits are lurking behind the manicured shrubbery along the lane, sir? Elizabeth asked. Affording her taunting retort a degree of consideration it did not warrant, Darcy responded, I do not think there are. However, as a gentleman, serving as your escort is the least I can do. Ambling along at a leisurely pace a short while later, 
It occurred to Elizabeth that the two of them had barely spoken a word to each other, at least not aloud, for she had bombarded him with silent questions every step of the way. From what little time she had spent in his company, she knew he could be aloof, but he had been the one to insist upon accompanying her to the parsonage. What could be his purpose if he only means to be silent and grave? Elizabeth asked herself more than once. Casting occasional sideways glances at the gentleman by her side, Elizabeth could not help but reflect upon how attractive she had thought he was when she first saw him. His handsome face, his dark, brooding eyes, and his rich baritone voice. Then, too, he was tall with broad shoulders, and there was something in his manner of walk, all of which evidenced his proud aristocratic lineage. However, all the estimable qualities in the world could not excuse his rudeness. Mr. Darcy's callous proclamation that she was not handsome enough to tempt him had wounded her deeply. She simply was not accustomed to hearing such derisiveness from the mouth of a gentleman, and certainly not in reference to her. On the other hand, he surely would not have uttered those words if he had known he would be overheard by anyone. Or would he? Elizabeth could not be sure. Were it not for the fact that he had deliberately put himself in her path, she was absolutely certain she would not be giving herself so much trouble to comprehend what the haughty gentleman was about. Yet sketch his character she must. She silently compiled a list of possible reasons why he had waited in the library for her to finish practising, and now walked along beside her. I suppose he simply has nothing better to do. As best I can tell, he wants nothing to do with his so-called intended, else surely she would have been the beneficiary of his company today. By now they were halfway to the parsonage, and still the gentleman had not uttered a word. Say something, pray say anything, sir, or I shall go distracted by the quiet, Elizabeth silently exclaimed. As though he had heard her plea, Darcy rested his eyes on hers. Her initial thought was to look away, but that would never do. She did not want to give him the impression she was scared of him, although having been caught staring rendered her more than a little uncomfortable. She racked her brain in search of a means to eliminate the ensuing awkwardness. It was exceedingly kind of you to walk with me, sir, she uttered. However, all things considered, I believe I should continue on my own from here. All things considered, Darcy asked, his expression befuddled. She bit her lower lip. My cousin, Mr. Collins, were he to see us walking together like this, might misinterpret things. At the very least, he might insist upon inviting you inside his humble abode. I am quite certain you would not want that. I believe it is safe to accompany you to the gate. I shall take my chances after that. You must not say I did not warn you if luck finds itself on my cousin's side. I shall consider myself forewarned, Miss Bennet. His melodic voice, so soft and tender with that last pronouncement, took Elizabeth's breath away. What a pity he does not speak more often, she thought. And then she immediately chastised herself upon remembering his harsh words the evening they met. Moments later, he resumed talking. If you will allow me to speak candidly, Miss Bennet, there is a matter I wish to discuss with you pertaining to the evening we met. Oh, Elizabeth replied, her interest piqued. He nodded. Indeed, what I have to say has to do with George Wickham. Elizabeth's entire demeanour stiffened. She could feel her temper rising with each passing second. I assure you, sir, I have heard quite enough already to comprehend fully how little you and your aunt think of Lieutenant Wickham. Darcy halted his footsteps, forcing Elizabeth to do likewise. The decided difference in their statures caused her to arch her neck to look the gentleman directly in his eyes while she braced herself for his defence. My aunt and I are not always of the same mind. 
but as regards George Wickham, you would be wise to listen to her counsel. Do not allow yourself to be deceived by that man. There are too many things about him that you do not know. What is there to know, other than his father was your father's steward, and that Lieutenant Wickham and you, childhood friends by your own admission, have since suffered an irreconcilable parting of the ways? I will ask you to trust me. Heed my aunt's advice. Write to your father and tell him what Lady Catherine told you. Trust you? I beg your pardon, sir, but you are little more than a stranger to me. A rather impertinent stranger at that. Whereas my acquaintance with Lieutenant Wickham is of a long duration. In truth, she had not known the gentleman very long at all when measured by the passage of time. She knew Mr. Wickham's character, which in her estimation was worth ten times that of the haughty gentleman who now stood before her. I do not wish to argue with you, young lady. I only wanted to warn you. I would be terribly remiss if I did not. The condescension in his tone freed her from the constraints of calm civility. She took a step closer. I too would be remiss if I did not speak on another matter pertaining to the evening we met. I'm listening, he said, clasping both hands behind his back, thus affording her his undivided attention. I heard what you said about me to your cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, sir. Darcy showed no hint of remorse at having been overheard, which further confirmed Elizabeth's decreasing opinion of him, her suspicion that he was uncaring of the feelings of others. What a shame, for they needed not be adversaries. He remained silent. Elizabeth said, Surely you mean to apologize? Perhaps you are merely taking the time to fashion your response, when all that is necessary is to say, I apologize for the offense. Darcy said, No offense was intended. Elizabeth's mouth fell open. Her eyes bore into his. She waited. I was engaged in a private conversation with my cousin. Shall I ask for forgiveness because you were listening in on a discussion meant for his ears alone? I suppose if that is the best you can do by way of an apology, then I will be similarly generous in my acceptance. The truth is, Miss Bennet, that I would take those hastily spoken words back if it were within my power. The truth is, perceiving that he was on the verge of saying far too much, Darcy ceased speaking. To tell her how intrigued he was with her from the moment he first laid eyes on her simply would not do. The fact that he had thought of little else other than her since they met puzzled him exceedingly. What is it about this impertinent young woman that fascinates me so? Darcy silently pondered, and not for the first time. One thing was clear, especially with her standing close enough for him to appreciate the faint scent of lavender from her hair and to detect the tiny little imperfection on her right cheek. He was more determined than ever to find out. Chapter 4 Studier of Character That evening, the Hunsford party found themselves seated at the lavishly laden dinner table at Rosings once again. Elizabeth could easily surmise that her ladyship took a great deal of pleasure in such gatherings, and she imagined this occasion was but the second of many she might suffer during her visit. Mr. Collins sat on Elizabeth's right, and Mr. Berg sat on Elizabeth's left. The seating arrangement was far from ideal. What with her finding herself settled between an abundance of sycophantic ramblings on one side and a drought of meaningful discourse on the other. She could hardly complain, for it afforded a perfect opportunity for her to escape Lady Catherine's intense scrutiny. Unlike the first dinner, Elizabeth could enjoy this meal. If she had but one complaint, it was that Mr. Darcy sat directly opposite her. How ironic that she had actually wished for a similar circumstance the evening they first met. How astounding that Elizabeth now discerned in Mr. Darcy's countenance and deportment a startling resemblance to Lady Catherine. This undeniable likeness was not a bad thing in and of itself. If one were to strip away the thick layers of officiousness and haughtiness, 
No doubt one would find a woman who continues to enjoy her fair share of beauty. Elizabeth's busy mind veered to the last time she and Mr. Darcy were together. Their parting earlier that afternoon had seen a resumption of silence after they exchanged heated words, as well as an awkward farewell at the parsonage gate. Cool civility marked their reunion that evening, which suited Elizabeth just fine. After dinner, Lady Catherine, Mr. Collins, Charlotte and Anne were playing whist. Lady Catherine had sought most unsuccessfully to commandeer Mr. Darcy, whom Elizabeth by now surmised was the favourite of her two nephews, to partner with her. He declined, citing his intention to resume reading his book. Accordingly, he took a seat by the fireplace, apart from everyone else. Elizabeth, finding herself the happy recipient of Colonel Fitzwilliam's undivided attention, sat near by a window with the gentleman. The Colonel said, How are you enjoying your visit? All things considered, I have no cause to repine. The Colonel arched his brow. All things considered, Miss Bennet? <laughs> you have met my cousin, sir. With the ease of acquaintances of a long duration, Elizabeth and the Colonel shared a knowing smile. After silently chiding herself for engaging in a bit of fun at her relation's expense, and with a stranger no less, Elizabeth continued, What I ought to have said is that I am enjoying a very lovely visit. Mrs. Collins and I have been intimate friends for so long as I can recall. Her family's home is very near my own. I cannot ask for better company than hers. I should hope that you find your immediate company just as pleasurable, he uttered for her ears alone, leaning a bit closer than he had been before. You're impertinent, Elizabeth replied, feigning offence. The colonel straightened himself in his seat. My intentions are entirely honourable, I assure you. Elizabeth felt the colour spread all over her body. She hastily responded, I might as well inquire as to how well you are enjoying your visit, sir. We both find ourselves beholden to the generosity of others for the foreseeable future, do we not? Indeed we are. In response to your question, I would have to say that I tend to find immense pleasure wherever the road takes me. <laughs> that is precisely the sort of reply I expected from you, she said, smiling. Is that so, Miss Bennet? You and I have only been in company twice, including this evening, and already you think you know me so well. I congratulate myself on being a fair studier of character. I am pleased to know that you consider me worthy of study, he responded, his brow arched. What an unabashed flirt! Elizabeth surmised she was going to like the colonel very much. In a manner befitting the moment, she said, you, this room, the prospect from the window overlooking Lady Catherine's gardens. Here she paused and threw a furtive gaze to the part of the room where Mr. Darcy sat. No longer was he attending his book. He was looking intently at her. Returning her attention to her companion, Elizabeth continued, There is no lack of subjects worthy of study. The colonel placed his clutched hands on his heart. You wound me, Miss Bennet. Elizabeth laughed a little. <laughs> I suspect any pain I may have inflicted will be of a short duration. <laughs> Who among us knows me better than you? Barely glancing up from her game, Lady Catherine said, I should be delighted if you would play something for us, Miss Bennet. Despite the hint of civility in her ladyship's voice, Elizabeth recognised her edict for what it was. Silently begging the colonel's pardon, Elizabeth stood and went over and sat down directly at the instrument. Colonel Fitzwilliam followed suit and pulled up a chair near her. She had not been playing very long before Mr. Darcy, having given up the pretense of reading a while ago, put down his book, made his way to the pianoforte, and stationed himself so as to command a perfect view of Elizabeth's countenance. Elizabeth waited until the first convenient pause and then turned to him with an arched smile. What valuable advice do you mean to convey this evening, Mr. Darcy? 
Perhaps you have observed something in my technique that is wanting, and you feel you would be remiss should you fail to point it out to me. I will not argue with you, Miss Bennet. Upon hearing this, the colonel said, I would say that is a wise decision on your part, cousin. I fear you may not emerge the victor. Miss Bennet has a way with her words. Is that so? Darcy replied to his cousin. His eyes remained trained on Elizabeth's. He said, I am not afraid of you. Elizabeth purposely ignored his retort. Colonel Fitzwilliam said, You ought to be. Miss Bennet has a passion for studying people's character, identifying their weakness, and using it to her best advantage when one least expects it. I speak from experience. Responding to his cousin, but still looking at Elizabeth, Darcy said, Do you not consider that the young lady enjoys professing opinions that are not entirely her own, for purposes known only to herself? Elizabeth could not let this latest remark pass completely unchallenged. Speaking to the colonel, she said, It now seems that your cousin presumes to know me, and on the basis of so short an acquaintance as ours, no less. Perhaps my cousin fancies himself a fair studier of character, too. It seems the two of you have much in common. What say you, Darcy? I believe such a talent, in order to be truly worthy of boasting, would require moving about in far broader circles. From what I know of small country society, there cannot have been many opportunities for Miss Bennet to perfect such a craft. Country society can be rather less varying. Elizabeth was sorely tempted to put forth a defence of the country society of Meryton that the gentleman had practically ridiculed, but boasting of dining regularly with four-and-twenty families was woefully insufficient for this particular challenge. Instead, she said, you, sir, posit that the breadth of one's circle is an adequate measure of one's understanding of human nature. I do not share your views on the matter. You will find the same composition of sensibilities among societies both large and small. People will be people wherever they are. She looked directly into his eyes. Now hate me, if you dare. Before Darcy could fashion a response, Lady Catherine, having drawn closer to the instrument, said, Miss Bennet gives her opinions rather fondly for someone her age. All heads turned towards the elderly woman. Her ladyship continued, When I was your age, young lady, I was married and mistress of my own home. She waved her walking stick about with a flourish. Mistress of all this. Mind you, I am not suggesting that your prospects are so superior as mine were, what was my excellent father being the former Earl of Matlock. But you would do well to hold your tongue until you can boast in the same way as other married women of your sphere. Someone much like Mrs. Collins over there. Neither Darcy nor Elizabeth replied to Lady Catherine's admonishment. Darcy knew enough about Elizabeth to discern that she did not appreciate the advice, however well-meaning. In this case, his aunt had been outright officious. For his part, he was not at all apt to agree with his noble relation. He found such stimulating intercourse with Elizabeth refreshing. If only she were not so far beneath me in consequence, he pondered. If only. The next afternoon, Elizabeth and Charlotte sat in the parlour. The former read her book, and the latter attended her sewing. Seeing that her friend's whole heart was not in the pages before her, judging by the manner in which Elizabeth's eyes continued to drift towards the window, Charlotte said, Mr. Darcy seems quite taken with you. It is true that he feels a certain obligation towards seeing to my safe arrival to the parsonage after I practice at Rosings, but I cannot excuse his uncharitable remarks at my expense to his cousin. Hardly any time at all had passed after Elizabeth had overheard Mr. Darcy's insult before she told her friend. Charlotte had sought some explanation for Elizabeth's dampened enthusiasm upon her return to the parlour, and Elizabeth had been in desperate want of someone in whom she could at once confide her wounded feelings, and likewise assuage her mortified pride with a show of laughter, even if a bit repressed. Her want to laugh at the ridiculousness of others was a favourite pastime of Elizabeth's, which was a very good thing indeed, and especially that first evening at Rosings, 
else she would never have suffered Mr. Darcy's company so easily as she had when he and his cousin rejoined the ladies in the parlour. Now surely you cannot hold that against him still. His actions have completely belied his words, have they not? That is to say nothing of the manner in which he looks at you when he believes he is unobserved. Elizabeth nodded. It is true, the gentleman does stare at me, but I am given to suspect his purpose in doing so is merely to find fault. Let us not pretend that you do not do a fair amount of staring at him as well, Charlotte teased. Elizabeth laughed a little at this picture of herself. <laughs> Surely you cannot find fault for me doing so, she responded in kind. You've seen the gentleman. If only his character was as pleasing as his looks, she silently considered. Indeed, I hope you do not mind my saying this, but your Mr. Wickham is nothing at all to your Mr. Darcy. Oh, Charlotte, I have no claims to either of the two gentlemen, I assure you. Certainly not Mr. Wickham, Elizabeth thought, for no doubt he had found another young woman in Brighton upon whom he now bestowed his charms. Good for him. I can think of no one who is more deserving of happiness. As for Mr. Darcy, Mr. Burke is more than welcome to him. Elizabeth knew just enough about that young woman to suspect that she was cut from the same cloth as Lady Catherine, despite the former's quiet reserve, as well as the complete absence of any physical resemblance between the two. Such being the case, Elizabeth felt that the cousins actually deserved each other. Charlotte's enthusiasm on her friend's behalf would not be so easily curbed. Oh, but you might, she continued. If I know anything at all about men, I am certain Mr. Darcy is half in love with you already. And I say that such a notion is too absurd to warrant further discussion. You told me yourself that the gentleman is engaged to his cousin, did you not? And so he is, we'll want to rely solely upon Lady Catherine's testimony. But having had the chance to observe the gentleman in company of late, I would say he and his aunt cannot possibly be of the same mind. She shook her head. No, indeed. There is but one woman, as best I can tell, who has Mr. Darcy in her power, and her name is most certainly not Miss Anne de Bourgh. Chapter 5 Chances for Felicity A little over a week later, Charlotte wandered into the parlour in search of her houseguest. A cheerful smile spread across her face when she espied her friend. Here you are, my dearest Eliza. Elizabeth set her latest missive from her eldest sister aside and greeted her friend with equal affection. Yes, I am the happy recipient of a letter from Jane. What news from Longbourn? Jane said Papa has yielded to Mamma's unrelenting requests and has given his permission for Lydia to travel to Brighton with Colonel Foster's wife. She has already taken her leave. Charlotte took a seat next to her guest. And what of Kitty? I always like to think of your two youngest sisters as nearly inseparable. Charlotte's supposition was quite true. Although Lydia was the younger of the two, she wielded an inordinate amount of influence on Kitty. Rarely could the former be seen or heard without the latter. Where the two young ladies were concerned, Elizabeth could not help agreeing with her father that they were the silliest girls in all of England. Lydia was by far the silliest, and the wildest, for that matter. According to Jane, Kitty is best described as prostrate with grief that she is not allowed to join the Fosters. However, she was not so intimate with Mrs. Foster as Lydia, and as a consequence no invitation was extended to her. I did not know that Lydia and Colonel Foster's wife got along so well. Elizabeth nodded. Indeed. It appears the two of them formed quite an attachment over the past few months since the Foster's wedding. I am often given to think that young woman is as silly as my two youngest sisters. I would be worried for Lydia's safety were it not for the fact that she will be under the Colonel's protection. Indeed, Colonel Foster is an intelligent man. He will see that Lydia meets with no harm, Charlotte said reassuringly. And let us not forget that you will be in Mr. Wickham's company as well. Oh dear, Charlotte said, placing her hand on her chest. Whatever do you mean? 
Surely you have not allowed Lady Catherine's misguided point of view or that of her nephew to poison you against Mr. Wickham's character? You met him yourself, and on numerous occasions. Has his behaviour ever been anything other than beyond reproach? I cannot personally attest to anything untoward on his part. However, there was the business of his sudden interest in Miss Mary King after she inherited her fortune. I recall receiving any number of letters from my mother on the subject. The matter of the young lady's hasty removal from Hertfordshire continues to raise questions in people's minds. Charlotte reached out her hand to her friend. I am sorry to say this, dear Eliza, knowing how much you have always liked the gentleman, but the mercenary nature of his actions in this regard, combined with Lady Catherine's admonishments, as well as Mr. Darcy's decided disdain, are considerations that ought not to be ignored. Charlotte, you cannot be serious. No doubt you merely intend to vex me when you know full well what I think of that woman's opinion, but it will not work. Since when are a young man's hopes of furthering his chances for felicity by seeking an advantageous alliance to be likened to maliciousness? Is this practice not precisely what is expected of members of the opposite sex? Elizabeth was too politic to point out that Charlotte had married for security, but however unspoken, the implication was clear. The older woman evidenced no offence. What of Mr. Darcy's objections? You have spent enough time in his company to discern that he is over a hundred times Wickham's worth, and I am not speaking of the gentleman's enormous wealth. It is true that I have spent a fair amount of time in Mr. Darcy's company. However, I had the occasion of spending a great deal of time with Mr. Wickham as well. If he was so untrustworthy as Mr. Darcy suggests, I am quite certain that such a flaw in his character would have revealed itself. Instead, I only detected good in the gentleman, and I will not allow the opinions of others to persuade me against him. He is the only person capable of doing that, and frankly, I do not see how that would be possible. As there was no sign of yielding on either of their parts, Charlotte and Elizabeth simply agreed to disagree, concurring that their mutual admiration need not be affected by matters that were beyond their control. Having survived the inherent awkwardness of the former accepting an offer of marriage from the same man whose proposal to Elizabeth had barely grown cold, they were certain nothing would ever come between them again. Darcy placed his hand on the small of her back. Leaning closer than propriety allowed when he turned the pages, he whispered in her ear so she might feel the brush of his breath warm against the nape of her neck as he spoke. Such diversions pleased her well enough were he to judge by the rise and fall of her bosom. Wanting more, some repetition of all the pleasures he bestowed upon her night after night in his dreams, the desire to lift her into his arms, sweep away all impediments to his purpose, and lower her atop the finely tuned instrument nearly undid him. I must abstain from entertaining such thoughts, especially when I am standing this close to her breathing in subtle hints of lavender from her hair, watching her fingers stroking the keys, and enjoying the barely perceptible twist of her lips. She is a proper young lady who, notwithstanding her impertinence, knows nothing of the ways of the world. The thought that he might be the one to teach her threatened to increase his discomfort, affording evidence of his burgeoning ardour. Elizabeth cleared her throat and thereby interrupted Mr. Darcy's musings. Slightly uncomfortable with the thoughts he had just entertained, he sought to cover up his disturbance. Did you write to your father, as my aunt advised? Having surmised that Mr. Darcy was exceedingly quiet that morning, and feeling a bit flustered under the weight of his gaze, Elizabeth was relieved to have diverted him from whatever thoughts he was thinking by clearing her throat. Even talk of his aunt was a welcome reprieve from his silence. Indeed, I have written to my father any number of times. However, I most certainly did not do so to satisfy your aunt's demands, nor did I convey her directives. Are you always so stubborn? Are you always so impertinent? I am afraid what you look upon as impertinence is merely my way of expressing genuine concern for the welfare of you and your family. Have I asked for such consideration on your part? Elizabeth inquired, her voice raised. 
pray, Miss Bennet, do anything but allow your high regard for your own opinion to blind you towards my honest intentions. Mr. Darcy, if you and I are to have any chance at all of mutual civility, then I must insist you and I agree to disagree on all matters concerning Mr. Wickham. I know not the particulars of your grievance with the gentleman. As there are, after all, two sides to every story, I suspect Mr. Wickham has a different story to tell. So heavily engaged in their debate were they that neither of them noticed that Lady Catherine had strolled into the room. She moved quickly to the pianoforte. Elizabeth rose and curtsied. Lady Catherine, carry on as you were, young woman. She peered at her nephew pointedly. Darcy, I did not expect to find you here. Glancing back at Elizabeth, she said, Pray my nephew is not keeping you from practicing, Miss Bennet. Not at all, Lady Catherine. Capital. No manner of competence is possible without constant practicing. You will never truly excel in this regard as I am sure I would have, and so would my Anne if her health allowed. But I wager you shall be quite the proficient by the time you return to your father's home. Speaking once more to her nephew, she inquired, How does Georgiana get along? I trust she does not waver in that regard. Darcy nodded. Georgiana practices faithfully every day. That is excellent, her ladyship cried. It has been far too long since I bore witness to my niece's exhibition prowess. You must tell her that I expect a lengthy recital when next we meet. Darcy's eyes fell once again on Elizabeth. He wanted nothing more than time alone with her, if only his aunt would take her leave. Darcy, I wish to speak with you his noble aunt decreed. What is it, Lady Catherine? Not here, her ladyship exclaimed. I would have a word with you in privacy. Darcy threw Elizabeth an apologetic glance, an entirely unnecessary gesture as far as Elizabeth was concerned, for she was just as eager to see the nephew leave as she was the aunt. She supposed she ought to thank Lady Catherine for sparing her the burden of being in the company of the officious Mr. Darcy. How dare he venture to tell me how to act? Does he even realize how much he and his aunt are alike? Self-important, arrogant, and all-knowing? Elizabeth commenced wondering about the gentleman's sister, Miss Georgiana Darcy. This was not the first time her ladyship had boasted of her niece's accomplishments. No doubt she remains under her brother's protection. He must enjoy having someone he can rightfully instruct in how to think and how to feel. Elizabeth was in no need of such guidance. Even her own father did not tell her what she could and could not do. I have my own opinion on how I ought to comport myself, of whom I should be wary and whom I should trust. My judgment has not failed me yet. When Darcy and his aunt were alone in the foyer, Lady Catherine said, If it were not for the fact that Miss Bennet is so far beneath you in consequence as to be laughable, I might take umbrage at your being here. However, I would ask you that you do not interrupt the young woman. Her time is much better employed practicing, and yours is much better employed attending my daughter, Anne. Deciding it would be pointless to argue with his aunt on this point, Darcy held his tongue. Indeed, that was a battle that he had successfully dodged countless times in the past, and he could wait a while longer until the moment was right. For the time being, he could hardly wait to escape his aunt. Besides, the last thing he needed was to be reminded of his obligation to his so-called intended. If his time alone with Elizabeth had taught him anything, it was that he would not let family demands dictate his decisions for his own future. Marrying his cousin Anne had never been an option. Still, his struggle over feelings for Elizabeth was far from over. A man of his station could not reasonably entertain ideas of marriage without some attention to his bride's standing in society, especially a gentleman of his consequence. For so long as he could recall, he had been a target of eager matchmaking mamas and young ladies from the best families in the tone. He knew nothing about Miss Bennet's family, aside from the fact that her father was a country gentleman whose estate was entailed away from the female line to that ridiculous Mr. Collins. If that is the worst of it, her circumstances are hardly untenable. Derbyshire is a long way from Kent, even from Hertfordshire, for that matter. 
Chapter 6 Just As He Pleases This was the first Sunday since Elizabeth's arrival that did not entail tea at Rosings after the sermon. She looked forward to the liberty of an afternoon away from not only Lady Catherine, but from her cousin Mr. Collins as well, for he and Charlotte were invited to one of the parishioners' homes. Elizabeth was not inclined to go with them, and hence she chose not to, a feat that was infinitely easier to accomplish than eschewing an invitation from Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Trying as hard as she did, Elizabeth continued to endure the overbearing aristocrat with measured civility and the requisite impertinence when the woman's curiosity, veiled insults, and derisive innuendos would not otherwise be repressed. Her situation was not entirely bad, for she could rightly say her exhibition skills had improved significantly, what with all her practising of late. Mr. Darcy seems to enjoy listening to me play well enough, she thought. However, Lady Catherine complained that Elizabeth needed more practice, else she would never be considered accomplished, even for a young woman of Elizabeth's station, as someone whom her ladyship had surmised by now might just as well be a governess or a companion. Elizabeth thought of the irony of Lady Catherine's disparagement. She laments my chances of finding a husband, owing to my age as well as my station. When I wager, I am more likely to marry one of her nephews before her daughter does. For a while, Elizabeth allowed herself to engage in fanciful notions of what it would be like to be married to Mr. Darcy. Though she would admit it to no one, she was beginning to look forward to time in his company. She had hardly made a start of imagining herself as Mr. Darcy's wife before she banished the thought. Her ladyship would suffer a fit of apoplexy if she were to suppose for one instance that I might be the means of ruining her hopes for a union between her nephew and her daughter. The makings of a great financial dynasty would be at stake, one too tempting for even Mr. Darcy to renounce. Of that, Elizabeth had no doubt. In her limited experience, men of Mr. Darcy's ilk wanted nothing more than to expand their wealth and power. She further suspected that it mattered not one bit to such ambitious men the required means of accomplishing their goals. On the other hand, Lady Catherine's nephew Colonel Fitzwilliam was worthy of serious consideration on Elizabeth's part. In all the ways that mattered most, he satisfied her notion of everything a true gentleman ought to be. Of the two of her ladyship's nephews, he was by far the more amiable. Elizabeth liked him very much. She was confident that she would be just as happy with him as she would with anyone else. A feeling deep down inside of her suggested otherwise. It had been a while since any gentleman's presence wreaked such havoc on her sensibilities and made her tremble inside with a look or a word or a touch. Mr. Darcy, what was this power he had over her? She was not afraid of him, of that she was certain. If only her mind could persuade her heart not to skip a beat whenever he walked in the room. Deciding her time was better spent perusing Jane's latest letter than deliberating what in all likelihood would never be, Elizabeth commenced doing just that. Walking along with her mind full of all Jane had to say about those matters pertaining to Lydia's Brighton adventure and Kitty's unrelenting protests, Elizabeth was surprised upon looking up that Colonel Fitzwilliam was meeting her. What a fortunate coincidence for her. She tucked her letter away and smiled. I did not know that you ever walked this way, sir. I generally like to make a tour of the park every now and again. I intend to call on the parsonage. Are you planning to go much farther? If not, it will be my great pleasure if you would turn and accompany me on this fine day. I shall be delighted to walk with you, sir, Elizabeth said, turning. They commenced walking to the parsonage together. How much longer can we expect the pleasure of your company before you return to town? That, Miss Bennet, is entirely at my cousin's discretion. He arranges things just as he pleases. I am not surprised. Mr. Darcy, as far as I can tell, likes to have his own way. Elizabeth spoke from experience. He had, after all, taken up the task of accompanying her from Rosings to Kent and all because she had turned down the offer of his carriage. <laughs> Indeed he does, as do we all. He simply has the better means of accomplishing it than others because he is rich. 
Money is power, as they say. As a younger son, I speak feelingly, as I must be inured to self-denial and dependence. She laughed a little at this picture he painted of himself. Surely you jest, sir. I am given to believe the younger son of an earl must know very little of either. That is where you are mistaken, Miss Bennet. The coincidence of one's order of birth can mean the difference between inheriting all of a family's wealth and having to take up the law or some other respectable livelihood, as in my case, becoming an officer. The colonel sighed. Indeed, as the second son of an earl, I am not even at liberty to marry where I like. Our rather expensive habits make us far too dependent. That, in conjunction with our family's rank, effectively prevents us from marrying without some attention to money. My excellent father, for one, would be most displeased were I to fail in securing an alliance that would alleviate him of my financial burden, and possibly bolster even further our family's noble status. Thinking the colonel's lengthy speech was in some way directed at her, Elizabeth coloured a little. She did not intend to have him think she was affected, and she quickly recovered. She playfully teased, Pray what is the usual price for an earl's second son? He answered in the same tone as the question was asked, and soon that particular subject was dropped. Directing their intercourse back to where it had started, she inquired of Mr. Darcy. I wonder he did not join you to call at the parsonage. On the other hand, I suppose he might have found such an occasion rather tedious, in light of his taciturn nature. <sighs> My cousin does not always express himself so freely as others. He states that he does not possess the talent of conversing easily with those who are unconnected to him, and that he cannot catch the tone of their conversation or appear interested in their concerns. Well, sir, I suppose you know him best. What say you to his assertion? Colonel Fitzwilliam chuckled. I often tease him that he simply does not give himself the trouble. In truth, he means no harm. Suffice it to say, my cousin is one of the best men I know. He is a loyal friend, a generous master, and a loving brother. There is nothing he would not do for those who are really his friends. He takes prodigious care of those whom he deems worthy of his devotion. That is, until he no longer considers the person worthy, I wager. I take it that you are referring to the cessation of his friendship with George Wickham. I suppose I am. Your cousin and I are quite at odds over the matter of Mr. Wickham. He seems to have taken up your aunt's cause in warning me against the gentleman. I believe Darcy only has you and your family's best interest at heart in warning you against that gentleman. No doubt he does not wish to see what happened to a particular young lady of his acquaintance befall anyone else. What happened? Elizabeth exclaimed with energy. In a more disinterested fashion, she continued, If it is not asking too much, who was the young lady? In a somewhat uneasy manner, the colonel said, I have said all I can. It is, after all, not my story to tell. You will pardon me, then, if I do not put any degree of credence in an indictment as vague as this. It is not that I do not respect you, but I have known Mr. Wickham far longer than I have known you. I have seen nothing in his character that would allow me to abandon my good opinion of him, simply because he somehow earned your cousin's disapprobation, a feat that is easily attained, if I know anything at all about Mr. Darcy. The colonel went on to speak in his cousin's defence in such terms of generality as to be wholly unconvincing. He might as well have been whistling in the wind as far as Elizabeth was concerned. What does it matter to me that Mr. Darcy thwarted Mr. Wickham's attempt to elope with a young lady against the wishes of her family? She was a young woman of some means, according to the colonel. Is that not what two young people who are violently in love do when supposed well-intended others are determined to stand in their way? Should Mr. Darcy's actions be judged any differently from Mr. King's when he hastily removed his daughter, Miss Mary King, from Hertfordshire, no doubt to thwart her budding courtship with Mr. Wickham? Elizabeth had not held Mr. Wickham's attempt to better himself by means of an advantageous alliance with a young heiress against him before. She certainly did not intend to do so now. Seeing that her mind was made up on the subject, the colonel said no more. He was too much of a gentleman to admonish her for maintaining her convictions, however much he may not have agreed with them. 
he told her as much. Changing the subject yet again, he and Elizabeth continued walking along and talking on indifferent matters until they reached the parsonage. Neither of the two had suffered in the eyes of the other, which was a very good thing, as no doubt the time they would be spending in each other's company was nowhere near an end. Chapter 7 Remains Unanswered Several weeks later, what with regularly being thrown into each other's paths, either at church or rosings, Darcy's attention towards Elizabeth had not waned. He did not always sit with her in the East Library while she practised, but he always made certain to be on hand to accompany her back to the parsonage. Indeed, walking alone with Elizabeth was easily his favourite part of the day. His desire to spend more time with her caused him to delay his departure from Kent as well, and on more than one occasion. Elizabeth was never quite so lively during their walks as when in the Colonel's company. Darcy attributed this to his own reticence. Surely she looked forward to their time together as much as he did. Whenever he would speak, she always responded in kind, which confirmed his thinking that she was merely following his lead. On that particular day, Darcy sought to satisfy his curiosity on Elizabeth's ideas of marriage. How a young woman as charming as Elizabeth could have reached the age of nearly one and twenty and not secured a marriage proposal was difficult for him to fathom. Mr. Collins seems to be very fortunate in his choice of wife. Elizabeth nodded. My friend is one of the few sensible women I believe who would have accepted him. He is very fortunate in that regard. However, as sensible as Mrs. Collins is, I have not always considered her marrying Mr. Collins the wisest thing she ever did. She seems perfectly happy. I suppose you are correct. In a prudential light, it is a very good match for her. She takes a great deal of comfort in being mistress of her own home. And what of your preferences for your own marital felicity, Miss Bennet? In what respect, Mr. Darcy? Pray, what is it that satisfies your fondest wish as regards the prospect of marriage? Surely you mean to marry. Is that not what every young woman dreams of? It is most important to me that I honour and respect my future husband. I am certain I could never truly be happy if either of those two things was missing. To settle for anything less no doubt would subject the gentleman and me to misery of the acutest kind. The manner in which her father regarded her mother over the years had taught her that at least one, if not both, of those essential elements was missing in her parents' union. Such a marriage was not for her. You made no mention of love and affection. Do you not aspire to a love match, Miss Bennet? First of all, sir, if we are to engage in intercourse of such an intimate nature as this, may I prevail upon you to address me as Miss Elizabeth? I often find myself looking about in search of my eldest sister Jane whenever I hear Miss Bennet. I shall be honoured to address you as Miss Elizabeth. In fact, I am delighted to do so. That said, my question remains unanswered. Sir, I might as well ask the same question of you. I am not unaware of your presumed engagement to your cousin, Mr. Berg. Surely it is not an arrangement with any manner of love or affection as its basis, were one to judge by your attentiveness towards her. I would beg you not to give credence to any notion that I am engaged to marry my cousin. Why ever not? Is it not widely circulated among those who know you and your family best? Which still does not make it true. The truth is that Lady Catherine desires the match. She heralds it as a favourite wish of my late mother as well as herself. Anne does not wish it. I certainly do not. Elizabeth could hardly believe what she was hearing. It was true that between the gentleman and his cousin there existed no evidence of anything beyond a familial affection for each other. What did that matter? She knew enough about people of their ilk to understand that upholding family loyalty overrode all else, even the heart, especially the heart. If that is indeed the case, then my question stands. Do you desire a love match, Mr. Darcy? 
I can say with utter conviction that yes, I do, Miss Elizabeth. Elizabeth and Darcy, as involved in their own discourse as they were, did not notice that the Colonel was quickly heading their way. What a pleasant surprise this is seeing the two of you, he said when he reached them. Darcy said, I am accompanying Miss Bennet to the parsonage. Shall I look for you at Rosings upon my return, or do you have other plans? If the two of you do not object, I would much rather turn back and walk to the parsonage as well. Darcy's countenance spoke of his objection to the scheme. The colonel ignored his younger cousin, preferring Elizabeth's warm smile as sufficient encouragement instead. Elizabeth was grateful for the addition to their party. Such an arrangement afforded a most convenient means of evading a topic she would rather not discuss with anyone save Jane. Of course she would prefer to be passionately in love with the gentleman who would one day be her husband. To know that manner of love that one truly ever feels but once in a lifetime. During their younger days, she and her sister would spend long hours talking about what it would be like to one day be carried away to live in a beautiful castle in a land far, far away, with each of their own handsome princes. But such was the very essence of fairy tales. Elizabeth herself was nearly one and twenty, and Jane even older. In some circles, both of them would be considered spinsters. Both young ladies were sensible enough to know their meeting with such happy endings as they fantasized would take more than a miracle. The prospect of marrying a gentleman whom she honoured and respected was certainly within Elizabeth's grasp. She was confident she would recognise it when she saw it, and she would not settle for anything less. The next day, when Elizabeth was returning to the parsonage with Mr. Darcy at her side, she sought to avoid any further discussion on those topics she had theretofore successfully avoided by speaking on matters of books and even the weather. Normally she would not have endeavoured so hard to eliminate the silence between them, but Mr. Darcy had been particularly quiet that day. Do you have plans to leave Kent very soon? Elizabeth inquired. I hope that is not your polite way of telling me that you have grown tired of my company. That is not for me to say. You are Lady Catherine's guest, and your cousin Anne's. Indeed. In truth, I would have returned to town long before now, if not for. Still unsure of how he might express his growing feelings for Elizabeth in a manner that would not give her false hope, Darcy held his tongue. If not for what, Mr. Darcy? It is not important. Pray, when do you plan to return to Hertfordshire? I will remain here for another month. After that, I shall spend time in town with my aunt and uncle Gardner. I suppose they are your relations in Cheapside, whom you spoke of before? Indeed, they are my relations in trade. You will recall how abhorred your aunt was when she learned of them. Do you share her sentiments? You will recall my telling you that my aunt and I are not always of the same mind. Then you do not find people who earn their living by trade to be wholly objectionable? Not as a rule, he replied. Darcy noticed a hint of scepticism in Elizabeth's countenance. Do you doubt me, Miss Elizabeth? Do you know anyone who earns a living in trade? A man in my position can hardly escape such associations. I suppose what I mean to say is, do you include anyone who earns a living in trade among your intimate circle? One of my best friends is the beneficiary of his family's fortune, which was earned in trade. I imagine it must be a rather large fortune. Indeed, it is quite considerable. What is your point? My point is simple. You boast of having a friend, nay a best friend, who happens to have inherited a fortune. I posit that were it not for said fortune, you and the gentleman would never have crossed paths. As neither of us can really know that, I will not defend what may or may not have been. Just as it had been the day before, so it happened again, that Elizabeth and Darcy, as involved in their own discourse as they were, did not notice that the colonel was quickly headed their way. 
We meet again, Colonel Fitzwilliam said, bowing before Elizabeth. Darcy said, I am accompanying Miss Bennet to the parsonage, as I generally do during this time of day. Following in step with Darcy and Elizabeth, the Colonel inquired, Shall we make it a threesome? Do we have a choice? Darcy asked, his brow arched. Miss Bennet, what say you? It sounds like a splendid idea to me, sir. There, you see, cousin, you are outnumbered two to one. With that, the three of them continued on their way. The colonel, as amiable as ever, commanded the greater share of the conversation, leaving Elizabeth with scant opportunity to do anything other than smile and nod at the appropriate times, and poor Mr. Darcy to brood and say nothing, while fiercely resisting the urge to tell his verbose cousin to go away. After the gentlemen had accompanied Elizabeth to the parsonage gate, they headed back to Rosings. The colonel asked the question that had been uppermost in his mind all afternoon. What on earth are you doing, old fellow? Darcy's countenance clouded. In what respect? If I did not know you better, I would say that you like Miss Bennet more than you dare let on. Whatever happened to the notion that she was not handsome enough to tempt you? No doubt my feelings have changed, Darcy replied. Is the young lady aware of your change of heart? That you more than tolerate her presence? Although Darcy had not officially apologised to Elizabeth for uttering those words, he had informed his cousin that the two of them had been overheard that evening at Rosings. Darcy wondered if he ought to be open with his cousin and tell him about his heartfelt struggles where Miss Elizabeth Bennet was concerned. Deciding against it for now, he said, I have done more than just give her the impression that I merely tolerate her. How so, if you do not mind my asking? If you must know, I have made it a habit to walk with her each day. She and I regularly engage in healthy discussions about our likes and dislikes. Other than reciting poetry verses to her, what more need I do? <laughs> you may very well engage in such discourse with Georgiana, or me, for that matter. A young woman needs to be flattered for her accomplishments, her wit, and her charm, in order for one to make a truly favourable impression on her heart. Oh, it is not so simple as you suggest, Darcy argued. A man in my position must be very guarded in his approach towards any young woman, especially one whose means are so decidedly beneath his own, else he might give rise to expectations in the woman that upon closer examination he cannot uphold. As a second son, you would know nothing at all of what I speak. I posit you should leave rank and privilege completely out of the equation where matters of the heart are concerned. If, on the other hand, you are merely trifling with Miss Bennet, it is far better you leave her alone. Darcy said nothing in response to his cousin's admonishment. Leave Elizabeth alone. I could not do so even if I tried. Then, too, there is Anne the colonel said, in view of his cousin's silence. Anne? Oh, I know you say you do not intend to marry her. You say that as though you somehow doubt my intentions, as though such a thing was ever within the realm of possibility. Is it not what our family expects? Was it not the favourite wish of your beloved mother, Lady Anne? Does Lady Catherine not cling to the notion of an alliance between you and her daughter? I do not deny having heard it said for the greater part of my life. What does it mean to me? Whatever were the motives which drove them, my mother and her only sister did their parts in planning the union. Its execution depends on others entirely. I am my own master. I answer to no one. That may very well be, but there is at least one other party whose feelings you ought to consider. I am confident you will agree. I take it you are speaking of Anne. Have you told her that you have no intention of honouring our family's wishes? Darcy shrugged. Not in so many words. I have no reason to do so. Anne is not so sheltered and so naive as to be incapable of discerning my intentions. He huffed. Why are we having this discussion? It all goes back to intentions, my friend. Be it your intentions towards our cousin or your intentions towards Miss Elizabeth Bennet. 
Chapter 8 Honour and Respect Darcy sat in a chair purposely situated by the window. Any semblance of a restful night's sleep having eluded him, he was surrounded by darkness, the bright full moon, his only source of light. Unable to avoid dwelling on the colonel's admonishing words, he was given to wonder what his cousin was about in speculating on his intentions towards Elizabeth. Does he even know me? Does he did not trifle with young ladies' affections? What he felt about Miss Elizabeth Bennet was something he had not experienced with any young woman, and his feelings were such that he wished to explore them further. The idea that she might indeed be the woman he chose as his bride had gone from being unthinkable to highly within the realm of possibility within the span of a few weeks. It was something that Darcy himself found hard to believe, and yet it had happened. All he wanted to do was spend time with her, alone. Of all people, his cousin Colonel Fitzwilliam was making such a prospect more and more difficult. Never had he and his cousin been in company with any woman of any age or marital status where he did not earn the greater share of the woman's approbation, even though his cousin was by far the more comfortable in such situations. He owed it to his wealth and status, inherent in being the eldest son, whereas his cousin was a second son, albeit the second son of an earl, but a second son nonetheless. He was also not unaware that the colonel had a habit of spending time walking with Elizabeth too. Not that it bothered him so much. Colonel Fitzwilliam would have to marry a wealthy woman in order to maintain the manner of living that he so thoroughly enjoyed. On the other hand, Elizabeth obviously liked him. Honour and respect. Certainly those affections evinced themselves whenever the two of them were in company as well. It dawned on Darcy that it would be better for everyone if his cousin took his leave of Kent. Besides, as an officer, Fitzwilliam had obligations that did not allow him to remain at Rosings at leisure. Darcy, on the other hand, had all the time in the world to spend in Kent, getting better acquainted with the young woman who was compelling him to rethink everything he thought he knew about himself. Thus resolved, Darcy knew exactly how to act. When the morning comes, I will do what I have to do to start setting things right, he considered as he rose from his seat and drifted to his bed to capture whatever bit of rest he could during the night's remaining hours. Elizabeth awakened earlier than usual that morning. Having practised most every day since first being introduced to Lady Catherine and her noble relations, Elizabeth decided she would not be doing so on that particular day. She missed the pleasure of long solitary rambles. The early morning sounds of birds chirping on the tree branches high above, the magnificent view of the rising sun, and the gentle caress of the crisp morning air encouraged Elizabeth to walk longer than she had been wont to do since her arrival, and hence she walked farther away even beyond the beautiful lanes of Rosings Park. She had brought several letters from home with her, in case she might wish to read them at leisure if she came upon the perfect idyllic spot. Uppermost in her mind were thoughts of the two gentlemen to whom she was growing accustomed to seeing. How much alike they were on one hand, and how different they were on the other. She wandered along for several hours, her thoughts giving way to every variety of diversion, reassessing events, determining possibilities, and reconciling herself as well as she could to all that had taken place since her arrival in that part of the country. At length, fatigue and a recollection of her long absence made her return to the parsonage. She was immediately told upon entering the house that the two gentlemen from Rosings had each called while she was away. The colonel stayed for only a few minutes before taking his leave, but Mr. Darcy had been sitting with them at least a half hour, hoping for her return, and almost resolved to walk after her till she could be found. Elizabeth could but just feign concern in missing the former. Colonel Fitzwilliam was no longer an object of her interest owing to his candid admission that only a woman of means stood a chance of becoming his wife. Neither was Mr. Darcy an object when Elizabeth bothered herself to think about it, 
even if he had spent a prodigious amount of time attending her. His declaration that he was not engaged to marry his cousin, as well as his avowal of desiring a love match aside, Elizabeth was sure he was very likely to fall in love with a wealthy young heiress, as men of his ilk were wont to do. Charlotte's supposition that Mr. Darcy was in love with Elizabeth came to her mind. As always, she quickly banished the thought as soon as it was formed. Oh, if such a thing were true, would I not know it? Elizabeth was wont to respond. Upon finding herself alone later that day, she threw one more reflective glance over her acquaintance with Lady Catherine's nephews. Indeed, I surely do not intend to regret either of the gentlemen's absence one bit. Half resolved, half uncertain of how she truly felt, Elizabeth diverted her attention to those matters that were fully within her control. Responding to her eldest sister's latest missive was her highest priority, and when she could, Elizabeth sat at Charlotte's desk and took up her letter writing. My dearest Jane, earlier today I came back from a lengthy walk to learn that the size of any future gatherings at Rosings will be diminished considerably, for Lady Catherine de Bourgh's nephews have taken their leave of Kent. Though I was hesitant in confessing this to Charlotte, I suppose I shall miss both of the gentlemen's company. Is there any wonder that I feel this way? I found in the two of them all the best embodiments of Lieutenant Wickham. I am sure that I wrote before that all of the previously mentioned gentlemen hail from Derbyshire, and that Mr. Darcy and Wickham were reared together at Pemberley. It is a shame that whatever took place between the two of them was the means of ruining their friendship, perhaps forever. I am only grateful that the former and I established a truce in his war to poison my mind against the latter, a campaign he undoubtedly waged successfully with others of his acquaintance. Otherwise, my earlier ill opinion of Mr. Darcy would have remained fixed forever. Instead, I can honestly confess to you, if no one else, that my feelings for Mr. Darcy have undergone a decided change for the better. That said, regretting his leave-taking is not in my nature, and rather than dwell on the possibility that I likely will never see him again, any remembrances I have of making his acquaintance and getting to know him so well as I did, I shall endure with a fond heart and a warm smile. Elizabeth went on to tell her sister of how poorly Mr. Collins had taken the news of the removal of such illustrious new acquaintances from Kent, and what it must mean to his noble patroness, Lady Catherine, to suffer such a loss. She was also able to report that he had hastened to Rosings to console Lady Catherine and her daughter, and on his return he brought back, with great satisfaction, a message from her ladyship conveying her desire to have the Hunsford party dine with her to make up for the departure of her nephews. Elizabeth did not know how to feel about the possibility of spending time in Lady Catherine's home under such circumstances. Long hours of haughty pontifications, thinly disguised condescension, and unrestrained impertinence no doubt would be regular companions for the next month or so, before it was time for Elizabeth to take her own leave and return to town. By the by, the idea of her sister Jane being at the gardener's home when she arrived had been raised, and now the plan was set. Suffering the company of Lady Catherine and Mr. Collins for a while longer was nothing in comparison to the joy that awaited Elizabeth upon her return to London. And if she and her eldest sister should happen to cross paths with a particular gentleman and the friend that he had talked about a time or two, then so much the better. Chapter 9. Speak the Truth That particular morning, Elizabeth arrived at Rosings later than she was wont to do. She fretted all the way there, supposing that she might be obliged to seek out the lady of the house, whom Elizabeth by now was aware was a late riser, to console her yet again on the removal of her nephews from Kent. The closer she drew to the East Library, the more her curiosity grew. The music ringing throughout the halls was as beautiful as anything she had ever heard her whole life. But who could it be? Lady Catherine? Mr. Burke? No, it must be Miss Jenkinson, Elizabeth supposed. By Lady Catherine's own admission, 
neither she nor her daughter could boast of such proficiency, and as Elizabeth had never heard the elderly companion play, and there was no one else to think of, then it must be her. Elizabeth slowly opened the door. What on earth is Mr. Darcy doing here? What is more, who is the fair-haired young creature who holds him enthralled? Her curiosity simply would not be repressed. Elizabeth walked in the room, and the young woman responsible for the beautiful sounds that guided Elizabeth's tentative footsteps down the long corridor immediately ceased playing. She sprang from the bench and rushed to where Elizabeth stood. She curtsied a little. You must be Miss Bennet. Elizabeth was taken aback by the eager manner of the young woman's greeting. She looked at Mr. Darcy, her confusion on full display. Darcy walked to where the two ladies stood. Miss Bennet, allow me to introduce my sister, Miss Georgiana Darcy. Elizabeth curtsied. Miss Darcy, it is such a pleasure to meet you. The pleasure is all mine, Miss Bennet. My brother spoke so fondly of you when he came back to town that I insisted that he allow me to accompany him upon his return to Kent. Pray you do not mind. I simply had to meet you for myself. It is not my place to object, and with such a warm reception as this, I would not dare. When she could, Elizabeth tossed Mr. Darcy a questioning look. What specifically had he told his sister about her to encourage so much enthusiasm? Pray you will forgive me for infringing on your practice time. I thought I might distract my brother while we waited for you to arrive this morning. I am not the least bit infringed upon, Miss Darcy, Elizabeth said in genuine sincerity. Your reputation of being a truly accomplished young woman precedes you, and I must say there is no wonder your family is so proud of your talent. You play so beautifully. A hint of colour overspread Miss Darcy's countenance. You are very kind, Miss Bennet. I only speak the truth. I should be delighted if you would accompany me. That is, assuming it is no inconvenience to you and your brother. Although I must warn you that my talents are extremely wanting by comparison. Brother, the young woman said, looking at her brother pleadingly, yet willing to defer to his wishes. Elizabeth strongly suspected that Mr. Darcy would not deny his young sister anything that was in his power to bestow. That sounds like an excellent plan. His eyes locked with Elizabeth's. Thank you, he said, smiling. I suspect I am the one who ought to be thanking you, sir. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours, Miss Bennet. If you give me leave, I should like to take care of another matter. I shall come back in time to escort you to the parsonage. Bowing slightly, Darcy quit the room, leaving Elizabeth and Georgiana to their own devices. What say you, Miss Darcy? Shall we press on? Elizabeth asked, flexing her fingers to calm herself a bit after seeing Mr. Darcy again, and so unexpectedly. With that, the two new acquaintances commenced poring over the music sheets in search of an appropriate piece. Just as he had promised, Darcy returned to the East Library in time to escort Elizabeth to the parsonage. When he could, he said, I trust you have been enjoying your visit while I have been away. Indeed, sir. I must apologize for the haste of my leave-taking. I would have written to explain my actions. However, in view of our circumstances, such a thing would have been entirely inappropriate. You owe me no explanations regarding your comings and goings. But I fear my ears are deceiving me. Did you honestly utter the words, I must apologize? I am sorry to have left without saying goodbye, or informing you of my intention to come back to Kent when my business in town was done. Do you think me so unfeeling? I am afraid I do not know what to think. I was given to believe that expressing remorse went against your character. Darcy stopped walking. Elizabeth did likewise. They turned to face each other. Are you referring to our earlier conversation when you spoke of overhearing my cousin and me? Did I not say that I would take those words back if I could? Is that your idea of an apology, sir? Without ceremony, Darcy took Elizabeth's hand in his and lowered himself to one knee. I humbly apologize for wounding you with my ill-spoken words. The truth is, 
that I have long considered you the handsomest woman of my acquaintance. He raised her hand to his lips and bestowed a tender kiss. Does that satisfy? The fluttering in her stomach and the pounding of her heartbeat aside, Elizabeth did not know whether the gentleman was serious or simply enjoying a bit of fun at her expense. If it were the latter, she had never seen this side of him. She quickly looked about their surroundings, concerned that there was someone about who might bear witness to this display and possibly misinterpret what was taking place between the two of them. Yes, yes, you have made your point. Now I beg of you to return to your feet at once. Standing, he slowly let go of her hand. He tucked his own hands behind his back. Elizabeth did likewise, and the two of them resumed their walk. Darcy said, What I said just now is true. You are the handsomest woman of my acquaintance. I have a great deal of admiration for you. You must know what I am saying to be true. Upon hearing Mr. Darcy's pronouncement, Elizabeth felt her heartbeat pick up its pace. She did not know how to think or feel. Was the gentleman about to say what she thought? She did not dare to chance it. Meeting your sister was a welcome surprise, she said, endeavouring to change the subject. I am very pleased to hear you say that, Miss Elizabeth. I had high hopes that the two of you would get along. Oh? Indeed. Georgiana, you see, is very shy, and she does not often have a chance to be with young ladies who are close to her in age. Upon first meeting the young woman, Elizabeth would never have accused her of being shy. However, once her brother quit the room, her spirits were rather less animated. Elizabeth attributed it to her dedication when playing the pianoforte. Your sister is one of the most gifted young women I have ever met. Her performance on the pianoforte is nothing short of masterful. I am given to wonder if you brought her here solely to demonstrate to me how a truly accomplished young lady ought to play. No, not at all. In case you are unaware, I rather enjoy listening to you exhibit. I could spend hours watching you, listening to you, and I would not complain. Mr. Darcy, to what do I owe all this approbation? Do I have to say it aloud, Miss Bennet? I came back to Kent solely for the purpose of seeing you. I dare not say more now, but when the moment is right, I shall. I promise, he added. For now, I want to thank you for your kindness to my sister. I can see that she likes you very much, which is of vital importance to me. Indeed, Darcy had given the matter a great deal of thought while he was away. He could no longer deny that he had fallen in love with Elizabeth. Certainly there would be strong objections to such an unequal alliance. Such a union would do nothing to elevate his standing among society. However, if his cousin Colonel Fitzwilliam and his sister Georgiana approved of a possible alliance between him and Elizabeth, what did it matter what others thought? The Colonel and his sister were the most important people in the world to him. Soon, if things progressed as he hoped they would, Elizabeth would earn such a distinction in his life too. In truth, his purposes in bringing his sister back with him were twofold. To introduce Elizabeth to Georgiana, thinking both women could benefit from each other's company very much, and to regulate his own behaviour around Elizabeth, a gentleman's daughter, and to court her properly, again, if matters progressed, as he hoped they would. Once inside the house, Elizabeth exhaled deeply. At length, her heartbeat slowed, and her quivering stomach settled. The things Mr. Darcy's nearness did to her left her utterly bewildered. To add to all his other admirable qualities, he smelled better than any gentleman of her acquaintance. He had a way of confounding Elizabeth's sensibilities like no other gentleman before, invoking inexplicable urges with the sound of his voice and the look in his eyes. Elizabeth shook her head. I must teach myself not to think of Mr. Darcy in this way, else I shall go entirely distracted. Eliza, Charlotte said, looking at her friend still standing there in the hallway with her head pressed against the door, long after she had walked into the house. Elizabeth jumped. Charlotte! Pardon me for startling you, but do my eyes deceive me, or was that Mr. Darcy whom I saw escorting you to the parsonage gate? 
She shook her head. Indeed, he arrived at Rosings late yesterday. He brought his sister, Miss Darcy, with him, Elizabeth quickly added. Did he? Charlotte inquired with a suggestive smile. Elizabeth held up her hand. Whatever you are thinking, Charlotte, I am certain you are mistaken. Be that as it may, dear Eliza, Charlotte said knowingly, for I am not one to say I told you so. Chapter 10 First and Foremost Lady Catherine ambled into the East Library in time to enjoy hearing Elizabeth and Georgiana performing a lovely duet. Darcy was standing in an advantageous spot that afforded him a good view of both young ladies. I confess you have made significant strides in your ability to play since my niece has been accompanying you, Miss Bennet, said her ladyship. She looked at Darcy. It was very clever of you to bring your sister here, nephew. Darcy did not know where to look or how to look in response to his aunt's tactlessness. Georgiana, on the other hand, was clearly made uncomfortable, and she threw an apologetic glance at Elizabeth. Elizabeth bestowed a hint of a smile for the younger woman's benefit, intending to assure her that no such remorse was required. Perhaps I will one day become as proficient as those twice my rank, she then remarked. This being exactly the sort of response he had taught himself to expect on Elizabeth's part, Darcy smiled in spite of himself. Lady Catherine was far from amused. I can see your presence in my niece's company has done nothing at all to temper your impertinence, young woman. No doubt you would benefit greatly from additional time here in Kent, though I suppose your mother would miss you terribly, as I shall surely miss my Anne when a certain blessed occasion takes place. Here her ladyship looked at her nephew pointedly. Georgiana shifted a little in her seat. I cannot know my mother's sentiments on the matter. However, my father has already written to me of his eagerness for my return to Longbourn. Darcy said, I was under the impression that you meant to spend time in town after leaving Huntsford. Actually, he blurted this out. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> that is to say, have your plans changed in that regard? If Elizabeth did not know better, she would have flattered herself into believing that more than a little disappointment peppered Mr. Darcy's speech. Perhaps she would ask him about it later that afternoon when the two of them were alone. That was assuming they would have a few moments to themselves. Do I dare allow myself to wish for such a thing? She imagined some liberty in that regard was warranted. They were spending a prodigious amount of time in each other's company of late. Even if nothing were to become of their time together, she knew she would never forget what it was like being acquainted with such a man. Now, whenever Darcy and Elizabeth reached the gate of the parsonage, she found herself wishing their time together was not about to end. This strange, unfamiliar longing was puzzling. Were she to speak with her friend Charlotte, Elizabeth had little doubt what the older, married woman would say. Elizabeth would not allow it to be so. As flattered as she was to be the object of so much of his attention, she was not falling in love with Mr. Darcy. Whatever were the fanciful imaginings of her heart, Elizabeth would not allow her voice of reason to be so easily silenced. She would not allow herself to fall in love with Mr. Darcy, for she knew to whom his ultimate loyalty belonged, even if he did not. His noble family. Lady Catherine's opinion of Elizabeth was a mixture of half-admiration, half-circumspect. She liked to suppose the impertinent young woman was far too sensible to aspire to a station in life beyond her sphere, even if she was a gentleman's daughter. There were gentlemen and there were gentlemen, after all, and not all of them were to be regarded as equals. The circumstances of his birth were the ultimate decider, even more important than the extent of his wealth. However, more and more she was seeing evidence that young people were beginning to lose sight of such distinctions. She was determined that no one in her family would forget what it meant to be born into such a noble family as hers. Growing increasingly concerned over her nephew's attentions to Miss Elizabeth Bennet, Lady Catherine decided the time had come to take matters into her own hands in bringing an end to Darcy's trifling infatuation. Mr. Collins, she said later that same day, 
I understand that George Wickham is a member of the militia that encamped near Meryton earlier this year. What can you tell me about how that gentleman comported himself at the time? More importantly, what precisely is the nature of his acquaintance with the Bennets of Longbourn? First and foremost, Lady Catherine, I feel it is vitally incumbent upon me to express a sense of deep regret that my cousin even made mention of his name in your presence. I wish to assure you that gentleman is no friend of mine, or of my devoted wife or her family, Sir William and Lady Lucas. Yes, but your wife did agree with your cousin that Mr. Wickham made a favourable impression on the people in Meryton. I must assume that includes her family as well. But that is beside the point. Tell me more of that gentleman's acquaintance with the Bennets, for that is the purpose of my insisting upon a private audience with you. Bear in mind that no one beyond this room is to know what the two of us have discussed. No one, not even Mrs. Collins. Indeed, your ladyship, I am quite honoured to be of service to you in any manner you deem fit. You can be assured that I, as your humble and abidingly loyal servant, do not dare violate any confidences between the two of us. Well, go on, Lady Catherine demanded, banging her bejeweled walking stick on the thick carpet. Tell me what I need to know. It pains me to say this, as I had only recently made the Bennet family's acquaintance myself at the time, but the manner in which the entire family embraced Mr. Wickham so soon after he arrived in the environs displayed an appalling lack of judgment and proper attention to decorum. Pray go on, said Lady Catherine, leaning in. Indeed. Whereas I sensed an unwillingness on the family's part to afford me the manner of deference owed to me as a man of God, the future heir of Longbourn, as well as a member of their own family, Mr. Wickham was showered with approbation by Mr. Bennet, Mrs. Bennet, and all of their daughters. Begging your pardon, your ladyship, but the eldest Bennet daughter I must exclude from this, for she is the epitome of grace and all that is proper. Now that I am obliged to recall events as they truly unfolded, the third eldest daughter is quite a sensible young woman as well. Here Mr. Collins cleared his throat, no doubt in response to her ladyship's increasingly aggrieved expression. <clears throat> about Mr. Wickham, that gentleman continued to be the beneficiary of the Bennet family's highest esteem, even after that unfortunate business with the young lady in Meryton, whose grandfather's death provided the means of her garnering Mr. Wickham's attentions when she inherited ten thousand pounds. From what I am told by those with whom I correspond, the Bennet family embraced him right up until he finally took his leave of Meryton when the militia decamped and went away to Brighton. Lady Catherine pursed her lips. So it appears the gentleman would be mercenary. But of course he would. Those of his ilk generally are. She ceased speaking for a moment or two, preferring silent deliberation instead. She could make something of this intelligence. At length, she said, Regarding the Bennet daughters, would you say that Mr. Wickham was a favourite of all of them? I recall an occasion shortly after my arrival in Hertfordshire, on which that gentleman and I were guests in the home of Mrs. Bennet's sister, uh, Mrs. Phillips. I had the opportunity to remark on the furnishings and the size of the room, and I flattered her by saying I almost supposed myself in the small summer breakfast parlour at Rosings. Her patience waning, Lady Catherine said, Pray answer my question. Indeed, uh, that evening was when I had the opportunity to witness the total impropriety exercised by my cousins in anticipation of seeing Mr. Wickham, and to observe the stratagems they employed to garner the greater share of his attentions. Her ladyship went silent once more. After a moment she said, Again you say the militia went away to Brighton. Indeed. I have heard it said that the occasion particularly saddened the Bennet daughters. I also recall you saying some time ago that Mr. Bennet's youngest daughter also went away to Brighton. 
Yes, Miss Lydia, although I cannot imagine what my cousin Mr. Bennet was thinking in allowing his daughter to escape the confines of proper parental supervision. What can you tell me about Miss Lydia Bennet? One might best describe her as having little education and mean understanding. In my humble opinion, she was brought out much too soon, no doubt as a consequence of being her mother's favourite. She is untamed, unabashed, and what with her wild spirit, she is bound to make herself ridiculous wherever she goes, and in so doing possibly bring great shame on her family. Lady Catherine, having taken in all she needed to hear, dismissed Mr. Collins unceremoniously. Armed with such a fascinating account, the determined aristocrat now knew exactly how to act. Chapter 11 His Innermost Thoughts Brighton, England George Wickham halted his hurried steps to admire his reflection in the shop window. Removing his hat, he brushed his long fingers through his hair. How handsome he supposed himself donning his regimentals, even though he knew that soon enough he would have no such need of his uniform. While putting his hat on again, Wickham could not help but congratulate himself as he entertained happy thoughts on his recent change in luck specifically the windfall that had practically fallen into his lap. How fortunate it was for him that the only thing that had been asked of him was to sully the reputation of a young woman. Even better was the fact that the girl was the youngest sister of the one woman in the world who might truly have meant something to him. Miss Elizabeth Bennet of Longbourn Village in Hertfordshire. The notion of everything he had given up all those months ago was never far from his innermost thoughts. If only I had not lost sight of my aching desire to claim Elizabeth as my own by abruptly pursuing Mary King. He threw a reflective glance over the hours he had spent on that failed courtship. Oh, what a waste of time, not to mention the deprivation wrought on all the young ladies longing for my favours. In hindsight, he knew he would not have changed a thing. Ah, that young woman's recent inheritance of ten thousand pounds in combination with the manner in which she threw herself in my path was simply too powerful a temptation to resist. In the end, his efforts had been for naught, for she was forced to move to Liverpool to live with her uncle, thereby thwarting Wickham's chances of controlling her fortune by marrying her. Wickham gleefully contemplated the sizable fortune that had recently found its way to him. It was far less than Mary King's inheritance, but it served his needs quite adequately. He could finally make something of himself and live in a manner more befitting the life he was meant to live. Puffing out his chest, he grinned all over. Where was it that I read that lightning does not strike twice in the same place? What a bright future awaited him. First things first, he reminded himself, for I must persuade that silly Bennet girl to run away with me. Once I have sufficiently ruined her, I shall abandon her by the wayside. Then I shall place myself in the path of a young heiress who is truly worthy of my attention, preferably one with a light and pleasing figure, a healthy measure of wit and charm, and the most amazing dark eyes one has ever seen. The very thought of Elizabeth sent a surge of desire coursing through his body, and a bounce in his step as he quickened his pace on the way to his clandestine meeting with her youngest sister. Finding the wild young lady eagerly waiting for him in the appointed place, he hurriedly stole away with her, under the guise of escorting her back to the Foster's home. The desire to satiate his yearning for her older sister fueled his longing, and in no time at all the silly girl was in his arms. Young Lydia Bennet twisted her head to the side, purposely evading the intended brush of his lips against hers. What an unabashed flirt this one is, Wickham considered. Never before had he encountered a girl as wild as this one, 
so eager to flaunt her feminine wiles before every man who gave her the slightest bit of attention, and so deft at working him into such a frenzy of unrequited lust. The dark-haired minx had a body that belied her tender age of sixteen, and his desire to have his way with her was immeasurable. It is just the two of us, Lydia. You promised me tonight would be the night. I chose this spot, especially for this moment, knowing that no one would find us here. I, I think I have changed my mind. What are you saying? Wickham asked, refusing to release her from his embrace, despite her feeble attempts to pull away. A girl must always reserve the liberty of changing her mind. Indeed, I have been giving this matter quite a bit of thought, and I have decided I ought to wait until after we are married. I know very well that none of my sisters have any real prospects, and thus I shall be the first to be married. Tired of her excuses, he covered her mouth with his, with great passion. A soft moan escaped her, then another. At length she tore her swollen lips away. You do intend to marry me, do you not? Wickham blew a frustrated breath deep down inside. Oh, does this silly little chit ever think of anything else? Oh, as though I would ever settle for someone as uncouth as her. Think of the money, he reminded himself. Think of Elizabeth. Oh, Lydia, my dear, he gently pleaded. Allow me to do with you what I will tonight, what you and I have been longing to do for days. And I shall carry you off to Scotland tomorrow, and we will be married in Gretna Green, he urged, positioning her against the wall slowly lifting her skirt to receive him. His words made her wiggle in delight. Oh, Wickham, do you promise? I should like nothing more than to be married before my sisters. You shall have your wish, my dear, tomorrow. Tonight I must have mine. Covering her mouth with his once again to silence her girlish exultations, he commenced satisfying his urgent desire. At length, Lydia's inhalations intermingled with Wickham's deep exhalations. Holding nothing back, he congratulated himself on the ease of his conquest. <laughs> what did it matter to him if there were consequences? He prided himself on doing nothing by halves. Besides, he would be rid of her long before such evidence manifested itself. Soon enough, Lydia Bennet will be someone else's problem. Chapter 12 Time and Distance Walking along the path, reading her favourite book, Elizabeth was pleasantly surprised upon looking up to see Mr. Darcy heading in her direction. She marked her place in her book, closed it shut, and waited for him. I did not expect to see you this morning, Mr. Darcy, she said, curtsying, when he reached her. He bowed. Miss Elizabeth. When I went to see you in the East Library and did not find you there, I grew worried. Clutching her book in both hands before her, she said, I am sorry to have given you cause for concern. I decided to stay away today. I feel my continuing presence may be somewhat of a distraction for certain members of your family. Did my sister say anything that might make you feel that way? Darcy asked in dismay. No, your sister is delightful. I like her very much. Elizabeth really did enjoy spending time with Miss Darcy. The young lady's sweet temperament, in combination with her fair skin, golden hair, and angelic countenance, reminded Elizabeth so much of Jane. A look of relief spread over the gentleman's countenance. Oh, you cannot know how pleased I am that the two of you are getting along. Sir, at the risk of sounding impertinent, may I ask you why it is so important to you that Miss Darcy and I get along? Do you really have to ask, Miss Elizabeth? I would like to think you and I have become close friends. Now you must tell me at once which one of my family members has given you cause for uneasiness at Rosings. I was given to believe that you considered my aunt reasonably tolerable, albeit a bit overbearing at times. You have always risen to whatever challenge she has endeavoured to lay before you. <laughs> it is but one of the things I admire about you. Elizabeth smiled a little. You are correct, sir. I have been able to tolerate your aunt fairly well. Then who is it? Is it my cousin Anne? 
Well, you will concede that she barely acknowledges that I even exist. She has scarcely spoken five words to me during the entire duration of my visit. I fear she does not like me, and, well, Rosings is her home, as well as Lady Catherine's. It is true that Anne appears very reticent at times, but I assure you she comports herself in a similar manner with most everyone, which includes members of our own family. I fear Anne rarely shows her true feelings to anyone. How often have you observed the two of us talking when we are together? That is to say, Anne and me. You make a fine point, and one I dare not argue, except to say she comes across as being very cordial towards Georgiana, almost solicitous. Yesterday, for instance, she came into the library while Georgiana and I were practising a duet, and she simply would not be satisfied until she had successfully managed to lure your sister away. Not that I am complaining, for I am certain she was eager to spend time with a cousin she has not seen in a long while, but Anne did not breathe a word to me. Can you wonder why I might perceive my near-constant presence in her home as an inconvenience? I am sorry my cousin's behaviour gave you cause to feel unwelcome at Rosings. I shall speak with her immediately upon my return. No, I pray you will not. I see no need to introduce undue strife where it is not needed. Besides, I do not plan to be in Kent much longer. It is very likely that Anne and I may never cross paths again once I am away. There is no need to bring attention to a problem that will soon be cleared up by time and distance. If you wish for me to let this matter rest for now, then I will. But I cannot agree wholeheartedly that you and my cousin may likely never cross paths again. I truly believe the chances are greater that you will indeed meet after you have left the Collinses. Ah, oh, yes, I suppose you are correct. I do not imagine my cousin will give up the living of his own accord, and with that being the case, I shall have many other opportunities to visit my friend Charlotte. God willing, the Collinses will remain at Hunsford for many, many years to come, Elizabeth thought, but did not say out loud, for the alternative was in every way unthinkable owing to that ridiculous entail on her family's estate. Darcy had reasons of his own for thinking as he did. Indeed, he responded tentatively. If things progressed as he hoped, the next time Elizabeth might well be a guest at Rosings, sharing his bed. Not wanting to get ahead of himself, he said, In the interim, I had planned to spend much of this fine day watching you practice. I shall be very disappointed not to enjoy my share of your company today. May I accompany you on your walk? I should be delighted to have your company. Their minds made up, the two set out accordingly. After walking several miles in a leisurely manner, talking easily about Mr. Darcy's home in Derbyshire and giving little thought to the passage of time, they found at last on examining their watches that it was time for Elizabeth to be at the parsonage. As was his wont to do, Darcy walked with her and took his leave at the gate. Lady Catherine did not oppose Elizabeth directly. Neither had she confronted Darcy about the young woman. Her nephew was much too sensible to contemplate anything beyond a mere dalliance with someone so beneath him in consequence. She comforted herself with the notion that men will, after all, be men. Soon her nephew would realise that anything beyond a meaningless flirtation with that impertinent young woman was an impossibility, else he would face the scorn of his friends, his family, and his peers. My nephew would not dare put his reputation in jeopardy. No longer willing to risk anything where Miss Elizabeth Bennet's motives were concerned, her ladyship had taken matters into her own hands to see to it that she and her family would meet with the derision of every decent family in England. Simply sending her away from Kent would have been a less costly solution, but she could not make certain that the young woman would not throw herself into Darcy's path once she was once again in town and beyond Lady Catherine's reach. It was not in her ladyship's nature not to prepare for every possible impediment to the successful execution of all her wishes, and she resolved that her solution was the best one for everyone who was in any way connected with her. By now, her scheme was well underway, were she to rely upon the confirmation from her sources. 
There was nothing or no one capable of stopping events from progressing to a conclusion Lady Catherine deemed satisfactory. Forcing her nephew to do what she expected of him by marrying Anne was another matter entirely. Lady Catherine and Darcy sat across from each other in the drawing room, their conversation long overdue. You can be at no loss, nephew, to understand the reason I have summoned you today for a private audience. Your own heart, your own sense of right and wrong, must tell you why. Lady Catherine, if you mean to berate me for not making an offer of marriage to Anne, then you are wasting your time and mine. Darcy, you know as well as anyone that it was the favourite wish of your mother's, as well as mine, that you and Anne would one day be married. We planned a union while the two of you were in your cradles. Everyone in our family desires this union, the combining of two of the grandest estates in all of England. Everyone in our family expects it. Not everyone, Darcy said under his breath. Her ladyship leaned in closer. What is it that you say, nephew? I said not everyone desires or expects such a union. Who would dare oppose me in this? If you would take the time to consult your daughter on the matter, then surely you would know that Anne does not want this. Silence! You speak nonsense! My Anne is a good daughter. She is loyal to her family. She will do whatever I tell her to do. With that, Lady Catherine rose from her seat in a manner befitting a queen arising from her throne and crossed the room as quickly as a woman of her age could manage. After pulling the bell to summon a servant, she slowly spun about on her heels and faced her nephew with a broad smile of self-satisfaction. What are you about, Lady Catherine? You shall know soon enough. Moments later, a servant walked into the room. Lady Catherine said, Pray find my daughter, Miss de Berg, and inform her that I desire her presence in the drawing room post-haste. The servant bowed and quickly escaped the room. Lady Catherine sauntered over to the ornately adorned mantelpiece. I fail to see the point in sending for Anne, Darcy stated. My purpose is perfectly straightforward. You posit that my daughter does not desire this union, and I strongly contend that she does. The time has come for Anne to have her own share of the conversation. If what you say is true, then I will know precisely how to act. Does that mean that you will desist with this preposterous notion that Anne and I will marry each other? With a confident air, Lady Catherine replied, I only say this. Let us wait and hear what my daughter has to say. Mrs. Jenkinson and Anne were together in the garden when the servant arrived. The former had just finished arranging Mr. Berg's footstool and had begun arranging a soft blanket across the younger woman's lap despite the pleasant weather that day. She did not want to chance Anne's catching a chill. How she doted on Anne, and what great satisfaction she derived in so doing. Pardon me, Mr. Berg, the tall, lanky man uttered. Mrs. Jenkinson ceased fussing with the blanket. Speaking in Anne's stead, she asked, What is it, Mr. Thomas? Lady Catherine has requested Mr. Berg's presence in the drawing room. The elderly woman peered affectionately at Anne, whose countenance now showed a peculiar shade of dismay. Do you have any idea what her ladyship wants? I can't say that I do, he humbly replied. However, Lady Catherine is not alone, he offered. Her brow arched, Mrs. Jenkinson asked. Who is with her? Her ladyship's nephew, Mr. Darcy, is also present in the drawing room. Very well, she said effectively dismissing the footman. When they were alone, Anne said, If my mother wants to see me, and she is with my cousin Darcy, then there is no doubt of the reason for her summons. She took a series of calming breaths. Oh, Mrs. Jenkinson, what am I to do? I have but one of two choices, either of which will lead to disappointment for one of the two people in the world who mean the most to me. Casting the blanket aside, Anne rose from her seat and drifted towards a small pond. I feel my situation is hopeless. Miss Anne, my dear, you and I have discussed this matter at length, have we not? Anne nodded. 
Indeed we have. I have always known this day would come, but that does not make the prospect less daunting. Mrs. Jenkinson went to Anne and took her by the hand. She gave it a gentle squeeze. I shall be happy to accompany you if you think it will help make things easier. Oh, I am certain that you being there will be a great deal of comfort to me. You know how much I depend on you. Indeed. Now let us go to the drawing room. You know how Lady Catherine does not like to be kept waiting. Anne hesitated a bit, as though she was not quite ready to face her relations. In seeing this, the caring companion placed her arm about the younger woman's waist and commenced gently coaxing her along. Come, Miss Anne, you must not be afraid to speak your mind. The time to do so is long overdue. After waiting quietly for what seemed like an hour, but was actually no longer than fifteen minutes, judging by the ticking clock, the only sound in the room, Darcy sighed in relief when Anne and her companion walked into the room. Mother, Anne said in a voice barely above a whisper, you wanted to see me? Indeed I do. Mrs. Jenkinson, I am pleased that you attended my daughter as well. The more witnesses there are to my daughter's testimony, the better for everyone concerned. The elderly companion smiled in acknowledgement of her welcome and chose a seat by the wall, away from the others. Might I suggest we all have a seat? Lady Catherine said, silently directing her daughter to sit next to her cousin on the sofa. At length, her ladyship said, Anne, your cousin has informed me that you have no wish for a union with him, that the favourite wish of your dearly departed aunt, Lady Anne, whose name you were christened with, means nothing to you. Is that true? Anne turned and studied Darcy's expression, but only for a second or two before diverting her eyes away. Biting her lower lip, she said, No, mother. Speak up, my child. Is it true that you do not desire this union? In a clearer voice, Anne said, No, mother, it is not true. Anne, Darcy said, in a tone that belied the true extent of his astonishment. Before Anne could fashion her next response, her mother said, Let us all be rightfully clear. Do you wish to marry your cousin Darcy or not? Anne nodded. I do. Her voice trembling, she replied, I do wish to marry my cousin. I wish it with all my heart. Chapter 13 Assumed Tranquility The joy on Lady Catherine's face was nothing in comparison to the abhorrence on Darcy's. He could not believe what he had just heard his cousin say. He would not believe it. His mouth was still agape when Lady Catherine rose from her seat. There you have it, nephew. It is precisely as I told you. Now, if you will pardon me, I will take my leave of the two of you so that you can discuss this matter. A discussion that is long overdue, if you ask me. She turned and faced Anne's companion. Come along, Mrs. Jenkinson. I believe this assignation warrants a measure of privacy. By the time Darcy and Anne were alone, he was pacing the floor. His complexion was pale with anger, and the disturbance of his mind was visible in every feature. He was struggling for the appearance of composure, and would not open his lips until he believed himself to have attained it. When he had finally collected himself to discuss the matter with a measure of civility, he approached his cousin in quick steps. Anne, what is the meaning of this? What on earth were you thinking in saying all those things to Lady Catherine? She shrugged. In a voice barely above a whisper, she said, Cousin, I am dreadfully sorry if what I said has caused you pain. It was not my intention to do so. What you said to your mother cannot be true. Did Lady Catherine force you to say that you desire a union between us? Is that why you spoke as you did, out of fear of your mother's disapprobation? Again, I am sorry if what I said caused you any pain. Growing impatient with his cousin's parroted response, he said, Pray answer the question. Folding her hands in her lap, Anne said, I believe I already responded to the question, more than once, if you will recall when my mother asked me. However, as you seem to have a difficult time comprehending my reply, 
I shall state it again. She looked at Darcy squarely in his eyes. Yes, I desire this union. I do not believe a word of this. It is impossible that you feel this way. Lady Catherine put you up to this. Admit it to me, and allow me to deal with the consequences of your mother's disappointed hopes. You need not face her at all. Anne glared at Darcy. Why is it impossible, cousin? Do you suppose that because you are oblivious to my feelings for you, they simply do not exist? His mouth fell open. You have feelings for me? You have never spoken of any such sentiments previously. You have given me no hint, shown no symptoms of affection. Why did you not tell me any of this before? You never asked. You never once looked at me, except perhaps to show pity. You never really cared how I felt. Anne, I am sorry that you feel this way. I am sorry for whatever part I may have played in contributing to these sentiments. However, if you actually feel this way, then why on earth would you possibly wish for an alliance between us? My mother wants it, Anne cried, with more energy than she was wont to demonstrate. What is more, our family expects it of us. I expect it of you, even though you have persisted in your stealthy courtship of Miss Elizabeth Bennet almost from the moment you first laid eyes on her. Here Anne stood, showing strength of resolve that Darcy theretofore did not know she possessed. She practically yelled, I know it all. I know that you have spent nearly every day admiring, nay, lusting after that impertinent young chit under this very roof, in my own home. I know that you make a habit of walking with her to the parsonage every chance you get, just the two of you, doing heaven knows what along the way. I see the way you look at her whenever you two are in company, hear the things you say to her and the things she says to you. All of this right in front of me, leaving me to suffer inside myself, wishing, praying it was the two of us. Anne drew closer to her cousin, too close, forcing him to take a step back. When you and the Colonel finally took your leave of Kent, I hoped and prayed that was the end of your trifling infatuation. But it turned out that I was to enjoy no such luck, she cried. Instead, you brought your sister Georgiana here, my dearest cousin and the one person whom I supposed would be an ally to me in my quest to earn a modicum of your admiration. You brought her here solely for the purpose of meeting that little upstart, suggesting that your intentions towards the chit are honourable, and further driving a stake through the heart of my chances for the life that is supposed to be mine. With assumed tranquillity, Darcy responded, Anne, you are angry. You are in pain for injuries that I may have unintentionally inflicted upon you. Again, I am sorry. As for my intentions for Miss Bennet, I will only say that they are, and have always been honourable. Beyond that, I will say no more, other than that none of that can have anything at all to do with you. The sooner you come to grips with the fact that the two of us will never be married, the better. Darcy brushed both hands over his face. Morning had come, despite the fact that he barely slept at all. Troubling thoughts had been his sole companions throughout the night. There was but one solace for Darcy after his pointless conversations with his relations the evening before. Elizabeth. He could hardly wait to see her that day, and he wanted to do so away from Rosings. Thus resolved, he quickly dressed, and nearly raced down the stairs and set out down the lane, intending to encounter her. After wandering about the lanes for some time, Darcy espied Elizabeth heading his way. What a balm catching sight of her was for his restless attitude. He walked towards her with long, determined strides. Miss Elizabeth, he said, bowing when they were close enough. Mr. Darcy, she replied with a slight curtsy. This is a welcome surprise. I have been walking in the lanes in the hope of seeing you. Are you planning to practice today? She nodded. Indeed. May I prevail on you to walk with me instead? His voice, as well as his dark, brooding eyes, spoke of his desire for companionship, and Elizabeth was not inclined to deny him such a request. 
What was the harm of eschewing practice another day, especially when half of the joy of being at Rosings was the prospect of spending time with him? I shall be delighted, sir. With that, the two of them fell into step beside each other and soon struck a different path. They walked much farther than usual and soon came across a trail not yet explored by Elizabeth. Shall we turn and head back, Miss Elizabeth? Darcy asked, his voice tentative. Despite the fact that silence had accompanied them most of the way thus far, Elizabeth said, I am not opposed to walking a while longer, sir. He smiled. I was hoping you would say that. You see, there is a lovely spot just up ahead. I do not think you have seen anything like it during your visit. I would love to accompany you there. I am placing myself in your hands, Mr. Darcy, Elizabeth replied, her spirits rising to playfulness. Theretofore, her walking companion had been much too silent and reserved. He wanted nothing but liveliness, she considered, hoping the diversion would serve both of them well. They did not walk very far before Elizabeth began to appreciate Mr. Darcy's invitation. What a beautiful sight to behold, a magnificent stone structure on a slightly rising hill, a wash in the colours of spring to their fullest effect. Its presence was neither obstructed by nature nor intrusive on its surroundings. The weeks that she had now passed in Kent had made such a significant difference to the countryside. Nowhere are the season's glories more evident than here, she considered in wonderment. In her haste to ascend the stone stairs to command a better view of such a marvellous place, Elizabeth stumbled. Darcy came to her rescue just in time. Finding herself in his arms, she turned and faced him. She was not so much embarrassed by her mishap as she was confounded by the dizzying emotions wrought by her situation. Never before had she been this close to him, and never before had she seen such a look in his eyes. The thought of what it must be like to have a man look at her in such a manner every day for the rest of her life stole her breath away. Standing that close to Elizabeth, holding her in that way, and gazing into her amazing eyes, Darcy gave his mind over to his wildest imaginations. Two nights previously, he had spent the best part of it dreaming of bringing her to that very spot. The two of them were lost in the unbridled expression of their mutual desires as true lovers were wont to do, and during the moment that meant the most, he called out her name. Mrs. Darcy. Is this too a dream? Moistening his lips, he leaned even closer. His eyes met hers and then fell to her slightly parted lips. What intoxicating madness Elizabeth suffered standing so close to this man, the unknowing of what it would mean if he kissed her, as he was kissing her, and just as importantly, after he kissed her. Her sentiments a baffling mixture of bewilderment and yearning, everything she had been taught about how a proper young lady ought to comport herself echoed through her mind. As though lost to all of that, Elizabeth closed her eyes. Thunder roaring in the distance recalled both Darcy and Elizabeth to the moment. It sounds as though we are about to suffer a downpour. Elizabeth swallowed. Indeed. If we hurry. I can see you back to the parsonage, safe and unharmed, from the rain. Elizabeth nodded. Ignoring the rise and fall of her bosom proved too tempting. Or we might remain here a while longer, where I will keep you just as safe. My friend may soon worry where I am, Elizabeth replied, her voice tentative. Indeed. Let us get you back to your friend. Darcy and Elizabeth then left the stone temple, their pace reflecting an urgency that it did not possess when they arrived, and understandably so. The roaring thunder in the distance and the occasional flash of lightning further confirmed that either one or both of them would fall victims to a massive downpour if they tarried for even a moment. Their haste proved most opportune for Elizabeth, for it allowed her to sort through what had just taken place. Mr. Darcy had come so very close to brushing his lips against hers, to kissing her, and she could not rightfully say that she would not have allowed him such a liberty. 
She could say for certain that she wanted to accept such intimacy, to relish in it while she could, which puzzled her exceedingly. It was one thing for her to entertain ideas of what it must be like to be kissed by such a man during her private moments. As a young maiden and a gentleman's daughter, it was another entirely to act upon them. Chapter 14 His Agitated State Darcy thought back long and hard over the events of the prior day. How he had come so close to kissing Elizabeth, a young maiden, a gentleman's daughter. She must think I am the worst sort of man, hardly a true gentleman, evidencing my desire for her with no mention of my intentions towards her, my honourable intentions. He had come exceedingly close to allowing his most treasured dreams of her to turn into reality. On the other hand, had things progressed, they most certainly would be betrothed by now, for he was positive that a single brush of his lips against hers would have released in him the urgency to make her his. A single kiss is all that it would take. There could not possibly be any turning back after that. Elizabeth cannot have failed to discern my desire for her without forming some expectations of where it is leading. As a respectable man, he dared not spend another moment alone with her in the absence of an avowal of his ardent affections as well as his heartfelt intentions. It was precisely this new resolve that accompanied him along the lanes that morning in the direction of the parsonage. Her head full of Mr. Darcy, Elizabeth prepared with more care than she was wont to do that morning. She wanted nothing more than to see him again, and she hoped to encounter him again on her walk. Memories of being in his arms had been her constant companions since parting with him at the parsonage gate. Memories both pleasing as well as perplexing. While in his arms, a part of her knew it was the only place in the world she wanted to be, the fanciful part. Another part of her knew it was the last place in the world she ought to be, the sensible part. Each additional step along the path with no sight of Mr. Darcy gave voice to the latter part. He must surely think I am wanton, and he wants nothing more to do with me. Her fanciful part posited a more tenable explanation. It is not as though he promised to meet me this morning. Perhaps I ought to go to Rosings to practice today. No doubt he will expect to see me there. Her sensible part would not be repressed. If Mr. Darcy wishes to see me today, he knows where to find me. Thus resolved, Elizabeth turned and headed back to the parsonage. She was not disappointed upon her return to learn that Mrs. Collins had gone out on business. Indebted to her aunt, Mrs. Gardner, as well as her dearest sister, Jane, as a consequence of their recent unanswered correspondence, she saw this as an excellent opportunity to catch up on her letter-writing. She had just sealed the second missive when she was suddenly roused by the sound of the doorbell. Her spirits were a little excited by the idea of a visit from Mr. Darcy, and she was further rewarded when, indeed, he walked into the room. She gave him a warm smile, and, setting aside the sealed letter, rose to greet him with a polite curtsy. He bowed. Elizabeth's joy was short-lived, replaced instead by a bout of curiosity, for the gentleman's air was quite different from when they last parted company. He had resumed the reserved attitude which best characterised him during the earliest days of their acquaintance. Not knowing what to think or how to feel, she invited him to sit, an invitation he promptly declined with a slight wave of his hand. She offered to ring for tea. He declined that, too. Elizabeth sat back down at Charlotte's writing desk, folded her hands in her lap, and waited. Then he did sit down but only a few moments passed before he stood again and commenced walking about the room. All this Elizabeth observed in silent wonder. After several moments of continual silence marked by slight agitation, he came to her. Miss Elizabeth, I fear I have been woefully remiss in not being completely honest with you. Suspecting her worst misgivings were about to unfold, she felt her heart slam against her chest. 
Is Mr. Darcy about to confess to me that he does indeed intend to honour his family's wishes and marry his cousin, Miss Anne de Bourgh? Does this explain his agitated state? Elizabeth coloured. She stared. She breathed in deeply, endeavouring to maintain the appearance of composure while preparing for what was to come. She nearly jumped out of her chair when the parlour door flew open and in raced that ridiculous Mr. Collins. In such a case as this, Elizabeth did not know whether to be disappointed or grateful for the sudden turn of events. His breathing precariously laboured, Collins hurried directly to Darcy and bowed deeply. Pray, Mr. Darcy, you will forgive my tardiness. When my servant informed me that you were here at my humble abode, I dropped everything that I was doing and rushed inside to receive you properly. Do excuse my appearance, sir. I was attending my garden, he said, likely in response to his soiled attire. Oh, yes, Collins went on, with no encouragement whatsoever. I fancy myself quite the proficient when it comes to such matters as this, although I admit I did not always think so, for there was a time when I would not have given myself the trouble of performing such a menial task more worthy of servants. However, with Mrs. Collins's frequent urging and my noble patroness's blessing, I now find the exercise quite to my liking, that is to say, when I am not preparing Sunday sermons, calling on parishioners, and and most importantly, attending her ladyship. Collins threw Elizabeth a look, meant to send her on her way, a silent directive she promptly ignored by pretending she did not notice. I see my fair cousin has been attending you in my stead, said Mr. Collins. I also see that she has not called for tea. He threw a rebuking glance in Elizabeth's direction. Cousin, what were you thinking? Miss Bennet did indeed offer to ring for tea. I declined, said Darcy in Elizabeth's defence. Sir, I would be entirely remiss were I to neglect to serve you tea. What would Lady Catherine think of such appalling evidence of incivility? Collins turned to Elizabeth. Pray you will see to it that my guest is served with the finest tea we have. I truly hesitate to burden you with such a task, and no doubt I would not if Mrs. Collins were here, for it is her place to attend such an honoured guest as Lady Catherine's nephew. However, my excellent wife is on business in the village. Uh, she will be dreadfully sorry to have missed you, sir, he said, directing his attention back to the gentleman whose countenance beamed with annoyance. As I said, it is entirely unnecessary to go to such lengths on my behalf. Elizabeth, eager to escape her cousin's sycophantic display, stood. It is no trouble at all, sir. She promptly quit the room. Once in the hallway, she halted for a moment to catch her breath. She felt sure Mr. Darcy was on the verge of making a confession about his intentions towards his cousin Anne, and likewise Elizabeth herself, before Mr. Collins unexpectedly arrived. For better or worse, she needed to hear him out. On the other hand, she also knew her cousin well enough by now to know he would not give the gentleman and her a moment of peace, especially with his head filled with the idea of Mr. Darcy being his guest. Whatever Mr. Darcy was about to say must wait, thus subjecting me to lingering suspense, the likes of which shall rob me of every bit of calm composure until we are alone once again. With such uncertain expectations of all that the gentleman might say, Elizabeth went on her way. She arrived in the kitchen in time to discover that tea was already in the process of being prepared by Charlotte's cook. She offered to deliver the tray to the parlour herself. With another of the servants trailing closely behind her, Elizabeth was but moments from re-entering the room where she had left her cousin and Mr. Darcy when the door flew open. Mr. Darcy! He walked directly to her. Pray forgive me, Miss Elizabeth, but I find I really must be on my way. A hint of amusement twinkled in her eyes, in spite of her disappointment. My cousin? He nodded slightly. Lowering his voice so that only she would hear him, Darcy said, Please agree to meet me in the morning at the temple. Elizabeth smiled in acquiescence. With that, Darcy bowed. Good day, Miss Elizabeth. She curtsied. Satisfied that come what may, 
Mere hours stood between the two of them and their next meeting. Chapter 15 His Purposes Darcy, having grown anxiously impatient waiting for Elizabeth to meet him at the temple, decided to go to the parsonage. If he was lucky, he supposed he might meet her on the path. Either way, he would let nothing deter him from his purposes. Today is the day I ask Elizabeth to accept my hand in marriage and in so doing make me the happiest man in all of England. He could not deny that lingering reservations did not accompany him. Her station in life was so decidedly beneath his own. It does not matter. Elizabeth is one of the most intelligent women I know. Wherever she goes, she will be respected and valued. What does it matter that her family has no wealth and is in want of connections? None of those things can mean anything to the future Mrs. Darcy. When the servant showed him into the room, Elizabeth's pale face and her rash manner startled Darcy. Mr. Darcy, she exclaimed, clutching a letter and tucking it behind her back with one hand and wiping tears from her cheek with the other. My word, Miss Elizabeth, pray what is the matter? Her knees trembling, Elizabeth attempted to put words to her emotions, but she found herself helpless to utter a single word. After taking a few calming breaths, she sat down. Darcy chose a chair across from her and eased it closer to where she sat. His eyes fell to the letter, which by now she held firmly in both hands. His eyes then traced her face that, no doubt, evidenced the track of her tears. He took out his crisp white handkerchief and gently dabbed her cheek. You have been crying, Miss Elizabeth. Has it anything to do with your letter? Has something happened to your family? Still shaking, she nodded. I am afraid so. I have just received the most alarming news from my eldest sister, Jane. Elizabeth burst into tears and could not utter another word for a moment or two. Darcy, in wretched suspense, wanted only to take her in his arms and encourage her to give over all her burdens to him. He could not. Accepting his proffered handkerchief, Elizabeth commenced wiping away her newly shed tears. At length, she began to speak once more. I have just had a letter from Jane with such dreadful news. Oh, concealing it from anyone is impossible. My younger sister Lydia has left all her friends. She has eloped. She has thrown herself into the power of, of Mr. Wickham. They are gone off together from Brighton. My sister has no money and no connections. She has nothing that can tempt him to marry her. Oh, I fear she is lost forever. Setting aside the bounds of decorum for that instant, he leaned closer and bestowed a soft kiss atop Elizabeth's head. I am sorry, he said. I am grieved on your behalf, grieved and shocked. Then, taking up his former attitude, he asked, Is the news your eldest sister conveyed absolutely certain? Oh, yes. The two of them left Brighton together on Sunday night. Jane mentioned that Lydia wrote to my sister Kitty, informing her of their plans to go to Gretna Green to be married. She and Mr. Wickham were traced almost to London, but not beyond. They are certainly not gone to Scotland. And did your sister say what has been done to recover her? My father travelled to London to aid my Uncle Gardner in the search for my sister. But I know very well that nothing can be done. How are they to be discovered if they do not wish to be found? If what I suspect is true, that they have not married, how is Wickham now to be worked on? What might possibly induce him to marry my sister now? I have not the smallest hope. Darcy shook his head in silent acquiescence. He knew Wickham too well to mount a sufficient argument against Elizabeth's dire prognosis, to give her a measure of hope that would comfort her when some modicum of reassurance was what she needed most. His ensuing silence was deafening. Elizabeth immediately felt the loss when he stood and commenced walking up and down the room in earnest meditation. His contracted brow, his gloomy air, 
Elizabeth saw and instinctively understood what it all meant. Such evidence of her family's weakness and the assurance of imminent disgrace must certainly diminish his esteem for her. The thought of what this revelation must mean to her cousin dawned on her and struck a chord of panic that spiralled throughout her body. Mr. Collins would certainly want her away from his home immediately, before the shame of what her sister had done had tainted him and, more importantly, his noble patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Oh, Lady Catherine! How the proud woman would triumphantly lord the Bennet family's frailties over Elizabeth. How she would chastise Elizabeth for not heeding all her admonishments about Mr. Wickham. Oh, Mr. Darcy warned me as well. I refused to hear a false word spoken against Mr. Wickham, and now this is to be my reward. Betrayed by a man whom she long believed she could trust, and likely pitied by a man whom, for the first time, she knew she could love. Indeed, love, honour, and respect, when all such felicitous sentimentalities are now in vain. By now, Elizabeth was lost to almost everything other than her silent lamentations and dire speculations on what life at Longbourn must certainly look like upon her return. Undoubtedly, her mother would be prostrate with grief over the misfortune that had befallen her youngest and by far her favourite daughter, whom, no doubt, she lamented as being an innocent victim in the evil Wickham schemes, when all Lydia meant to do was land herself a handsome husband in a red coat. No doubt her sister Jane and her sister Mary, who was next to Elizabeth in age, were doing all they could in seeing to their mother's comfort. Most likely Kitty would either be wailing at the injustice that Lydia should be married before her, or the fact that she had kept Lydia's secret plans to herself for so long as she did. Elizabeth, as much as she missed her eldest sister and longed for her comforting embrace, did not relish the idea of returning to such chaos. Her companion's soothing voice recalled Elizabeth to her present situation. I would do anything to relieve you of your current distress. Anything in the world, you need only speak the words. Oh, sir, you are very kind. But in light of our circumstances, I do not feel I have a right to prevail upon your generosity. What can my family's dire predicament have to do with you? He took her hands in his. Surely you know how important you are to me. There is nothing in the world that I would not do for you. If you would like to help, then I know what I would like you to do. Pray you will not view my request as impertinence, and if you will, I shall not be disappointed. Anything, Miss Elizabeth, ask me anything. I do not wish to remain here in Hunsford a minute longer than is necessary. You know my cousin and your aunt too well to know what will happen when the news of what my sister has done reaches them. You have offered me the use of your carriage before. I fear I need to avail myself of your offer now to bring me to my uncle's home in Cheapside. I need to be with my family. I want to do whatever I can to help during what I am certain will be trying times. Indeed, I shall accompany you to your uncle's home myself. I will have my sister Georgiana join us. No, that is to say that I could not ask you to take such a task upon yourself. I most certainly do not feel comfortable involving your sister. What would I say to her in explanation of my distress? What can she possibly know of such evils of the world? Darcy brought Elizabeth's hand to his lips and brushed a reassuring kiss across her knuckles. My sister is far wiser than you know. She will be a great comfort to you. You must trust me on this. Releasing her hands, Darcy traced his fingers along Elizabeth's chin. Gather whatever you require for an imminent departure for London. I shall come back with my carriage post-haste. The look in his eyes spoke of his desire to do more than just trace his fingers along her face, rekindling in Elizabeth a small measure of hope. Whether it was on her family's behalf or her own, she did not know. Any hope was better than none at all. She smiled at him, and with that Darcy stood and quit the room. Elizabeth went to the window and watched as he made his way along the walk leading to the gate. 
she knew him too well to suppose he would not soon return. He was too much of a gentleman not to do as he promised. Lingering by the window, Elizabeth folded one arm over the other as she continued to watch Mr. Darcy walk away. What might take place after he carried her to her uncle's home in Cheapside was another matter in its entirety. Would the occasion mark the end of whatever power she might have at one time held over him? Returning to Rosings in haste to oversee whatever arrangements were necessary for a swift departure for London, the tumult of Darcy's mind was terribly great, and at times he found himself voicing his dismay aloud. How could that scoundrel possibly have supposed he would carry out such a nefarious offence? Did he truly think the young girl was so unprotected, so friendless? Did he not consider that her father or uncles or even the colonel of his regiment would not step forward? The young girl was under the colonel's protection, for heaven's sake. Could he expect to be noticed again by his fellow officers after such an affront? What temptation could possibly have made such a risk worth while? That loathsome man has no money. Why on earth would he steal away with that young woman? I know him well enough to know he will never marry a woman who does not have her own fortune. He cannot afford it. What claims does this young lady possess that would make him, for her sake, forego his every chance of marrying well? With only one possible basis for comparison with a young woman whom he had never met, Darcy's thoughts turned to Elizabeth, her loveliness, her wit, and her charms. Is this young lady anything at all like her elder sister? Is that why Wickham set his cap at her? Is this his way of striking out at Elizabeth? Darcy wondered for a moment or two whether Wickham's chief objective was to exact revenge against himself. He persuaded himself that such could not possibly be the case. Wickham could have no way of knowing that I am acquainted with the Bennets of Hertfordshire. He could not possibly know that I was on the verge of proposing marriage to the second eldest Bennet daughter. The particulars behind Wickham's motives no longer matter, he reasoned. What is important now is that I do everything in my power to help bring about a better solution to this crisis than any of Elizabeth's family have reason to hope for or expect. Not only was it important to Elizabeth and her family, but it was essential for his own future felicity as well. Chapter 16 His Own Testimony Elizabeth, with the aid of Charlotte's maid, managed to have all of her belongings packed and carried downstairs in no time at all. The Collinses had not yet come back from their business in the village. She felt she owed her friend some sort of explanation of her abrupt leave-taking. The decision of what to say and what was best left unsaid made for several starts and stops. Elizabeth could not help but question the futility of it all. No doubt word had also come from Lady Lucas, Charlotte's mother of what had taken place. What with Lucas Lodge neighbouring Longbourn village and the speed at which gossip of this nature was bound to spread, Elizabeth would not have been surprised if the Collinses were hours away from knowing more than she did. More than one missive had arrived at the parsonage that morning. She was sitting alone in the parlour, finishing a letter in explanation of her unexpected departure, when Mr. Darcy was shown into the room for the second time that day. His mood gloomy still, and Elizabeth's only slightly more recovered than when he had left her side earlier, the two of them exchanged knowing looks. She swiftly signed and sealed her letter, and then positioned it just so on the table, so Charlotte would be certain to see it upon her return. Rising from her seat, she said, I am ready, sir. Nodding, Darcy told her that her belongings were being loaded onto the carriage as they spoke, and that his sister was waiting there. I imagine your sister's companion, Mrs. Ansley, is with her, and that she will be travelling with us as well. No, only the three of us will be going to town. In light of the urgency of our departure, it was necessary to leave Mrs. Ansley here. She will oversee the packing of my sister's personal belongings and return to town later. This account gave Elizabeth a small measure of comfort. From what she knew of the elderly companion, she understood her to be an elegant woman of exceptional taste and good values. Elizabeth really did not know how the lady might react towards her 
in the wake of this scandal. It was difficult enough for her to imagine to what lengths she must go to cover up the truth from Mr. Darcy's sister. Elizabeth said, Again, sir, I am dreadfully sorry for the inconvenience all this must certainly be to you and your sister. You need not trouble yourself with such sentiments, Miss Elizabeth, and by all means do not apologise to me or my sister. Georgiana knows very well the extents to which I would go to be of service to those deemed important to me. What have you told your sister? Elizabeth exclaimed, with more energy than she had intended, her heartbeat now racing. I only told her that you were most eager to return to town owing to a family emergency, and that I offered to see to your safe arrival. By now, Darcy and Elizabeth were walking side by side towards the gate and the waiting carriage. I know it may sound to you rather ridiculous that I cling to this notion of concealing the truth, when the news of what my sister has done must surely be spreading rapidly even as we speak. I confess to taking a small measure of comfort in knowing that I still have some time, however fleeting, to accustom myself to the truth and rally my strength for the disdain and derision that is sure to come, and henceforth to follow my other sisters and me wherever we go. Perhaps you will arrive at your uncle's home to news that the situation has been dealt with. Perhaps Wickham has done the decent thing and married your sister after all. They were steps away from the carriage. Elizabeth stopped, causing Darcy to do likewise. Sir, you are too generous to admonish me for foolishly clinging to my belief that Mr. Wickham was an honourable, respectable man, and for my steadfast defence of his character. However, you know him too well to suppose such a thing is even possible in the absence of a strong inducement, she said. Perchance the wrong end of a loaded gun, Elizabeth added, evincing a lightness of spirit that deep down inside she did not truly possess. Reaching out to take her ungloved hand in his and assist her into the carriage, Darcy smiled a little, no doubt at this picture of his former friend. Then perhaps there is hope indeed. The abruptness of Mr. Collins's entrance into Charlotte's parlour, the one she reserved for her particular use and where she and Elizabeth had spent a fair amount of time of late, gave her such a fright that she immediately tucked her letter behind her back. Mrs. Collins, thank heavens you are alone, for I am in possession of the most alarming news from Hertfordshire. It has to do with the Bennets. Halting his speech, the vicar tossed a surreptitious glance over his shoulder as a means of doubly reassuring himself of their privacy. I am afraid this news has such grave implications that it is no longer feasible to allow your friend, Cousin Elizabeth, to remain under our roof. Not if we want to avoid her family shame ourselves. No, I am afraid Cousin Elizabeth must go. He dashed over to the window and peered outside in the direction of the parsonage gate. Where is she? We must tell her without a single moment's delay. Oh, this is grave indeed. My friend Eliza is not here, said Charlotte, her voice trembling. Oh, yes, of course. No doubt my cousin is wandering aimlessly about the lanes as she is wont to do. I do hope that is indeed the case and that she did not go to Rosings today. We must send that young woman on her way at once. No, Eliza is not out walking, nor is she at Rosings. She is gone. Collins spun around on his heels. Gone? Do you mean to say that she has left Hunsford of her own accord, thereby denying me the chance of banishing her from our home as a fitting means of saving face after what her youngest sister did? You are aware of what I am speaking of, are you not? Charlotte shook her head on all accounts. Where has she gone? What means did she employ to take her leave? She has gone to London with... with Mr. Darcy. The appalling shock of hearing his wife's troubling revelation completely robbed Mr. Collins of what little equanimity he theretofore possessed. He could not help but consider that his cousin had used her arts and allurements to entice his noble patroness's nephew and future son-in-law and cause him to forget what he was about in committing such an outrageous offence. Oh, it was too much to bear. Clutching his hand to his chest, he slowly threw himself into the nearest chair. Oh, what must Lady Catherine think when she learns of this? <gasps> his lamentations would not be repressed. 
Sweat poured from his head and streamed down his face. Oh, after all the kindness she has shown my cousin, this is to be her ladyship's reward. Oh, surely she must certainly blame me. Here Collins directed his grievance towards his wife. Nay, hey, her ladyship will blame you, Mrs. Collins, for inviting your impertinent friend into our home, for throwing her into the path of such noble, upstanding people, and for giving her a glimpse of how her life might have been had she accepted my offer of marriage. Collins reached for a glass of water that Charlotte had left unfinished on the side table. After taking a long sip, the vicar went on to say, In seeing all that she had given up by slighting me, my cousin set her cap at what she must have considered the next best thing, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy, an honourable gentleman not unlike myself, with the only possible exception being the extent of his blessings, splendid property, noble kindred, and extensive patronage. Mr. Collins, I really do not think that is the manner in which events unfolded at all. The aggrieved gentleman glared at his wife. Do you dare contradict me, Mrs. Collins? It is precisely as I say. That ungrateful young lady knew precisely what she was about in coming here. That is the way it is with young women of her ilk, always in want of that which is beyond their designated station in life. Is there any wonder her younger sister threw herself into the power of a man more than twice her age? Oh, such a lack of principles is deeply rooted in those people with whom I suffer an unfortunate connection owing to the circumstances of my birth. Now significantly recovered, no doubt through the power of his own testimony, Collins stood and straightened himself up. He gave his neck a resolved twist and his waistcoat a sharp tug. Now I must go to Rosings and assure my noble patroness that I am in no way to blame for this travesty. Shall I accompany you, sir? Charlotte asked, fully prepared to face Lady Catherine's wrath and serve as the voice of reason, if need be. Collins held up a reprimanding hand. Have you not done enough already to bring about this household shame and what might well be its collapse? I shall see Lady Catherine alone. When they arrived at the changing station at Bromley, it was necessary for Darcy to leave the ladies alone while he attended to some business having to do with the horses. Fortunately, the matter did not require Elizabeth and Georgiana to leave the carriage, and there the two of them waited for Darcy's return. The first part of the journey had been filled with silence. All three of them had appeared to be engrossed in their respective books. Elizabeth's mind was certainly not on the pages before her. All she could think about was Jane's letter. She questioned whether she might have missed something. The letter was hastily written, clearly evincing more than a few starts and stops, half sentences, as well as several redactions. By now, she could not adequately recall what Jane had said and had not said, nor did she know just how much of the turmoil in her mind was the consequence of her own memory, misery, and misgivings. As much as she did not wish to be rude, she could not help it. Elizabeth retrieved her sister's letter from her reticule and commenced reading it yet again. What a mistake that turned out to be. This reading did more to reawaken her pain than refresh her memory. The tears that she had fought so hard to contain for the past few hours would no longer be repressed. She quickly refolded the letter and tucked it away. In so doing, she noticed Mr. Darcy's handkerchief. He had given it to her earlier that day, after he gently wiped away her tears. She seized hold of it as though it were a life preserver, and she a drowning woman, and dabbed her eyes. All of this Miss Darcy must have been paying close attention to. Shutting her book, she eased closer to Elizabeth's side of the carriage. I did not want to intrude earlier. But seeing you like this, I can no longer help myself. Pray what is the matter? Is there anything I can do to help? Elizabeth sniffed. Silently cursing herself, she said, I beg your pardon. I, I confess that I am anxious about what I might expect upon arriving at my uncle's house. Yes, my brother spoke of a family emergency. Perhaps it would help if you were to talk about what it is that has you so uneasy. 
Confiding in another always helps me sort through painful events. Elizabeth looked intently at the younger woman. For the first time, it dawned on her that Miss Darcy could not be much older than Lydia, who had recently turned sixteen. Pray forgive me, but you are so young, and you are so... She hesitated in search of the right word. So innocent? Is that what you mean to say? What is more, you are asking yourself what I can possibly know about pain. Elizabeth's silent acknowledgement of the accuracy of her companion's claim encouraged the younger woman to continue speaking. I fear I have suffered a great deal of pain for someone of my age, needlessly endured heartbreak largely of my own making, no less. I am not nearly so innocent of the ways of the world as you think I am. You see, it was not long ago that I fancied myself in love with an older gentleman, one whom I had admired since childhood, and one whom I later learned had earned the wrath of my brother. Throughout Georgiana's poignant discourse, Elizabeth silently listened, her manner a mixture of attentiveness, empathy, and patience. The longer the young woman spoke, the more Elizabeth began to suspect that Georgiana was the person whom Colonel Fitzwilliam had alluded to when he spoke of Mr. Darcy saving a young lady from being taken advantage of by George Wickham. Giving proof to Elizabeth's silent conjecture, the young woman wept. Oh, Miss Elizabeth, had it not been for my brother's intervention, I might have been married to that horrid man. I might now be Mrs. George Wickham. Elizabeth gasped at this disturbing revelation. Do you, do you know Mr. Wickham? Miss Darcy cried. How uncanny was this that two families so wholly unconnected with each other Two families separated not only by hundreds of miles, but a huge gap in status and privilege, would find themselves the victim of the same man. Now comprehending the full extent of how blinded she had been by Wickham's charms and how easily she had been taken in, Elizabeth shuddered. Sadly, I am obliged to say I do, she replied. I became acquainted with him last year, as did all of my sisters. It pains me to say this, but I can no longer hide the real reason for my eagerness to return to town to be with my family. Elizabeth wiped her eyes. You see, I only learned this morning that my youngest sister has thrown herself into Mr. Wickham's power. She ran off with him, thinking he was taking her to Scotland to be married. Now it was Georgiana's turn to gasp aloud. Elizabeth said, That is not the worst of it. Oh, if only that were the case. But no, they never went to Scotland. Their whereabouts are completely unknown. I fear my sister is lost to us forever. My other sisters and I are ruined. Upon returning to the carriage, Darcy observed the young ladies locked in a caring embrace. Which of the two offered the greater share of comfort to the other he could not say. Only one thing was certain. Not only were the two women who meant more to him than anything in the world victims of Wickham's treachery, but it was also touchingly apparent they had confided in each other their most closely guarded secrets. Chapter 17 The Rest of Her Family Gracechurch Street, London Not only was Elizabeth's aunt receiving guests during a time when she least expected them, but she was also obliged to welcome complete strangers into her home amidst the chaos and confusion surrounding Lydia's disappearance. An elegant, educated woman, Mrs. Gardner managed what otherwise would have been a situation rife with uneasiness, with grace. Elizabeth could well imagine how different things would have been if she had arrived at Longbourn under such circumstances. Either her mother would have made impossible any manner of civil discourse with her theatrics over poor Lydia's fate, or she would have made quite the fuss over her illustrious visitors. In whatever manner her mother might have comported herself, Elizabeth was sure it would have been cause for utter embarrassment. She took some comfort in knowing that her gardener relations were people of whom she was always proud. Her aunt gardener had a way of making everyone she met glad for the acquaintance. It was no different with Mr. Darcy and his sister, of that Elizabeth was certain. 
when it was discovered that her aunt had spent part of her youth in Lampton, a small town in Derbyshire near Mr. Darcy's home. The actual reason for the Darcy's now being in Cheapside was tactfully obfuscated by talk of shared interests and possible mutual acquaintances. Not long after Elizabeth and her party had arrived, her uncle walked in the room. Elizabeth, expecting to see her father, was half disappointed and half anxious over his absence. Once again the proper introductions were made, and a short period of polite discourse was attempted. By now, Elizabeth expected her guests to make their excuses and take their leave. How astonished she was by what Mr. Darcy proceeded to do instead. Mr. Gardiner, sir, might I request the privilege of a private audience with you? A sensible man, whom Elizabeth always thought of as being the complete opposite of his sisters, her mother and her aunt, Mrs. Phillips, the older man readily acquiesced in such a manner that suggested he would not dream of denying a man of Mr. Darcy's consequence any request that he condescended to make. The two gentlemen swiftly went away immediately after that, leaving Elizabeth to wonder what exactly Mr. Darcy was about. Apprehension, anxiety, and suppositions weighed heavily on her mind, even while she endeavoured to cover up her unsettling sentiments and cease her occasional hand-wringing with calm conversation with Miss Darcy and Mrs. Gardiner until the gentlemen made their return. Mr. Gardiner, upon entering the room, hurried to the side-table and poured himself a drink. Remembering himself, he turned to the younger man. May I offer you a brandy? Darcy declined. Well, I hope you do not mind if I have one, for if ever a situation called for such measures, this would be it. Not at all, sir, Darcy responded. With that, the older man took a long swallow from his glass. Please, have a seat, he said, gesturing in the direction of his large, overly cluttered desk. Setting his unfinished drink aside, Mr. Gardiner took a seat behind the desk. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me in private, Mr. Gardiner. Darcy said to the older man, now settled in the seat opposite him. Indeed, I am much obliged to do so. I only wish my brother Bennet were here, and then you might speak with him instead, for I have a strong suspicion this meeting directly pertains to his family. He has gone out for a walk, and I cannot say with any degree of certainty when he will return. In a manner of speaking, yes, my purposes have everything to do with his family. However, I feel that time is of the essence. I trust you will acquaint Mr. Bennet of the particulars of our discussion upon his return. Mr. Gardiner nodded in silent acquiescence. Sir, Darcy continued, I suspect you will regard my interest in what has befallen the Bennets as rather untoward. However, I have come here to offer my assistance in the recovery of your youngest niece. At the risk of sounding ungrateful during a time when any such an offer is precisely what my family needs, I cannot know how my family's struggles can be of any concern of yours, Mr. Darcy. I am aware that you and my niece formed an acquaintance when she was in Kent. Here the older man nodded. Indeed, I am grateful that you went out of your way in seeing to her safe arrival. However, unless I am mistaken... Your acquaintance is of a rather short duration. You are certainly a stranger to the rest of her family. Indeed, you may think of me as a rather impertinent stranger at that. But I hope it will not prevent you from allowing me to be of service. The fact is that Miss Elizabeth, <coughs> pardon me, Miss Bennet's well-being is very important to me. I cannot stand idly by and do nothing to alleviate her burdens, so long as I have the means of bringing about a swifter resolution of the matter than is otherwise possible. You see, sir, I know Wickham. I know him better than most, for he and I were childhood acquaintances. He was once much like a brother to me. I know how he can be worked on. Go on, Mr. Darcy. I am quite interested in hearing more of what you have to say. First, I would ask that you keep my concern in this matter closely held. Of course, I shall leave it to you how much you confide in Mr. Bennet and Mrs. Gardner as well. But beyond that... Mr. Gardner nodded. Enough said, sir. You would rather my niece not be informed of any of the particulars. 
It is not that I wish to keep secrets from her. On the contrary, I do not want to cause her further heartbreak should my efforts lead nowhere. It is apparent that you care a great deal for my niece, else you would not have given yourself so much trouble to reunite her with her family. Indeed, more than she knows. With that, the gentlemen turned their attentions to the business of tracking down Wickham and young Lydia. Mr. Gardner acquainted Darcy with all the pertinent details as best he could. Not long thereafter, Darcy came back to the drawing room, made his excuses in the usual way, and he and his sister took their leave of the gardener's home. Exactly when he would lay eyes on Elizabeth again he could not say with certainty. All he knew was, when the time was right, they would see each other again. Mr. Bennet returned so soon on the heels of the Darcy's leave-taking that Elizabeth supposed he could not possibly have missed seeing the stately carriage as it pulled away. If he had, he spoke nothing of it. It pained Elizabeth to see how Lydia's selfish indiscretion had altered her father. Absent was the quick wit and welcoming smile that had always greeted her whenever they had been parted for so long. His eyes were swollen, his hair unkempt, and his face unshaven. She supposed he had not experienced a decent night's sleep in days, and thus, when he made the excuse of wanting to retire to the sanctuary of his room, Elizabeth could not help but agree that it was for the best. With that, she accompanied her beloved father up the stairs. Later on, when Elizabeth and her aunt Mrs. Gardner were finally alone and at liberty to deliberate as well as commiserate over the events of that particular day and the days before that, the older woman's curiosity would not be repressed. She wanted to know all that Elizabeth would tell her about their earlier guest, Mr. Darcy. I must confess that the gentleman is nothing at all as you described him in your earliest letters, Mrs. Gardner said. Elizabeth painfully recalled her harsh description of the gentleman, specifically that he was overbearing and haughty, with a selfish disdain for those whom he deemed beneath him in consequence. How she wished she could retract those words. I fear I have misjudged him terribly, and for that I am utterly ashamed. You need not be so harsh on yourself. Mr. Darcy does not seem to bear you any ill will, Lizzie. On the contrary, it was very kind of the Darcys to cut short their visit in Kent in order to bring you here. It is apparent that you have made quite a favourable impression on the two of them, which speaks even further to my regret for having misjudged him. To own the truth, part of the reason I formed such an unfavourable impression of Mr. Darcy has to do with none other than Wickham himself. Does the gentleman know Lieutenant Wickham? Elizabeth nodded. He knows him better than most. You will recall that Wickham also hails from Derbyshire. Now that you speak of it, I do remember hearing that before. Is theirs an acquaintance of long standing? I am afraid so. You see, Mr. Wickham was the late Mr. Darcy's godson. <gasps> oh, my! What is more, Mr. Darcy and Wickham severed all ties soon after the elder Mr. Darcy's death, for reasons I shall not expound upon. Suffice it to say that there were very grave flaws in Mr. Wickham's character that made any further association between Mr. Darcy and him untenable. Knowing what we now do about the man, you can have no doubt about the nature of his defects. Elizabeth fought to hold back her tears. Oh, Aunt, Mr. Darcy tried in sincere earnestness to warn me not to think so highly of Mr. Wickham. He told me time and again that Wickham was not worthy of such esteem, and he urged that I should warn my father against him as well. But I would not listen, nor did I listen to anyone who endeavoured to warn me. Charlotte, Mr. Darcy's cousin? His cousin? Would that be the colonel you spoke of in your letters? Elizabeth nodded. Indeed, Colonel Fitzwilliam. He even alluded to the exact nature of Mr. Darcy's grievances stating that Mr. Wickham had attempted to commit a similar offence against someone very important to Mr. Darcy. Again I would not hear a word spoken against Wickham. Why, even Mr. Darcy's aunt, Lady Catherine de Bourgh, advised me to be wary of that horrid man. 
Is there any wonder I am so mortified? Oh, again, Lizzie, I beg of you not to be so harsh on yourself. You trusted your own opinion over the testimony of strangers. No one will blame you for that. Oh, but what of Charlotte? She was not nearly so blatant in her admonishments, but she did try to warn me too, in her own way. No, others may not blame me, but I shall not be so lenient. I feel the shame of my misguided beliefs most acutely, as well I ought to. Oh, I only pray that it has not cost my family too much, Elizabeth thought, but did not say. I pray it has not cost me Mr. Darcy's esteem. By the expression on Mrs. Gardiner's face, she undoubtedly suspected there was so much more that her niece was not telling her. Elizabeth was glad that her aunt did not press her for details that she did not feel comfortable nor up to the task of imparting. Elizabeth's favourite aunt by far, Mrs. Gardiner said, I hope you do not mind my saying so, Lizzie, but Mr. Darcy strikes me as a thoughtful, compassionate gentleman. His steadfast devotion to his sister is beyond question. Mr. Gardiner and I had a chance to discuss the young man between ourselves while we were upstairs with your father. She reached out her hand to her niece. I hope you do not mind. Accepting her aunt's warm gesture, Elizabeth reassuringly smiled, thus indicating that she did not mind one bit. Mrs. Gardiner took that as sufficient encouragement to go on. Mr. Gardiner, too, was quite favourably impressed with the young man. Mr. Darcy is truly the personification of what every young man ought to be. On that, your uncle and I wholeheartedly agree. Chapter 18 Unyielding Temper Darcy looked about the well-maintained establishment in stunned incredulity. He could hardly believe his ears when told that he would find his former friend, George Wickham, staying in such a place as this with Elizabeth's youngest sister. Darcy had expected to discover the wayward couple holed up in some dilapidated dwelling, barely fit for human habitation, mired in filth, stench, and infestations of every kind. Climbing the stairs leading to the designated apartment, he ran his gloved fingers along the railings for a second or two, before holding them up for inspection. As well kept as every aspect of his surroundings was, he should not have been surprised to find no evidence of neglect. He arched his brow. How on earth can Wickham afford to secure such lodgings? The last time he saw that gentleman in Ramsgate, he looked more like a poverty-stricken dandy who had wasted his last shilling foolishly pretending to be wealthy, no doubt for Miss Darcy's benefit. Learning that Wickham had joined the militia shortly after that further confirmed Darcy's view that his former friend had squandered every other opportunity for respectability, because Wickham did not possess a shred of honourability that would otherwise compel him to serve his king and country. Were such not the case, I surely would not be standing here, Darcy silently considered. By now he had reached the door. He gave it a series of sharp raps. Within moments, Wickham threw open the door. The stench from his breath took Darcy aback. Where have you been? Wickham bellowed. By his manner, it appeared he had expected to find someone else standing in his doorway. Dumbfounded by the presence of his old friend, he spat, What are you doing here of all places, Darcy? You are the last person in the world I ever expected to find at my door. This is not a social call, Wickham, Darcy said, forcing his way inside. He stole a quick glance about the room. It was in total disarray a striking contrast to the public areas of the establishment. Where is she? he demanded. I do not have a clue what you're talking about. After everything I had to endure to find you, I am not in the mood to be trifled with. Where is Miss Bennet? Miss Bennet? I am afraid I do not know anyone by that name. Tell me more about this young woman. You are a liar, Darcy shouted. I know it all. I know you persuaded the youngest Bennet daughter to run away with you under the guise of an elopement. <laughs> How absurd! Where did you hear something as preposterous as that? 
Not wanting to say anything that would betray Elizabeth's confidence, Darcy said, It turns out that your Mrs. Young is no better than you are. Easily bought off. Now stop lying and tell me where Miss Bennet is. Giving up all pretenses, Wickham said, As you can see, the silly chit is not here. Did you abandon her on the streets of London after you had your way with her? Shrugging, Wickham huffed sardonically. Were that only the case, but no. I put all of my trust in her, and she absconded early this morning, taking with her all of my money. Stop making yourself out to be the victim in all this. Indeed I am the victim. A common whore would not have used me as ill as that so-called gentleman's daughter did. Why would you have me believe your nonsense about Miss Bennet making off with your money? Knowing you as I do, any money she might have taken from you would get her no farther than across the street. <laughs> that is where you are mistaken, my old friend. I recently came into a rather large sum of money, and I was foolish enough to let that silly Bennet girl in on my secret. Why should I believe such a lame explanation? Why should I lie? Even more importantly, why should you even care? Unless... Unless what, you idiot? Darcy demanded. Finally, I am beginning to comprehend Lady Catherine de Bourgh's motives, Wickham thought to himself. She used me in her scheme to save Darcy for her sickly daughter, Anne. To own the truth, Wickham said, I am aware that the second eldest Bennet daughter, Miss Elizabeth, has been a guest of your aunt, Lady Catherine's vicar, that ridiculous Mr. Collins. Wickham smiled in remembrance of his time spent in company with Elizabeth. He went on to say, Miss Elizabeth is a charming woman, dare I say a tease as well, although she hides her motives better than her silly sister. I am also aware of you being in Kent. Perhaps you became caught up in Miss Elizabeth's spell. As it was with your own sister, you now feel compelled to rescue her sister. Wickham knew his former friend too well not to know how affected he was by this assertion. That is it, isn't it, Darcy? You fancy yourself in love with Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Well, I wish you better luck with that one than I enjoyed. On the other hand, you do find yourself in possession of a rather large fortune which must surely eliminate any objection she might have in giving herself to you. As a point of fact, I believe you ought to be thanking me for what I have done in sullying her sister. Indeed, I have spared you the burden of marrying Elizabeth Bennet. What with her family's disgrace, you can claim her as your mistress. Just think of all the money you will save. No doubt such an arrangement will suit your cousin Anne perfectly well. That is to say nothing of the vast holdings that will be firmly under your control once you marry her. She might even allow you to move your lovely mistress into one of your homes along with all your little bastards. Darcy's unyielding temper, which Wickham also knew all too well from first-hand experience, flared. He marched to where Wickham stood and grabbed him by the throat. When Darcy drew back his tight fist, Wickham covered his face with both hands. The last thing he needed was a sharp blow that might mar his good looks. Oh, what are you doing to my Wickham? Take your hands off him! Both gentlemen looked around and saw a young woman strut into the room. Darcy had not expected to see a stout, well-grown girl adorned from head to toes in the finest riches money could buy. Could this be Miss Lydia Bennet? Darcy released Wickham with force. Recovering himself, Wickham dashed to where the young lady stood. Lydia, where on earth have you been? And what did you do with my money? Oh, Wickham, you cannot possibly have thought that I would get married without a proper wedding trousseau. <laughs> I spent the best part of the morning with the dressmaker, poring through all the fashion magazines, and when I was not doing that, I was busy picking out satins and linens and ribbons and laces and, oh, and the bonnets. I must have ordered at least a dozen bonnets. How jealous all of my sisters will be when they see all my beautiful things, and the best part is that I'll be a married woman, and I will not be obliged to share any of it with them. Just look at this lovely bracelet. She held out her arm for inspection. It is merely a trinket in comparison to some of the other fine jewels I ordered. 
All of these useless things must have cost a fortune. Lydia giggled. <laughs> oh, more than that, I assure you. Where is the rest of my money? The young woman smiled. As luck would have it, an intelligent-looking gentleman approached me on the street as I was leaving the dressmaker, and he told me about a grand scheme to earn a fortune. But he impressed upon me that I must act without delay, for if I did not, the opportunity would pass us by. Lydia, you silly chit! I hope you gave the gentleman no mind and instead went on about your business. Indeed I did not. The gentleman asked me how much I had to invest in his scheme, and I told him. He said it was not nearly enough. Oh, thank heavens. Hand over whatever remains of my money this second, Wickham demanded. That I cannot do, she cried. Why ever not? <laughs> well, the kind gentleman advised me that he would gladly take whatever sum of money I could give him, and he would make up the difference with his own funds. What is more, he assured me that he would give me every shilling of the proceeds. How could I possibly resist such a promising proposition? Wickham's mouth gaped. You handed everything over to someone on the street whom you had only just met? How could you be so, so... The gentleman may indeed have been a stranger at first, but look, he handed me his card. Oh, Wickham, are you not so very proud of me? He snatched the card from her hand. Quickly perusing it, he crumpled it in his hand and tossed it across the room. Do you know what you have done? I have done a splendid thing, no doubt. His eyes burning with rage, he yelled, Why did you take all of my money? Silly Wickham, she squealed. Need I remind you again that a lady dare not dream of getting married without a proper wedding trousseau? My mamma would be terribly disappointed were she to suppose I went without all the essential things. How was I to know how much money I would need to acquire all the necessary things? Oh, I declare it is a very good thing for me that I had so much money at my disposal. Madame St. Clair remarked on what excellent taste I have, and she was most helpful in informing me of all the essentials that I neglected to recall on my own. <laughs> Mind you, many of my purchases are to be specially made. I told Madame Sinclair that I have not a moment to delay, and she promised me that everything will be ready three days hence. At least there is still a chance to put a stop to things and recover some portion of the money from the bulk of your wasteful spending. Wickham grabbed the young woman by the arm. You, young woman, are coming with me to get what is left of my money. Darcy, who had watched the unsettling exchange between the two with a disturbing mixture of disgust and dismay, intervened. You are not going anywhere just yet. Not before I have had a chance to speak with Miss Bennet about what she has done. The high-spirited young woman wiggled her arm free from Wickham's loose grip. Do I know you, sir? You might consider me an acquaintance of your families. I have spoken with your aunt and uncle Gardner here in town. You ought to know how your behavior has been the means of throwing your relations' lives into utter chaos, threatening to ruin your family's name and exposing them all to scorn, derision, and disdain. You must allow me to bring you to them as the first step towards salvaging whatever is left of your virtue and their respectability. Lydia placed her hand over her lips. Oh, I am happier than I have ever been in my life living here with my Wickham. Soon he and I will be married. It is what my mamma has always desired for me, to be married to an officer. <laughs> Not only will my Wickham and I be exceedingly happy, but we shall also be very rich. That nice gentleman to whom I handed over all that was left of our money promised me. Lydia, you fool! Wickham shouted. Are you too daft to realize all of my money is gone forever? Lydia gasped, no doubt taken aback at being spoken to so rudely by her lover. Darcy felt a tinge of pity for the young girl who stood before him. It went without saying that she was one of the silliest creatures he had ever met, but as best he could tell, her intentions had been good. She really believed she was on the heels of being married, and that wealth, happiness, and love were to be her reward for what she had done to her family. He observed the unmasked disdain that shone on Wickham's face. The girl deserved better than what she had bargained for. I am afraid it is true, young lady, he said. However, you need not be concerned with any of that. You have a family who loves you, and they are hoping and praying for your safe return. She did not want to hear a word, Darcy said. His every attempt at reason over the course of nearly a quarter of an hour, she rebuffed with vehement protests that she was indeed safe and happy. 
All this she continued doing even after Wickham commenced rallying his former friend's cause by letting Lydia know he wanted her gone. As much as Darcy wanted to be of service to Elizabeth's family, the last thing in the world he wanted was to do Wickham's bidding in the process. Of course, Wickham wants the young woman to disappear from his life now that she is of no use to him, Darcy surmised. That way, he will be free to prey on another young woman. Darcy silently assessed the situation. Wickham was desperate to be rid of a young girl who was determined to cling to his side. I can make something out of this. Chapter 19 Its Inconveniences A fortnight thereafter, Elizabeth stood in St. Clement's, the church in which the fateful wedding was to take place, with Mrs. Gardner and Lydia, the latter dressed in white. Elizabeth rightfully supposed she had Mr. Darcy to thank for their being there, and for that she was glad. However, she had scarcely seen him since he delivered her to the Gardner's home. She could not blame him. Why on earth would such a man want to attach himself to a family marred by scandal? Even if the Bennets were not heavily embroiled in disgrace, her family was decidedly beneath Mr. Darcy's in consequence. It was one thing for him to look past her family's lack of fortune and want of connections, but even her family's oldest friends had reportedly turned their backs on them, according to Jane's account in her most recent letter from Longbourn. Today's event is merely the first step on the steep climb towards respectability, Elizabeth thought to herself. Soon I shall be eternally tied to Mr. Wickham, the man whom Mr. Darcy warned me against. Had I been open with my family as Mr. Darcy insisted, we might have avoided all this. Had I not courted pride and prepossession, my youngest sister might not be on the verge of marrying a man who neither loves nor respects her. What is more, Wickham's shameful deed has unearthed alarming accounts of the actual extent of his weak character, for he is reported to be a gambler who has amassed significant debts in his wake. Oh, for so long I touted Wickham as one of the best men I knew. I, who fancied myself a studier of character, a master of discernment. Do I even know myself? Sensing her dearest aunt had done her very best in trying to tame Lydia's wild spirits, Elizabeth admonished her sister, who refused to accept the reasons put forth as to why her mother, her father, and her other sisters were not attending the ceremony. Suffering under the heavy burden of what Lydia had done, and the shame for his own part in allowing her to do it, Mr. Bennet took his leave of town soon after his youngest daughter was discovered and returned to the gardener's home. Whatever had been the extent of her father's involvement with Mr. Darcy, Elizabeth could not say, for the gentlemen had been wont to seclude themselves inside the confines of her uncle's study and to keep the business to themselves after they emerged. As for the matter of her mother and sisters travelling to town to celebrate the sordid, hastily arranged affair that had threatened to ruin them in the eyes of society, Mr. Bennet simply would not sanction it. La, oh, I wish you and Aunt Gardner would stop preaching to me as though you were giving a sermon. That is all the two of you have done for the past two weeks. Not once did either of you consider that I might wish to spend my last days and nights as a single woman having fun. No, the two of you have kept me hidden away as though I were a prisoner. Not one party or scheme or anything. I should have much preferred to have been with my dear Wickham. Lizzie, you cannot imagine all the fun I had when he and I were together, just the two of us. Pray, Lydia, remember yourself, Elizabeth scolded. The least you might attempt to do is exercise proper decorum inside the walls of the church. Oh, bother! You are no fun at all. Lydia clasped her hands to her chest. Oh, I can hardly wait until I am once again in my dear Wickham's arms. As though aware the appointed hour for the ceremony was drawing near, she cried, I shall be Mrs. Lydia Wickham in no time at all. I cannot imagine what must be keeping him. I can hardly wait to see him. I do hope he will be wearing his blue coat. Lizzie, be a dear and find out if my Wickham has arrived. I will not. Elizabeth exclaimed with energy. Oh, Lizzie, you are no fun at all, she huffed. Oh, is there any wonder? 
No doubt you are simply jealous because Wickham is marrying me and not you, for I stole him from you. And here I was planning to make amends by telling you exactly what you must do to capture a husband of your own. I am grateful to be spared your generosity, cried Elizabeth, for I do not particularly like your way of getting husbands. A knock at the door signalled it was time for the bride to take her place at the altar. It was all Elizabeth and her aunt could do to tame Lydia's enthusiasm and persuade her to show a decent measure of decorum. Moments later, the uneasiness of this being Elizabeth's first time seeing George Wickham since saying goodbye to him in Hertfordshire so many months ago was nothing at all in comparison with the surprise in espying the gentleman standing next to him. Mr. Darcy! Soon enough, the deed was done. If asked, Elizabeth would have been unable to recall a single moment of what had transpired. Her mind was busily engaged with one question. Why is Mr. Darcy standing up for Wickham? Shortly after the ceremony, Elizabeth was standing away from her aunt and her younger sister, watching in disgust as the latter proudly flaunted her gaudy ring before the former. She was roused from her reflections by someone's approach. Before she could escape, Wickham stood directly before her. He bowed slightly. You cannot possibly know how much it means to me that you are here. I do not think I presume too much in saying that you and I were good friends before I went away to Brighton and you went away to Kent. I should like to think we are even better friends now that we are brother and sister, Elizabeth. She opened her eyes wide in being addressed so intimately. Surely you do not object to my referring to you by your given name. Perchance you would rather I call you Lizzie. I do not mind telling you how much I have longed to hear you address me by my given name. You may address me in any manner you wish, Mr. Wickham. It is, as you say, after all, true that we are to be forever bound to each other as brother and sister. He took Elizabeth by the hand, and in spite of her subtle attempts to jerk it away without causing a spectacle, the man would not let go. He raised it to his lips, at which point she did manage to evade the touch of his lips against her skin. It sickened her that she had at one time admired this man, that she had at one time welcomed such a gesture. Intending to recover from her rebuff, he stood straight and tall and clutched his hands behind his back. I take it that you enjoyed a lovely visit with your intimate friend, Mrs. Collins. Feigning a polite smile, she answered in the affirmative. No doubt your visit could not have been without its inconveniences. In what manner, sir? Elizabeth asked, her brow arched. I am not unaware of your history with her husband. Mr. Collins is, after all, my cousin, and thus there is no escaping spending time in his company. I do not need to remind you that one cannot always pick one's relations. True, true. Wickham looked around again before continuing his unwelcome discourse. No doubt your time in that part of the country afforded ample opportunity for you to get acquainted with my old friend as well. I take it that you are referring to Mr. Darcy? Indeed, he replied, biting his lip. He has always been there for me during those times when I needed him most. I did have the opportunity to make Mr. Darcy's acquaintance, and not once did I get the impression that the two of you were friends. I posit a friendship like ours, born out of years of living together and playing together for the better part of one's life, does not fade, regardless of the passage of time or whatever ill will may have resulted upon the chance occasion or two. Indeed, I rely upon it. Wickham looked about to see who was standing in their general vicinity. Seeing that no one else was close by, he returned his eyes to Elizabeth. Indeed, Darcy has been there at times when I needed him most, especially of late, as he very well should have. How do you suppose such a thing? Elizabeth inquired with energy, thereby interrupting whatever falsehood he was about to put forth. He shrugged nonchalantly. It is simple. If Darcy had not acted out of malice, dare I say jealousy, and denied me the living in Kimpton that his late father intended for me, I should never have required his assistance from the start. Elizabeth looked at Wickham incredulously. 
Does he blame Mr. Darcy for all his misfortunes? Oh, the audacity of this man. No doubt reading the scepticism in her face, he leaned a bit closer. When the two of you were in Kent, Darcy did tell you that I was old Mr. Darcy's godson, did he not? Indeed, he told me that you were his father's godson. He told me a number of things pertaining to you, as did his aunt, Lady Catherine, and his cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam. Wickham huffed. <laughs> I can only imagine what his lofty relations may have said. My experience with the Fitzwilliam family is that they always tended to be of one mind, especially as regarded opposing those whom they deem beneath them in consequence. Elizabeth had been keeping an eye out for Mr. Darcy, hoping for a chance to speak with him privately after being denied any such opportunity since he brought her to Cheapside. She knew enough from Lydia to know the extent of his involvement in the latter's return to the gardener's home, but how much he was concerned in succeeding events she could not say. Her uncle had been particularly guarded as regarded such specifics, and Elizabeth, grateful for her uncle's sacrifices, did not intend to press for details he made such an effort not to confide. Wishing to escape her new brother's company without being rude, Elizabeth allowed her eyes to wander where she last despite Mr. Darcy speaking with her uncle. Mr. Gardiner was still standing there, but not Mr. Darcy. Her heart leapt from her chest. She looked throughout the room in search for him, but it was all in vain. All thoughts of civility escaped her, and Elizabeth walked away from Wickham and hastened out of the church door and down the steps. It was no use. Mr. Darcy was gone. A sinking feeling overcame her. Oh, have I lost the good opinion of the one man whose opinion matters most to me? The one man who might have meant something to me? Her happiest memories of being with Mr. Darcy flashed before her mind. She was certain that when they were together in Kent, he looked at her with the deepest of affection. Today, he barely looked at me at all. Something deep inside urged her to scream aloud at the injustice of it all, that Lydia should be parading about inside the church professing herself the happiest and the luckiest woman in all of England after all the trouble she had caused, that I should be standing here alone and wondering if I shall ever see Mr. Darcy again. Alone on the street, an overwhelming desire to get away from the turmoil of the past weeks swept over Elizabeth. I miss my dearest sister Jane. I long for the comfort of being at home, surrounded by my own things. I must return to Longbourn. Chapter 20 This Particular Matter Darcy had just quit a shop on a crowded Mayfair street and was about to ascend his waiting carriage when the tiny hairs on the back of his neck stood on end. He shook his head. Where have I seen that gentleman before? Then he remembered. This was the same gentleman he had seen at Mrs. Young's establishment some weeks ago. Then a more harrowing remembrance flashed in his mind. That is the same gentleman I saw at Rosings. At the time, he had thought it unfathomable that his aunt had condescended to admit such a person into her home. Upon his questioning her, she had responded, until you and Anne are united in holy matrimony, you must not concern yourself with the comings and goings in my home, nephew. What were the odds that the same person who called on his aunt weeks ago was also one of Mrs. Young's patrons? Mrs. Young, the very same woman who had been involved in the Wickham affair when she made it possible for my sister to be taken in by him. What was Lady Catherine's purpose in receiving such a man? It dawned on him that if this man knew Mrs. Young, chances were he also knew George Wickham. He racked his brain, silently deliberating how any of this might tie in with his aunt. She knew Wickham, of course, as a consequence of his having been reared at Pemberley, where she often visited when Darcy's mother, Lady Anne, was alive. Lady Catherine also knew that Wickham was a favourite of Elizabeth's. In fact, she had gone so far as to warn Elizabeth against the man. A sickening feeling crept over him. He could not believe the thoughts he was thinking. He would not believe them. My aunt likes to have her own way well enough, 
But surely she could not be so evil, so determined, that she would put forth a scheme that might ruin an entire family's reputation just so she could put Elizabeth out of my reach. As doubt gave way to certainty, rage etched across his countenance. How dare she? Hours later, Darcy sat in his study, the tumult in his mind a striking contrast to his stately surroundings. Just when he thought he had rid himself of his old friend, seeing that stranger earlier that morning brought the events of the past weeks crashing back to the forefront of his mind. The appalling spectacle of George Wickham kowtowing to the gardeners after the wedding ceremony, combined with the open manner in which they seemingly embraced that scoundrel, haunted Darcy still. His disgust was increased by every review of it. Upon his last consideration of the troubling events, however, he realised he should not have been surprised. From what he had surmised of Elizabeth's London relations over the short span of their mutual acquaintance, such behaviour was exactly what was to be expected of them. For better or worse, Wickham was forever and irrevocably connected to them. He was family. They were simply making the best of the situation. Seeing Elizabeth engaged in such civil discourse with Wickham was another thing altogether. Darcy did not like it one bit. That he had been the principal person who had provided the means of putting Wickham once again in Elizabeth's path only made matters worse. I suppose I might have remained in the church a while longer, long enough to secure a private audience with Elizabeth, to apologise for employing such measures to save her family's reputation from ruin. In time she will understand. I will see to it that she does. Even though Darcy had been in frequent contact with Mr. Gardner over the course of the past weeks, rarely had he had an opportunity to do anything other than exchange brief pleasantries with Elizabeth during such times. Since he made arrangements with her relations to bring Lydia to their Cheapside home to stay until the marriage took place, Lydia was always by Elizabeth's side. Darcy could not tolerate that silly girl, and he certainly did not intend to expose his sister to her. At least Georgiana was sensible enough to regret her conduct where Wickham was concerned. Lydia proved wholly incapable of such feelings of remorse. It is one thing to say that I did not intend for Georgiana to be exposed to Elizabeth's youngest sister before. But what of the future? Having overcome all the scruples that would argue against connecting himself with a family so decidedly beneath his own had not been easy, but he had done it. Now that I have decided that Elizabeth is the only woman I will ever love, the only woman with whom I wish to spend my life, I do not dare throw away the future that ought to be mine because of the Wickhams. I cannot and I shall not. As his own master, Darcy answered to no one other than himself. As Georgiana's co-guardian, he was the one who ultimately decided what was best for her, with or without the consent of his cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam his young sister's other guardian. This particular matter is entirely different. After everything that has happened, my sister ought to decide her own fate as regards George Wickham. Thus resolved, Darcy knew what he must do. Standing, he stretched his long legs, a welcome relief after sitting in one attitude for so long, and he went in search of his sister. Georgiana, I wish to have a word with you said Darcy, upon entering her room. He had crafted and carefully rehearsed his speech all the way up the stairs, but seeing her sitting in the window seat as contented as he had ever recalled seeing her of late, he grew uncertain of what he was about to say. He sat down for a few moments and then, getting up, walked about the room. Brother, the young lady began, have I done something to displease you? The genuine concern in her voice recalled him to his purpose in being there. No, of course not, dearest Georgiana. He went directly to where she sat. She made room for him to sit beside her. After a silence of several moments, he said, I have a matter I wish to discuss with you, and I am trying to decide where to begin. In such cases as this, it is always best to start at the beginning. Do you not agree? He smiled a little but only as a measure of reassurance for his sister's benefit. There was nothing at all pleasant in what he needed to say. I will do my best. 
You know all too well that Miss Elizabeth's youngest sister ran away with George Wickham. Yes. I am also aware that the young lady has since been reunited with her family, for you told me as such already. Indeed, indeed, Darcy repeated. However, there is more to the story than that. The fact is that, for reasons I do not wish to discuss, the only true solution to that debacle was for Wickham and the young lady to be married. What is more, I am the one who provided the means for bringing the marriage about. Georgiana's astonishment in hearing this was beyond expression. She stared, coloured, and was silent. It was the only thing I could do to save the Bennet family's reputation from ruin. I know how much you care for Miss Elizabeth, brother, but I more than care for her. The fact is I love her, and I intend to do everything in my power to make her my wife. As for the Wickhams, what is done is done. I will not allow this to cost me the woman who means so much to me, but I am obliged to see that you have every possible chance to escape such a connection if you so desire. The young woman's countenance paled. What are you suggesting, brother? Do you mean to send me away? she cried. No, not send you away. But perhaps you might choose to live with our uncle and aunt, Lord and Lady Matlock. You must know that nothing would bring our aunt greater pleasure. You will be enjoying your first season in a year or so. You are sure to attract the notice of some of the most eligible gentlemen of the tone. You deserve nothing less. No, I do not want to live with our aunt and uncle. I have always wanted a sister. And now, when such a possibility is about to unfold, I do not wish to give it up out of fear of what others may think or say, and I surely will not give it up because of a possible connection with a man whom I have known all my life. Even if he had not committed such a horrendous offence, the connection would always be there. Exiled or not, Mr. Wickham will always be of Pemberley. Darcy put his arms around his sister and drew her closer. The two of them had endured so much hardship throughout the years, first the loss of their mother, and later on their beloved father. In ways that only they comprehended, it was solely the two of them. God willing, all of that would soon change should he and Elizabeth marry. It meant the world to him that his sister wished for such an outcome too, and even more that she wanted to be part of it. At length Georgiana said, when do you plan to see Miss Elizabeth again? I have every intention of going to Hertfordshire and staying there for so long as it takes to win Miss Elizabeth's hand. But first I must travel to Kent. I shall leave as soon as the necessary arrangements are made. Are you going to speak with Cousin Anne? Darcy did not imagine he could escape such a prospect, even though it ought not to come as a surprise to Anne, as he had already told her that the two of them would never be wed. Speaking to his cousin was the least of his concerns. In truth, I owe our aunt a visit. Why is visiting our aunt in Kent more urgent than calling on Miss Elizabeth in Hertfordshire? For the sake of family harmony, I pray you never find out. The next day, Darcy sat across from his aunt in the parlour at Rosings, with one long leg crossed over the other. He declined his aunt's offer of refreshments. He further advised her that she should spare the servants the task of preparing his usual apartment, for he did not intend to be in Kent very long. What do you mean you do not intend to stay in Kent very long? Why come here at all if your plan is simply to pass through? You can have no surprise as to the purpose of my being here. Your heart, your own conscience must tell you why. That is, supposing you even have a heart. As you are living and breathing, I am obliged to say you do. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have no sense of right and wrong. I shall not abide your impertinence, nephew. What is the meaning of all this? Trust me, Lady Catherine, I am far more generous towards you than I ought to be. <laughs> I see your association with Miss Elizabeth Bennet has made you forget what is owed to me as your elder, your aunt, your late mother's only sister, and your future mother-in-law. And that is the point, is it not? 
that is truly the only thing that matters to you, and you would destroy anything or anyone who stands in your way. I shall not deny your assertion, Lady Catherine proudly declared. I am not in the habit of brooking disappointment. But to destroy an innocent family, to subject them to misery and the ridicule of those who would be their friends and neighbours, have you no shame? I shall not defend myself against unspoken charges, nephew. What is it that you are accusing me of? Do you deny that you crafted a scheme to ruin the Bennet family's good name? Lady Catherine huffed in disdain. <laughs> good name? The Bennet family? I am sure they do not deserve the words. What is so good about a family that is so far beneath our own in consequence? A family that would see its youngest off to chase after grown men in the militia. Another who would presume to rise above her station in life and entertain the hope of one day being included in a family as noble and honourable as ours? If you think for one instance that what you have done will be the means of destroying my good opinion of the only woman I have ever loved, you are sadly mistaken. You are free to love her all you wish but she will never have what ought to be my daughter's. The Bennet family is ruined. Were you to align yourself with such disgraceful people, you too would be ruined. You would be censured, slighted, and despised by everyone connected with you. Your alliance would be a disgrace. Your name would never again be mentioned by any of us. Those would be heavy misfortunes indeed. But with the woman that I love as my wife, the mistress of my home, and the mother of my children, on the whole, I would have no cause to repine. That young woman will never be your wife, Lady Catherine exclaimed with energy. If you are so much in love with her as you suggest, then take her as your mistress. Set her up in her own establishment in town. Beget a household of bastards whose mother's family shame will far outweigh the stain of their illegitimacy. Surely Anne will look askance to such an arrangement. That is the way of our world. It is not my way, nor will it ever be. I wager time will tell another story. You may, in a moment of weakness, have been drawn in by that woman's arts and allurements. In time, you will wake up from your lust-fueled infatuation and remember what you are about. You will then thank me for what I have done. Regardless of the outcome of all this, I will never thank you. You can be assured of that. Your marriage to my daughter shall be all the thanks I need. I will marry Miss Elizabeth Bennet, or I will not marry at all. Then you are determined to have her? You are determined to marry a woman whose youngest sister patrols the London streets at night in search of the highest bidder? You cannot be serious, Lady Catherine cried. The proud aristocrat continued, If you will not think of what such shame-ridden connections would mean for yourself, then think of the great harm to your own unmarried sister. Have you no concerns for Georgiana's marital prospects? Why, with the Fitzwilliam family's noble name and the Darcy fortune, she might have her choice of any eligible young man in England, a young lord, an earl, even a duke. Such promising prospects would mean nothing were she in any way connected to that Bennet family, and you know it. Georgiana's future is none of your concern. That said, I would not be congratulating myself so soon if I were you. Your plan was not so well thought out as you supposed, regardless of how much money you settled on that wretched George Wickham. Her ladyship's astonishment was evident, but she said nothing. Darcy continued, Wickham and young Miss Lydia Bennet have been discovered. They are married, rendering moot the circumstances that led them to the altar. In other words, the scandal is averted. That is impossible! That girl is ruined by virtue of having lived in sin with a man who was not her husband. There was no reason in the world that he should have married her. What could possibly have tempted him? I shall leave it to you to ferret out the details of your failed scheme. I will only say this. Now that this matter is settled, I shall go to Miss Elizabeth. I will court her, I will win her heart, and I will ask her to be my wife. God willing, she will accept my hand, even if it does mean a familial connection with the likes of you.
Darcy stood in preparation to quit the room. I shall leave you with this, aunt. Heaven help you, should you do anything at all to stand in my way. The elderly aristocrat was highly incensed. How dare you threaten me, Darcy? What is it that you think you can do? Trust me, Lady Catherine, you do not want to find out. Chapter 21 Promising News Longbourn Village The business of Mrs. Bennet's life was marrying off her daughters. The near disaster that led to her youngest daughter's current marital felicity did not diminish her enthusiasm one bit. Rather, it bolstered her resolve. Who knew a daughter could be married with so little trouble to herself, and all that it required was merely sending her away to visit with friends? Indeed, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise that the militia encamped just outside of Meryton the year before. Now it seemed that fate was once again on the lady's side. The good people of Meryton had heard rumours that a single gentleman of large fortune had come from London to look at the Netherfield Park estate. Matchmaking mothers from near and far entertained hopes that he would marry one of their single daughters. This was especially true of Mrs. Bennet, for what did she live for if not to make advantageous matches for her girls? With Lydia out of the way she had only to secure husbands for the remaining three, four if she counted Elizabeth. Mrs. Bennet still wore her disappointment that her second daughter had spurned the hand of the heir of Longbourn as a badge of her suffering. As a consequence, Elizabeth was on her own so far as finding a husband was concerned. Now armed with the most promising news that the neighbouring estate had been let after sitting vacant for what had seemed like an eternity, her spirits could hardly be contained. The excitable woman who had once known more than her fair share of beauty looked intently at her husband. Have you heard the news, Mr. Bennet? What news is that? he asked in reply to his lady, not bothering to look up from his paper. Netherfield Park has been let at last. Mr. Bennet made no answer. Do you not want to know who has taken it? cried his wife impatiently. Widely perceived as an odd mixture of quick parts, sarcastic humour, reserve and caprice, he replied, You want to tell me, and I have no objection to hearing it. With the unfortunate business of his youngest daughter's elopement behind him, the gentleman was slowly returning to form. For Mrs. Bennet's part, her husband's reply was invitation enough to share all that she knew of the particulars. Why, my dear Mr. Bennet, Mrs. Long, who was just here not very long ago, says that Netherfield is taken by a young man of large fortune from the north of England. Mr. and Mrs. Bennet went on and on in that manner for some time, quite unaware that they had attracted an audience. Elizabeth's sister Kitty was standing just outside the door. Her spirits considerably recovered now that her favourite sister Lydia was safe and happily married. Mary, the third Bennet daughter, approached her. Kitty, what are you doing? You know better than to eavesdrop. Oh, hush, Kitty whispered, a single finger pressed to her lips. She waved her older sister over to the door, silently encouraging Mary to listen too. I will not, said Mary, pushing her spectacles against her face. Listening to conversations meant to be private is wrong. It is just the sort of thing Lydia would do. Come away from the door. Kitty hushed her sister again. Well, if you will not join me, then you must at least be quiet so I can hear. Elizabeth and Jane, who were returning from their walk in the garden, handed their bonnets to a servant. Seeing their sisters, one standing with her ear pressed to the door trying to hear what she could hear, and the other looking on with a scowl on her face, they stopped. Jane, a lovely creature with golden hair and expressive blue eyes, said, Kitty! She bestowed a look of admonishment that the younger girl understood quite well. Kitty shook her head in surrender and tore herself away from the door. She seized Jane's arm and then commenced coaxing her into the vacant room across the hall. Elizabeth and Mary were obliged to follow to see what had caused their young sister such enthusiasm. Oh, Jane, you will never guess what I found out. Kitty, you know you should not have been listening at the door like that. Oh, never mind all that. If I had not been passing when I did, I would not be privy to such happy news. What is it? Elizabeth exclaimed with energy. 
for after the months they had endured, a measure of good news was long overdue. Even Mary's curiosity could no longer be curbed. Mamma told Papa that an exceedingly rich gentleman who hails from Derbyshire will soon be a new addition to our society. <laughs> a single gentleman who has over ten thousand pounds a year. <gasps> he is coming with his friend who has over five thousand pounds a year, for he is the one who let Netherfield Park. She spun around in joy. Oh, Jane, Elizabeth, Mary! she exclaimed with unbridled enthusiasm. Do none of you know what this means? Elizabeth's heartbeat raced. She knew precisely what Kitty's news meant. A single gentleman who hails from Derbyshire, who has over ten thousand pounds. Feeling a bit light-headed, she drifted away from her sisters and braced herself against the wall. She placed her hand on her breast. Mr. Darcy! Seeing this, Jane left Kitty to share her view of what all this meant with Mary, while she rushed to where Elizabeth stood. Lizzy, she said, her voice filled with concern. She placed her hand on her sister's shoulder. Are you all right? You look ill. Elizabeth took her sister's hand in hers and squeezed it affectionately. Oh, Jane, you will recall my telling you about the gentleman whose acquaintance I made while in Kent. Mr. Darcy, Jane replied, shaking her head. How might I fail to remember, given the frequent mentioning of him in all your letters? Elizabeth nodded. Then you will recall my writing that Mr. Darcy's home is in Derbyshire. I frequently heard it cited by Mr. Collins that Mr. Darcy has over ten thousand pounds a year. What are the odds that the gentleman whom Kitty spoke of just now is not Mr. Darcy? Jane's happiness for her sister etched across her angelic countenance. <gasps> Oh, Lizzie, can this mean what I think it means? Jane, said Elizabeth slowly, drifting towards a window to peer outside into the distance. I am not certain what this means. Chapter 22 Above His Company One morning, when the Longbourn ladies were sitting in the drawing room, Kitty walked over to the window and peered outside. It had become her favourite pastime with Lydia gone and no one to walk with her to Meryton each day. What she espied was cause for excitement. Look, Mamma, we are about to receive gentlemen callers. Mrs. Bennet dropped her sewing and hastened over to the window. Elizabeth was curious to know whom they were to entertain that morning as well, and she got up and went to the window too. It is Mr. Darcy, she exclaimed with more energy than she had otherwise intended. Oh, why, Lizzy, do you know one of those gentlemen? begged Mrs. Bennet. Elizabeth had scarcely time to fashion an apt response before their arrival was announced by the doorbell, and shortly afterward the gentleman walked into the room. As pleased as Mrs. Bennet was by the prospect, the same could not be said of Elizabeth. Shocked was what she was. Recalling the disgusted look on his face during the Wickham's wedding and the unceremonious manner of his subsequent leave-taking, she had taught herself to believe she would never lay eyes on him again. Yet here he is at Longbourn, the last place in the world I might have expected to see him. She took some comfort in the notion of his being there at that particular moment in time. Having formed an initial acquaintance with her family during a period when the worst possible examples of the lack of proper decorum had been on full display, Mr. Darcy could have no reason to object to the remainder of Elizabeth's Longbourn relations. She whispered a silent prayer of thanks that the Wickhams had taken their leave of Hertfordshire after visiting Longbourn for a fortnight, despite Mr. Collins's strong advice that her father should turn them away. By now, those two were far away in Newcastle, where they could not harm anyone. Elizabeth had taken some consolation in the fact that Lydia's behaviour had awakened Mr. Bennet to the necessity of reining in the high spirits of his daughter Kitty while there was still time. Mary, who fancied herself pious and bookish, needed no such governing, but her father adopted a similarly stern attitude with her as well. Adhering to all the usual modes of proper etiquette and decorum, Elizabeth and Darcy each made the requisite introductions in their turn, and soon everyone took a seat. Elizabeth's busy mind bustled with conjecture and wonder. 
She knew Mr. Darcy could be taciturn, but she did not expect it to be to this extent. After having made a slight observation on the house and garden to Mrs. Bennet, he sat for a time without speaking to anyone, including Elizabeth. Thank heavens for his friend, Mr. Charles Bingley. Mr. Bingley was good-looking and gentlemanlike. He had a pleasant countenance and easy, unaffected manners. Equally important, the young man, who looked to be around four-and-twenty, entered readily into conversation with the ease of a long-time acquaintance. She could tell straight away that he would be a favourite, particularly of her mother's. As for Mr. Darcy's part, Elizabeth did not know what to make of his reticence. He had been far livelier when he first met the gardeners, and that had been an unhappy occasion. Not content to allow him to escape the usual courtesies expected of one's guests entirely, she said, How is your sister, Mr. Darcy? Georgiana is very well, Miss Elizabeth, Darcy replied. Does she remain in town? He nodded almost imperceptibly. Yes, she does. After pausing for a moment or two, he added, She asked me to extend compliments on her behalf. As both were fully cognizant of what had transpired when the two ladies were last together, the subject was pursued no further. Elizabeth decided to leave her taciturn acquaintance alone with his thoughts. If there was anything more to be said, he ought to be the one to make the start. Her attention was soon captured by his friend, specifically the manner in which he regarded Jane. The young man's every look of admiration was bestowed tenderly upon Jane. His every sentence was spoken as though uttered only for her ears. After a half hour or so, even Mr. Bingley appeared at a loss for conversation. This suited Mrs. Bennet exceedingly well. Though sometimes described as a woman of mean understanding, she possessed the eye of an eagle and the cunning of a fox when it came to finding potential suitors for her daughters. She, too, had paid attention to Mr. Bingley's fascination with her eldest daughter. It is a very lovely day for a walk, Mrs. Bennet began. The view from Oakham Mount is spectacular. Jane, you and your sisters ought to accompany our gentlemen callers there. Mr. Bingley tore his eyes away from Jane. Clearing his throat, he said, <clears throat> I should be delighted to see more of the countryside. He then looked at Darcy. Uh, however, I am afraid I must decline on both our parts. Perhaps another time. I know my friend is eager to be away to London. Are you not, Darcy? Taken by surprise, Elizabeth said, You are leaving so soon, sir? His eyes filled with a silent apology intended solely for Elizabeth's benefit, Darcy said. Yes, I am expected in town for a family engagement. Elizabeth's ensuing disappointment was short-lived, replaced instead by an increasing level of discomfort mixed with embarrassment on her sister Jane's behalf owing to their mother's unabashed matchmaking attempts. Oh, but surely you are at liberty to accept an invitation to take a family dinner here at Longbourn, Mr. Bingley, Mrs. Bennet interjected. I shall be sure to instruct Cook to prepare all of your favourites. The scheming matriarch always kept a very good table. Hence Elizabeth was not at all surprised that her mother would take every possible opportunity to impress the young man on whom she had such anxious designs for her eldest daughter by way of his stomach. Mr. Bingley shook his head. In truth, I am obliged to return to town as well to accompany my friend. Oh, pray you will come back in time for the assembly in Meryton. It will be an excellent way to meet all your new neighbours at one time. Mr. Bingley smiled. Indeed, I do plan to attend the assembly. Here the young man paused and gazed at Jane. I would not miss it for the world. After the gentleman had quit the house, Mrs. Bennet rushed to the window. Standing there, watching in wonder as they walked away, she called her second eldest daughter to her side. How well do you know Mr. Darcy, Lizzie? Elizabeth replied that they had formed an acquaintance when she was away in the spring. She went on to elaborate on those details of said acquaintance that she considered her mother ought to know. So, Mr. Darcy is Lady Catherine de Bourgh's nephew? Mrs. Bennet declared. That must certainly explain his being here. He must have called on us as a courtesy to his aunt. Oh, I understand she took prodigious care of you while you were there. She huffed knowingly. 
So that gentleman is of nobility. Pray what does that signify, Mamma? She shrugged. It matters not one bit to me. Why, he is nothing at all like his amiable friend, Mr. Bingley. Spinning round on her heels to retire upstairs, she said, Pray Mr. Bingley will one day buy Netherfield Park, affording us many opportunities for his company. Oh, as for his friend, oh, the tall, proud Mr. Darcy, whom I strongly suspect regards himself as far above his company wherever he goes, I shall not be the least bit disappointed if I never lay eyes on him again. Chapter 23 Recipe for Love an unanticipated delay in returning to Hertfordshire from town prevented Darcy and Elizabeth from seeing each other again until the evening of the Meryton Assembly. When the gentleman walked into the room, a sigh of relief spread over the crowd, for instead of upwards of six ladies accompanying them, as had been widely speculated and circulated before their arrival, there were only two ladies and one other gentleman, thus bringing the Netherfield party to a total of only five. The eager young ladies in the crowd were delighted even more upon learning that the two women were Mr. Bingley's sisters. The third gentleman was his brother-in-law, Mr. Hurst. His sisters were fine women, with an air of decided fashion. Those who were wont to notice such things attested to the fact that the younger-looking of the two scarcely allowed herself to be drawn away from Mr. Darcy's side. It was quickly decided that between Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley, the latter bore the most amiable countenance. Mr. Darcy, however, drew the greater share of the attention of the room by his fine, tall person, handsome features, noble mien, and the report, which was in general circulation within five minutes of his entrance, of his having ten thousand a year. Elizabeth was rather dismayed. What a woefully insufficient measure of such a man as Mr. Darcy, when she knew him to be worthy of admiration for reasons having nothing at all to do with any of those things. Seeing the manner in which the younger Bingley sister attached herself to Mr. Darcy meant nothing to her. That young woman might as well be his cousin Anne de Burgh, Elizabeth considered, as she sat out the dance, watching the two of them move through the crowd. He barely even looked at his dance partner who, on the other hand, could not tear her thirsty eyes away from him. This was the first time that Elizabeth had ever had the pleasure of seeing Mr. Darcy dance. His air on the dance floor was everything a gentleman's air ought to be. With what grace did he move, his noble lineage on full display? Purposely tearing her own eyes away from him, she commenced scanning the dance floor in admiration of the other couples. Elizabeth espied her dearest sister Jane dancing with Mr. Bingley. What a pleasing prospect, she thought. If ever there existed a gentleman who was perfect for her sister, it was Charles Bingley. True enough, she had only been in company with the gentleman that one time when he called at Longbourn with Mr. Darcy. In Elizabeth's estimation, Mr. Bingley was almost identical in temperament as well as understanding to Jane. What better recipe for love? She reflected on her own love life, or rather lack thereof. She supposed it could have been merely a coincidence that one of Mr. Darcy's closest friends, the one whom he had spoken of when they were together in Kent, she rather surmised, happened to let the estate neighbouring her father's, and that Mr. Darcy was in Hertfordshire solely for the purpose of serving his friend in his new role as master of such a large property. Anything was possible. But what if Mr. Darcy's being here is no coincidence at all? She knew enough about him to know of his wand to manage things for his own convenience. I refuse to squander another moment on conjecture. I shall see how he behaves, and then I will know what to think. Upon the completion of the dances with Miss Bingley, Darcy approached Elizabeth to claim her hand. She took her place opposite him on the assembly floor, all the while doing her best to avoid her neighbour's looks of amazement that he had singled her out from among the crowd of eligible young ladies in want of dance partners. As this was the first time she had ever danced with him, she did not intend to waste a single moment in polite silence. You are aware, sir, that you have created quite a stir by inviting the sister of a fallen woman to stand opposite you, she said when the dance allowed. I feel most fortunate to be dancing with the handsomest woman in the room. 
They were then separated by the dance, a welcome reprieve for Elizabeth, for she had not expected him to be so bold. When they were reunited, he said, It is a pleasure I wish to indulge in this evening as much as decorum will allow. Elizabeth coloured. She almost missed a step. After a slight pause, she said, Your first dance partner was very lovely. He smiled in confirmation. He said nothing. Is she a close acquaintance? Darcy gave her a look, and once again they were parted. Elizabeth really needed this reprieve. What must he think of my impertinence? You amaze me, Miss Elizabeth, he said, when they were united once more. Sir? I have long appreciated the liveliness of your mind. However, I am surprised by this particular side of you. Do you talk by rule while you are dancing? Sometimes. I believe one must speak a little, for it would look odd to be entirely silent for half an hour together. However, if you would prefer silence, then I shall do my best to hold my tongue. By all means, feel free to speak to your heart's content. I would by no means wish to suspend any pleasure of yours. Elizabeth made no answer, and they were again silent till they had gone down the dance. It being her turn to say something, she remarked on her enjoyment of balls and assemblies, and she asked him which of the two he preferred. I hope you will not be disappointed to learn that I would rather avoid both. Dancing is one particular pastime I am wont to eschew whenever I can help it. But you dance so well, she exclaimed with energy. That is to say, you are a very accomplished dancer. Accomplished, you say? I do not know that I have ever been described as such, at least not on the dance floor. Tiny chill bumps spread over her body at the way he looked at her when speaking those words. Their time at the temple immediately sprang to mind, for it was then that she had seen that same look in his eyes. If she were to live to be a hundred years old, she would never forget that look, nor would she forget the way her body stirred in its wake. They were separated once more, and Elizabeth reminded herself to breathe. By the time they reunited, Mr. Darcy's expression had undergone a decided change. Are you happy to be here, Mr. Darcy? I am. Why do you ask such a thing? Your countenance is quite stern. Indeed, he seemed very much the aloof, taciturn gentleman she had first believed him to be. I can only imagine what your thoughts portend. You are probably asking yourself how it is that you find yourself at such an assembly as this, she said. You mistake me, Miss Elizabeth. I assure you that my mind is very agreeably engaged, despite my stern, as you so described it, countenance. Subtly biting his lip, he added, How might it be otherwise when I am dancing with you? Elizabeth arched her brow a little at this. Her spirits rising to playfulness, she said, Oh, but you told me you do not like dancing. I trust you will forgive me for saying that, for I believe I spoke too hastily. I am now given to understand that I simply never had the right dance partner. That is to say, until now. Elizabeth had seen such varying aspects in Mr. Darcy's character since first laying eyes on him in Kent. At times she was wont to admit that the gentleman puzzled her exceedingly. One thing was certain, she liked him very much, and especially when he flattered her ego so well as he did that evening. Their teasing banter did not abate for the rest of the dance, and Elizabeth could hardly wait for their next set. No sooner was the dance over than Miss Bingley raced across the room and laced her arm through Mr. Darcy's. Not wishing for an introduction to Elizabeth, the overly zealous young lady said, Come, Mr. Darcy, I am desperately in need of refreshment, and I require your assistance to navigate through this throng of merrymakers. He gave Elizabeth an apologetic look. Until our next dance, Miss Elizabeth. When Miss Bingley felt she and the gentleman were safe, she said, Mr. Darcy, if I did not know you so well as I do... I would suppose you were quite taken with your dance partner. I have never known you to be so at ease with a perfect stranger. I posit you do not know me so well as you think, Miss Bingley. Not know you, sir? Surely you mean to tease me. You are my brother's best friend. 
I have long considered the two of us as very good, dare I say, intimate friends as well. Here she paused and battered her eyelashes at him. I cannot tell you how pleased I was when my brother informed me that you had the ideal country estate in mind for him, and how you would spend time helping him navigate the ins and outs of its management. What an excellent time we shall have, even if Charles is determined to associate with the likes of these people. No doubt he will extend an invitation to each and every one of them to dine at Netherfield in their turn, and if I know him at all, he will want to have a ball. Darcy said nothing in response to these conjectures. I can guess the subject of your reverie, sir. You are considering how insupportable it would be to pass many evenings in such society. Indeed, you and I are of the same mind as we often are. The insipidity, the nothingness, and yet the self-importance of these people. What I wouldn't give to hear your strictures on them. Amid Darcy's continued silence, Miss Bingley cried, Mr. Darcy? Pardon, he said, tearing his eyes away from his former dance partner, who by now was sitting with her sisters. I do not believe you have heard a word I have said. He shrugged a little. It would appear that I am guilty as charged. What on earth has you so distracted? I have been meditating on the very great pleasure that a pair of fine eyes in the face of a pretty woman can bestow. Miss Bingley immediately fixed her eyes on Darcy's face. Pray which lady among us has the credit of inspiring such reflections? My former dance partner, and the only woman of my acquaintance whom I ever wish to dance with again, Miss Elizabeth Bennet. Miss Elizabeth Bennet? Miss Bingley repeated. I am all astonishment. Surely you could not have known her very long. When, in so fleeting an acquaintance as the two of yours, did she become such a favourite? And when, pray tell, am I to wish you joy? That was exactly the sort of question that Darcy had expected Bingley's younger sister to ask, but he would not gratify her wishes with a response. Besides, the young lady will have her answer soon enough. Such being the case, Darcy said nothing. Instead, he went on listening to her with perfect indifference while she chose to entertain herself in this manner. As his composure convinced her that all was safe, her wit flowed long. Darcy only had one thing on his mind, that being his next set with Elizabeth. Through the course of the evening, Jane and Elizabeth stole away from the others in their party and went outside for a breath of fresh air. Elizabeth could not recall the last time she had seen her sister so happy, so animated. The two young ladies joined hands and gave in to a bout of laughter. Dearest Jane, I think Mr. Bingley likes you very much. Oh, Lizzie, do you really think so? Elizabeth chuckled. Indeed, as does everyone else at the assembly, I am certain. Pray, what do you think of him? Do you like him? As if not wishing to be too eager in her praise of the young man, Jane replied whimsically, What is there not to like? He is sensible and good-humoured. He is lively, and I never saw such happy manners. Mr. Bingley is just what a young man ought to be. That is to say nothing of his handsome looks, which a gentleman also ought to possess so far as it can be arranged. So there, you have my permission to like him. Lizzie, be serious. A handsome face means nothing at all if there are carefully concealed flaws in one's character. A lesson that we have learned most painfully. With the Wickhams so far away, and seldom thought about as a consequence, Elizabeth pleaded, oh, Pray let us not speak of such misfortunes at such a time as this. Very well. Too much happiness abounds this evening. Your Mr. Darcy is an excellent dance partner. Jane, he is not my Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth said, not unaware that she had put forth the same defence to her friend Charlotte months ago. Is he not? Jane asked, her brow slightly arched. You need not answer me, for if he is not now your Mr. Darcy, he will be very soon, that is to say, unless there is no truth at all in the notion that to be fond of dancing is a certain step towards falling in love. Elizabeth smiled in silent acquiescence. Indeed, she had long believed in such an idea as well, 
which must certainly have explained her disappointment in hearing Mr. Darcy express his displeasure in the endeavour earlier that evening. Then again, he owed his distaste to not having danced with the right partner until now. Did she dare allow herself to hope that perhaps he was in her power? Not wanting to get ahead of herself, and thus wishing to change the subject, she said, I saw you speaking to the Bingley sisters. Indeed, Mr. Bingley was eager to introduce us, and I must say that I was very pleased to make their acquaintance. Jane smiled in sincere earnest. Oh, Lizzie, the two of them are such delightful creatures. They are very pleasing women when you converse with them. Miss Bingley is to live with her brother and keep his house. I am certain it will be a pleasure having them as our neighbours. Elizabeth was in no way inclined to agree with her sister's charitable assessment of their new neighbours, especially in light of the manner in which the younger sister purposely slighted her on the assembly floor earlier that evening. She gave her sister a look. One Jane instantly recognised. Why, how can they be otherwise with such a brother as Mr. Bingley? Jane asked. When it came to such matters of discerning people's true characters, Elizabeth and her sister Jane were as different as night and day. Jane was a great deal too apt to like people in general. She never saw fault in anybody, unless and until they proved themselves to be extremely bad, as had been the case with George Wickham. In the absence of such compelling evidence, all the world was good and agreeable in Jane's eyes. I declare, Jane, Elizabeth began, your want to be oblivious to the follies and nonsense of others amazes me. The youngest sister has spent the better part of the evening glaring at me as though she wishes I were dead. How fortunate I am that looks, even those heavily laced with disdain, do not kill. And what do you expect? You have captured the fancy of one of the handsomest gentlemen in the room, the other being her own brother. No doubt she did not expect to share Mr. Darcy's attentions with another at such an assembly as this. Elizabeth gasped. It turned out that her sister was more astute than she had given her credit for being. Jane, that is the most unforgiving speech that I have ever had the pleasure of hearing you utter. Good girl, I shall have no cause at all to think that you will not hold your own quite well with Mr. Bingley's pretentious sisters. Chapter 24 Deeper in Love Before too many hours had passed the next day, Mr. Darcy and Mr. Bingley called at Longbourn. After sitting for so long as his patience and proper etiquette allowed while his amiable friend managed the bulk of the conversation, Darcy, professing a great curiosity to see the view from the mount, proposed a walk. As his offer was made in such a manner that suggested Elizabeth as its primary recipient, she immediately acquiesced. Mrs. Bennet instantaneously offered up Jane as an addition to the party, citing that Mary and Kitty could not be spared. Neither of the two seemed particularly bothered by being excluded. Mary felt she would much rather return to her book, and Kitty was not impressed with the gentlemen, even if they were so very rich. Neither of them was an officer, which still meant something to her even though she did not express it so openly as she did before her youngest sister's elopement. As for Mrs. Bennet herself, she was not in the habit of walking about the countryside. No, such an endeavour was strictly the occupation of the younger people. She did, however, conveniently escape the drawing-room on the heels of her two eldest daughters when they went upstairs to get their bonnets. It seems you made the best possible use of your time while you were away visiting those awful Collinses, Lizzie said Mrs. Bennet when she walked into the room Elizabeth and Jane were occupying. Turning to face her mother directly, Elizabeth inquired, What do you mean, Mamma? Clearly we have you to thank for this civility. <laughs> this is the second time Mr. Darcy has called on us with his friend Mr. Bingley. Not once has he called on Lady Lucas, nor anyone else of our acquaintance, even though Mr. Bingley called on Sir William at least once. Elizabeth sighed a little inside. One would think her mother's greatest pastime when she was not scheming to marry off her daughters was getting the better of the Lucases. Mrs. Bennet had yet to forgive Charlotte for stealing Mr. Collins before she had ample time to work on Elizabeth and force her to marry the man. 
It made matters even worse that the gentleman had come to Longbourn for the express purpose of selecting a wife from his fair cousins, and Mrs. Bennet had at least two others waiting in the wings should she fail to change her second eldest daughter's mind. She often supposed that either Mary or Kitty would suit the man just as well as Elizabeth might have. Elizabeth could not help thinking of the irony of her mother's blatant change of opinion towards Mr. Darcy. How it had wounded her earlier that week, hearing her mother's words that she did not care if she ever saw him again, after all that Elizabeth suspected he had done on her family's behalf. Mrs. Bennet shook her head knowingly. Mr. Darcy is entirely in your power. I can see that now, else he would not have danced with you twice when no other young lady of our society garnered such attention. She placed her finger on her chin in contemplation. That is not to say that you do not face formidable competition from Miss Caroline Bingley, his friend's youngest sister, but you did not hear that from me, for I refuse to say a word about your future prospects or lack thereof. Not a single word. The determined matriarch marched over to Jane and took up the task of tying the soft pastel-coloured ribbons on her daughter's bonnet. Mr. Bingley might be very well in your power, too. When he was not dancing with you at the assembly, he could hardly tear his eyes away from you, as everyone who was there will attest to. You must be certain to do everything you can to encourage his affections and make him fall in love with you. Mamma, the eldest Bennet daughter cried. The gentleman and I just made each other's acquaintance mere days ago. Accompanying him on a walk to Oakham Mount is hardly an inducement for such sentiments as you espouse. Oh, why, it is the truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Oh, there is no reason in the world that such is not the case for Mr. Bingley. Just in case he is not so inclined, I shall depend on you to help him along. Then you too shall have all the latest fashions, the likes of those worn by his sisters last evening. Oh, Mamma, you know such things mean nothing to me, Jane said. Oh, well, they very well should. What young woman does not wish to be rich, to be married to a man of such consequence? Oh, what fine jewels a rich husband the likes of Mr. Bingley might very well bestow upon you? What fine carriages, a house in town, and everything that is nice? Oh, do anything but allow this chance to slip away from you. Who is to say when another such opportunity will present itself? She looked at her other daughter pointedly. The same applies to you, Lizzie. However, as I know you well enough to know, you will do anything to rob me of the joy of another son-in-law. I will say no more on the subject. Although I will say the two of you can learn quite a great deal on how to land a husband from your youngest sister, Mrs. Wickham. Swelling with annoyance that her mother actually supposed Lydia's behaviour was a model of proper decorum, Elizabeth said, As I told Mrs. Wickham, her manner of finding a husband holds no appeal to me whatsoever. I am certain I speak for Jane as well. Standing firm, Mrs. Bennet rested her hands about her waist. Oh, I wish you would have some compassion for my poor nerves. In such cases as this, the ends most certainly justify the means, as the two of you will find out when you have daughters of your own. She stood back a step or two and checked over her two eldest daughters for a moment and then encouraged them to be on their way. You must not keep your gentleman callers waiting a minute longer. Now hurry, and make certain to take all the time in the world, for nothing would please me more than the prospect of another wedding or two. Darcy and Elizabeth walked along at a slow, deliberate stride, thus allowing Bingley and Jane to outpace them. It was a long walk, one they enjoyed in companionable silence, interrupted by the occasional remark on the weather and other such threadbare topics. Arriving at Oakham Mount and finding themselves very much alone met with Darcy's complete satisfaction. He missed having Elizabeth all to himself. This is a lovely place, he said, taking in his surroundings. Indeed, I come here often, especially during those times when I am most in want of solace away from my family. It is one of my favourite places. No doubt I will soon be able to boast of this being one of my favourite places as well. It sounds as though you mean to remain in Hertfordshire for a while. I do, for so long as it takes. Darcy gazed at Elizabeth. Taking note of her countenance, he said, You seem surprised in hearing me say this. 
You must know I came to Hertfordshire for the sole purpose of being close to you. He took her hand in his and silently urged her to walk along beside him. There had been a time or two when they walked arm in arm when they were together in Kent, but never before had he initiated such an intimate act as this. Elizabeth's heartbeat raced, rendering her almost speechless. The little things about him that had nearly escaped her mind over the past weeks flooded her senses. The melodious sound of his voice, the touch of his hand, and the intoxicating aroma of his masculinity. Willing her power of speech to overrule her body's stirrings, she said, I do not think that I have adequately expressed just how grateful I am for all you did for my family, sir. I am not certain you will feel that way after you hear what I have to say to you. Oh? Releasing her hand, he said, Indeed. You see, I have recently learned that Wickham had a strong inducement to pursue your youngest sister in such an unseemly manner. Darcy went on to confide in Elizabeth all that his aunt Lady Catherine had done, and all that he had done in turn. Elizabeth listened. She coloured and for the longest time she said nothing. At length she responded, How could she? How dare Lady Catherine take it upon herself to decide the fate of others so wholly unconnected to her? I can offer no reasonable explanation for Lady Catherine's egregious conduct. No doubt she will answer to a higher power. What I can do, however, is offer you my sincerest apology. How can I make amends? Darcy asked. After what you have done, I believe I ought to be the one asking you that question, sir. You owe me no apology. I believe I do. You did all you could to impress upon me the need to warn my father about Mr. Wickham's true character. My family might have avoided all that happened had I listened. However, I was too impressed with my own opinion to give consequence to those in dissent. In fairness to you, he continued. You had every right to hold steadfast to your beliefs rather than abandon them on the mere suggestion from people whom you had just met. They're strangers, for all intents and purposes. After a moment of silence, Darcy said, Your steadfastness is but one of the things I admire most about you. Elizabeth's silence encouraged him to continue his speech, to say the things he had hoped to say when they were in Huntsford. If allowed to speak from my heart, openly and without reserve, I would elaborate in great detail on all the other things I admire about you. But I fear that would take the rest of the day and deep into the night. In other words, what I mean to say is this. He halted his steps, encouraging her to do likewise, and gazed into her eyes. I love you most ardently. I knew it from the moment I first laid eyes on you. Although I understand that you might not share or even welcome the sentiments I have espoused, especially in view of what I have told you about Lady Catherine's egregious behaviour. You are wrong, sir. I... I do love you. He took a quick breath. You love me, Elizabeth? Smiling warmly, she shook her head. As a measure of reassurance, she added, I believe I fell in love with you long before I even knew it myself. In that case, there is but one thing that remains to be said. Darcy lowered himself to one knee and took her hand in his. Marry me, Elizabeth. Make me the happiest man in the world. Say yes. Tears of joy filled her eyes. Yes, Elizabeth cried. Yes. Standing. Darcy seized Elizabeth in his arms, lifted her from the ground, and spun around. Lowering her, he wanted nothing more than to keep her forever in his loving embrace. The ensuing happiness that this occasion produced was such as neither of them ever felt before, and the lovers resumed walking, both listening to the other's expressions of heartfelt delight over all their future life as man and wife held in store. Both of them in their turn made some mention of the particulars that had laid the foundation for their current bliss, be it the hour, the spot, the look and the words. In a bout of playfulness, Elizabeth attributed his fascination to her impertinence, a fact he was hard-pressed to deny, 
but it was more than that he affirmed in honest declarations. So much more. At length, the question of when and how to inform the people who meant the most to them of their plans was raised. Darcy, being his own master, needed neither the consent nor blessing of anyone, but he took comfort in knowing that his sister's joy was assured. For Elizabeth's part, she was certain there would be no dissension from anyone of consequence. Her mother would surely be ecstatic and her father content. But she was not unaware that there would be detractors. She told Mr. Darcy as much. There are those who might argue that our affirmation of ardent affection came about rather swiftly, sir. Swiftly, my love? I think not, for I have waited my whole life for you. He really had. Let others say what they may, he silently considered, turning to face his future wife. Wanting to reassure her from the depths of his heart of exactly how much she meant to him, he said, Think of it this way, my dearest, loveliest Elizabeth. He placed his hand under her chin. Leaning closer, he spoke tenderly. What does the extent of the prior passage of time matter in view of the fact that we have the next five? He bestowed a soft kiss atop her forehead. Ten. He kissed her cheek. Fifteen. He kissed her other cheek. Twenty. He spoke tenderly, gazing into her amazing dark eyes. Darcy brushed his lips gently against Elizabeth's before whispering, Twenty-five and more years of falling deeper and deeper in love to sustain the two of us. Epilogue A Month or So Later Two daughters married and three more to get rid of the eldest of which might easily boast of having a man who was more than half in love with her already. What a happy time indeed this was for Mrs. Bennet. Finally, she was able to look past the injustice of her half-friend, half-enemy's daughter stealing Longbourn's heir apparent from Elizabeth. Mr. Collins was nothing at all in comparison to Mr. Darcy. What did it matter that the former might throw her and her unmarried daughters into the hedgerows as soon as Mr. Bennet departed the earth? What did any of that matter to her in the grand scheme of things? She took prodigious comfort in placating herself with the notion that there was to be a wedding at Netherfield in mere months, weeks if she could arrange matters to suit her purposes. Mrs. Bennet did not plan to live forever. She fancied she would be just as comfortable spending the rest of her days at Netherfield as anywhere else. Then, too, there was the added security of her second eldest daughter's new home, Pemberley. Indeed, life at Pemberley must certainly afford every convenience that ought to be enjoyed during one's glory years. Such a life would suit Mrs. Bennet just fine. Such may have been the feelings of Mrs. Bennet. However, her husband, if he had his way, did not intend on departing this earth any time soon. He took far too much pleasure in the solace of his library, surrounded by his books, his crafts, and various other cherished possessions that he had carefully amassed throughout his years. On the other hand, he could well imagine the library at Pembley as being one of the finest in the land. Although the idea of travelling held little appeal, already he planned to visit his favourite daughter at her new home with some frequency, and always when she and her husband least expected it. As to the matter of an impending alliance between his eldest daughter and that wealthy young man from town, Mr. Bennet's hopes were not quite as ambitious as his wife's. Then again, it was his wife's way to nurse even the most fledgling evidence of affection towards one of her unwed daughters as much as was needed to produce a healthy proposal of marriage. As much as he liked to laugh at her manner of carrying out the sole business of her life, how could he do anything but admire his lady for her convictions, especially since she managed things with so little trouble to himself? In truth, there was real evidence of more than a trifling affection between Jane and Mr. Bingley, even if some people, particularly those closest to him, refused to see it. His sisters were busy hatching plans to remove their only brother from such a disastrous alliance. They liked Jane well enough, but they secretly cherished the idea of an alliance between the Bingleys and the Darcys. In their minds, no other young woman in all of England was better suited for their only brother 
than Miss Georgiana Darcy. Two alliances would have been better, the sisters often liked to complain to each other. However, Miss Eliza Bennet had seen an end to that happy prospect by stealing Mr. Darcy. If they did not do anything else, they meant to wipe away the possibility that their own brother would also fall prey to a Bennet daughter. Elizabeth, for her part, saw early on what the Bingley sisters were about. She gave them no mind. Though she never wished to suppose that she and her mother were of the same mind on anything, Elizabeth too could not deny that Charles Bingley was more than half in love with her sister. While she could not disagree with those who would argue that Jane's sentiments were not so easily discerned as her lover's, anyone who knew Jane best knew that her heart had truly been touched. Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy would have cause to return to Hertfordshire in no time at all. Of that she was absolutely certain. Where the future marital prospects of her sisters Mary and Kitty were concerned, here again Elizabeth was of the same mind as her mother. The chances of her sisters being thrown into the path of other rich gentlemen had increased one hundredfold. Elizabeth planned to do everything in her power to see that they were. It was not so much that the future gentleman needed to be rich, although such a fate would not be looked down upon, what really mattered was that these as yet unknown gentlemen were decent and upright. After all, all the wealth and power in the world meant nothing in the absence of honour and respectability. Such had been Elizabeth's guiding principles, and her sisters would do well to adhere to them as well. She planned to make certain they did. As for the gardeners, they were always on the most intimate terms. Darcy, as well as Elizabeth, really loved them, and it was very plain for everyone to see that the gardeners were equally fond of the newlyweds, so much so that they were wont to travel to Derbyshire as frequently as Mr. Gardiner's business concerns allowed. Pemberley was now Georgiana's home, which delighted all three of the Darcys exceedingly. After the loss of both parents, Georgiana comprehended what it was like to be part of a real family once again, and the thought that she would one day leave her brother and new sister was a prospect she chose not to dwell on. In her mind, her brother was the best man she knew. Her cousin, Colonel Fitzwilliam, was a close second. As for Elizabeth, Georgiana liked to think of her as everything a sister ought to be. And what of the Wickhams? Elizabeth preferred not to think of them whenever she could help it. She was glad that her husband had vowed never to receive Mr. Wickham at Pemberley, even though for her sake he did what he could to assist him further in his profession. Elizabeth secretly wished she could banish her youngest sister from Pemberley as well. However, she could never truly do such a thing. She also could not escape Lydia's frequent calls on her purse. Elizabeth persuaded herself that aiding her sister financially was the least she could do. Lady Catherine, although extremely indignant about the marriage of her nephew, was obliged to do nothing that might provoke him into carrying out his heavily implied and yet unspoken threat. Such restraint as this totally belied the genuine frankness of her character, making any time spent in her presence during the weeks leading up to the nuptials unbearable to those who, for whatever reason, could not escape her. Anne, unable to endure her mother's frequent complaints that she had not done enough to persuade her cousin of the sincerity of her desire for an alliance between them, went away to Bath with her companion Mrs. Jenkinson, secretly appreciative that she might finally chart her own course in life. Charlotte could not have been happier for her friend Elizabeth. As it was not in her nature to remind her intimate friend of that which she had strongly suspected all along, not one of her ensuing missives made mention of said fact. But Charlotte knew, and Elizabeth knew too. Mr. Collins was now fully cognizant of the fact that, between Lady Catherine and her nephew, being in the favour of the latter was the stronger bet should some inevitable fate befall Mr. Bennet. He further believed his fair cousin's visit to his home was what had thrown her into Mr. Darcy's path, and although he could never admit it so long as Mr. Bennet remained among the living, he silently congratulated himself that in opening his home to his cousin and putting her in Mr. Darcy's path, 
he had provided the means of uniting them. Anyone privy to the sound of music echoing throughout the halls of Pemberley would hardly wonder about the intermittent pauses of Beethoven's Fifth Sonata, or whatever piece was being attempted at the time. This was a definite sign that the master and his new bride were not to be interrupted, regardless of what was taking place outside the closed doors of the music room. Darcy was wont to find his way to that particular room with the same strength of determination he had exercised when he was at Rosings, and Elizabeth was practising on the pianoforte in the East Library. It was there that he first acknowledged the extent to which he was in her power, and allowed himself to entertain the idea of what it would be like to make her his. Now she was his, and he was hers. Now he was free to do all the things a man dreamed of doing to his woman, with his woman, and for his woman. Indeed, there was nothing he would not do for his lovely wife. Nothing at all. On one particular day, Elizabeth was struggling with a particularly complicated piece she had come across while thumbing through the music sheets her husband had given her as a wedding gift. Elizabeth was never more delighted than when she had occasion to look up from the pianoforte and observe her husband adoring her. His presence did things to her, incredibly indescribable things. Her heart beat just a bit faster when she watched him approach the instrument. He walked behind her to have a look over her shoulder. He then placed his hands on her bare shoulders promisingly. How she treasured the touch of his soft lips against her skin when he leaned down and feathered kisses along the entire length of her neckline. How she enjoyed it when he whispered softly in her ear. This time was no different. Allow me to be of service, my love. Capturing her breath, she said, Do you mean to demonstrate how this piece is performed, Mr. Darcy? I do, he replied. Silently consenting to his tempting proposal, Elizabeth positioned herself accordingly to make room for her husband, and he sat next to her and commenced playing. She could not help but be amazed, and even more so when he began to sing. The impeccable coupling of his deep, rich voice and the effortless manner in which his deft fingers glided across the ebony and ivory keys in such splendid harmony elicited frissons of excitement mixed with anticipation throughout her body. Oh, even this he does extraordinarily well. Impressed by Darcy's command of the instrument, Elizabeth said, After all those long hours under your silent scrutiny during my practice sessions at Rosings, I'm surprised to discover you are such a great proficient. You have been holding back on me. Indeed, in more ways than you can possibly imagine, my love. Are you quite certain? I have a fairly active imagination, Mr. Darcy. Darcy ceased playing and gazed into Elizabeth's eyes. Have you ever imagined me doing this, Mrs. Darcy? Leaning closer, he whispered sweet, titillating promises in her ear. The warm brush of his breath against her skin sent chills all over her body. Darcy took her hand in his, raised it to his lips and kissed her palm, rendering words yet unspoken utterly unnecessary. This has been Impertinent Strangers, written by P.O. Dixon, narrated by Pearl Hewitt. Copyright 2016 by P.O. Dixon. Production copyright 2016 by P.O. Dixon.